either. Okay. All right. Okay, the clock on the clubhouse wall says it's 6.30. So I'd like to call to order the, the Malibu City Council regular meeting of April the 25th, 2022. The meeting is held being held by teleconference due to the COVID-19 pandemic and we appreciate everyone's patience as we navigate this Zoom meeting process. Council members and city staff are participating from remote locations and all votes will be taken by roll call. Members of the public can participate in the meeting or watch it by going to malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. At this screen, you can click on the tab to either to just watch the meeting or to sign up to speak on particular items. Those who wish to speak during the meeting should follow the instructions at malibucity.org forward slash virtual meetings. Please make sure you visit Malibu City dot org forward slash virtual meeting. Please make sure you visit early to sign up to speak and download the Zoom application. The city clerk will call on those who have signed up to speak when the meet item is called, so you must be present in the meeting to be recognized. Council members, if you have comments to make during this meeting, please raise your hand and I will call on you in turn so we can make our discussion clear for the record and the public. May I have a roll call? Councilmember Fair. Here. Councilmember Pearson. Here. Councilmember Uring. Councilmember Uring, you're muted. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein. Here. Mayor Grisanti. Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. Will you join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? Place your hand over your heart. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag, to the flag of, of the United, United States, States of America, of America and, and to the Republic, Republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under, under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice for all. May I have an approval of the agenda? I move to approve the agenda. I have a I'll motion. I have a motion and a second to approve the agenda. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion. May I, may I have a report on the posting of the agenda? The agenda for this meeting is properly posted on April 15th, 2022, with the amended agenda posted on April 18th, 2022. Okay. Um, that brings us to item 1A, which is a presentation on posting on coexisting with mountain lions. Is Karina available? Yes, hello. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Fantastic. And I will have my camera off for this presentation, but feel free if you wanted me to turn it on, that's fine as well. But thank you to the city of Malibu and to Susan, the public safety manager for the invitation to speak with you all today. Um, we've been monitoring different human cougar interactions in the area and are glad to be able to present some information here and answer some of your guys' questions at the end of the presentation. Next slide, please. My name is Karina Domingo and I'm a wildlife biologist from LA, California. I work collaboratively with state and federal agencies and private partners to prevent, manage, and reduce human cougar conflicts. To the right of the slide is Kelsey Bernard, our outreach coordinator and also a resident of Malibu. And I just want everyone to know that she's a resource for you as well. Next slide. The Cougar Conservancy is a nonprofit organization based out of Los Angeles that provides expert recommendations and direct support to state residents seeking to prevent or resolve conflicts that may arise between our communities and cougars and the landscapes that we share. Our mission is to reduce human wildlife conflict and conserve cougar populations through science-based management and conservation. 
We really see our work as being complementary to the work of National Park Service and California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And as a nonprofit, we have a lot of flexibility to meet the needs of the communities. Next slide. Our conflict task force collaborates uh, with those agencies and a coalition of different groups in order to achieve effective and long lasting conflict resolution. Next slide. This is a snapshot of the services we provide to the Malibu community at no cost. Um, I'll only focus on some of these points today. Residents can call our conflict hotline where they can report a sighting, report an incident or request assistance. We also do conflict prevention and post-conflict visits, visits with residents. So to learn a little bit more about these services, please uh, visit the link uh, 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 to our website here. The Cougar Conservancy also provides assistance programs, next slide, to community members. We understand that there are many barriers for people Im implementing coexistence strategies at home. And so we try to reduce some of those barriers by offering a few assistance programs to the public. Next slide. The Pen Building Assistance Program may provide financial assistance to homeowners who want to build protective enclosures. Our team can also help with the retrofit of existing structures. Next slide. Here's an example of an awesome retrofitted uh, chicken coop that we did in the Santa Ana mountain range. Next slide. We found that there are often financial barriers also for the proper disposal of animals that have, had, have been killed by animals. And so for this reason, we can assist community members with remains disposal through our carcass disposal program. Next slide. You can also head over to our website and fill out the, um, the form to submit a sighting or report an incident. We, again, we can't assist communities if we aren't aware of what's going on. So please reach out and please report. We also encourage you to report to the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and the National Park Service. Next slide. Here are the three different agencies or organizations that you can report to in the Malibu area. This is a graphic from some of our new door hangers and reach out to us, please, if you want us to ship you any. We're happy to do that. Next slide. Let's touch a little bit on home safety for a moment. Keeping your animals um, like livestock or pets in barns or structures with walls and a roof at night is really the best preventative measure that you can take to keep your animals safe. It's important to ensure adequate predator-proof housing from, for pets and livestock that will be utilized, especially from dusk until dawn. If you need assistance or expertise in building an enclosure, please reach out to us. Next slide. The main message when building an enclosure is that gaps that are more than four inches should be closed off. As far as the roof specifications go, in simple terms, the roof should be able to withstand 200 pounds. Next slide. You can even retrofit existing structures like this Mare Motel on Simi Hills. Next slide. This is the before image. Next slide. And then uh, this can be done by securing horse panels to close gaps. Next slide. And here's the final look, which is awesome. Check that out. Next slide. I encourage you to check out our YouTube channel. We have multiple videos on safety and how to coexist with wildlife. So please feel free to share these videos with family, friends, neighbors, social media, next door, homeowner association listservs, all of that. Next slide. Here are some landscaping practices at home that may prevent conflict. We suggest that you trim vegetation above the ground. Uh, communities in Southern California have been really successful at reducing conflicts with predators by trimming hedges two to three feet off the ground, which you can see here. Landscaping in this way can help reduce the areas where cougars and other wildlife can take refuge. Next slide. So that totally makes sense. Um, keep wedge, keeping hedges away from your home is something we also, um, we also ask you guys to do. This helps you in a few different ways. It helps reduce the amount of cover where cougars can uh, hide and rest like we just talked about, but it also deters cougar prey species from making your backyard their home. And also it triples by maintaining the recommended 100 feet of, defense, of defensible space around your home for wildfire readiness. We also suggest you reduce backyard clutter. So open areas without places to hide are gonna be naturally riskier for wildlife. And so therefore de decluttering can help um, serve as a deterrent for cougars and their prey. Next slide. The best thing for wildlife is for them to be able to pass through and move on to that natural habitat with minimum human interaction. So feeding wildlife such as deer and small mammals can really provide a false sense of available resources. It can result in them sticking around, which can attract predators to your property. So remove wildlife attractants. We wanna make sure you guys secure trash and compost piles. You know, cougars are not gonna raid your trash bin uh, but unsecured trash and compost piles often attract rodents and predators that prey on them. So in the, in the Santa Monica Mountains, we all know that mountain lions love deer. And their second favorite food is coyotes. And what do coyotes eat? They eat rodents. Um, pet food and water should also be uh, not be left outside unattended when possible. It represents an easy meal to many wildlife species. So please consider feeding and watering pets while indoors. And of course, if you need to store pet food outside, make sure it's inaccessible to wildlife and please don't feed wildlife. Next slide. If you have any questions regarding specially trained guard dogs, 
please do get in touch with us. We can't cover all this today in 10 minutes, but please reach out to us about, um, about grades and training procedures. Next slide. But cougars like us want to avoid confrontation. So I just want to move a little bit into trail safety here. Uh, cougars in general are cautious animals that purposely try to avoid uh, humans whenever possible. Audio recordings of human voices can even drive them to abandon their food caches. There is enough individual variation between animals, between cougars, um, that, we, that some may choose to avoid us, but maybe not necessarily the areas that we recreate in. And so while cougar attacks are extremely rare, it's important to take preventative measures while recreating in cougar habitat to ensure the safety of yourself and the, and the safety of the cougars that you share space with. So here's some safety tips. We recommend that you, um, that you recreate during daylight hours and be aware of your surroundings. You know, using earphones, for example, are, is really gonna impair your ability to hear wildlife that may be nearby. Be sure to stay on marked trails. We recommend you hike in groups and make noise. And what this does is it helps give cougars and other wildlife an opportunity to move away from you, especially on a switchback that you can't see around the corner. We also suggest that you supervise children and ensure that they stay close to adults. When we say close to adults, I mean within arm's reach, you guys. Do not approach an animal carcass and also consider carrying air horn or a bear spray. An air horn can be used to deter a cougar away from an area and bear spray is another form of protection that can be effective if you know how to use it. Next slide. As far as recreating with your pet, um, check local trail laws, of course, but we suggest that you keep dogs on a leash that's less than six, six feet long. No leader leashes, you guys. Keeping dogs close to you will help prevent them from going off the trail and getting into trouble. And this is especially important when our local coyotes are, um, uh, have pups on the landscape that they're raising. You want to make sure that if you do encounter a mountain lion, you have a little bit more control over the situation if your animal is close, uh, close by you. Next slide. So what to do if you encounter a cougar? Don't run away or make sudden movements. Be sure to face the animal. Stay together and don't turn your back or crouch down. Pick up small children and give the cougar an escape route, okay? Sometimes the animal wants to move past you. They don't want to turn your back to you. You can see some of these videos in Florida. Make yourself look as large as possible and speak in a firm, loud voice. When you're hiking with your pet, please pick up small dogs without turning away or crouching down. If your dog's too large to pick up, bring them as close as possible and hold, the, hold them firmly on that six foot leash beside you. Make noise using air horns or otherwise and throw objects if the animal continues to show interest. If an attack, you feel like an attack is imminent, go ahead and deploy that bear spray. And of course, fight back in the extremely rare case that a cougar does attack. Next slide. The Cougar Conservancy is working in partnership with the Save LA Cougars campaign by promoting wildlife coexistence strategies for the communities surrounding the future site of the Wallace Annenberg Wildlife Crossing. You guys, we're a resource for you. Please reach out to us with any, any questions. Next slide. So I report to us. Reporting parties can report for statistical purposes only. Reporting parties also, this allows us to target where our coexistence programs are in the future. We only share information with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and other agencies if the reporting party allows us to, and we have assistance programs and resources. We also respond to 100% of our inquiries. Next slide. So some of the things that I have been hearing from the Malibu community is, is it normal to see a cougar in the daytime? Cougars can be spotted at any time, day or night as they move through their ranges. And so spotting a cougar during the day does not suggest abnormal behavior or that there's a threat to public safety. Cougars are crepuscular, which means that they tend to be more active around sunrise and sunset. So where people live and recreate, we've also seen that cougars tend to be more noc nocturnal or active at night. Next slide. And I'm almost done here, you guys. I have one more slide. Um, this is another common question I get from the community with depredation response, especially. Is depredation related to aggression towards people? So when a mountain lion may prey upon pets or livestock, is that an association between aggression towards people? What we found throughout the entire state of California is that there's no evidence to suggest that depredation increases the risk of cougars behaving aggressively towards people. And you could, you could uh, skip the next two slides, and I just want to say we can't cover it all one talk, so I really hope that you check out some of the links in this talk. I know it's recorded and posted on YouTube. Explore our website, and know that we're a resource for you guys. And with that, I just want to say thank you, and I'll take some questions. Thank you, Karina. Uh, Steve, I see your hand. Uh, yes, Karina, very good. Thank you. Uh, a couple things. You know, we're, I, I, we're, I'm getting a lot of videos from people who are seeing cougars wandering through Sarah Canyon. And my sense is those cougars have been there all along. People just have more cameras today, so they're getting more pictures of them. Uh, I could be wrong, but that's my perspective. 
Uh, yeah, that's absolutely correct, Steve. Um, with the advent of cheaper and cheaper technology, um, trail cameras, which used to be very expensive, are now as low as $20 online. We also see ring cameras, security cameras that people are placing on their doorknobs are also $100 at Home Depot. So you're absolutely right. Mountain lions have always been there. We're just seeing them more because we have the technology to see them when we're not around. Great. And you, your comment regarding, you know, the if you, if you run into one, I had an opportunity uh, two or three years ago. I was hiking up Solstice Canyon on the switchback trails, going uh -huh. up over the ridge line. And you, I, you, it's like you said, you turn the corner and, and here was the mountain lion, here I am. And both of us just sort of looked at each other and said, what the hell are we doing here? Oh, wow. Um, and then, you know, the mountain lion took off. And when I got home, I read a bunch of stuff that says, as long as you don't, you know, put them in a place where they can't get out, uh, they will typically, you know, leave and try and get away from you. And I've had the same experience. I know some people that have been hiking in, in Sarah Canyon. Uh, and this one lady was hiking up uh, to Sarah Retreat and ran, through a mountain, ran into a mountain lion that was hiking back down the other way. And the line mm -hmm. just kept going. So I think you're right. As long as you you know you know what you're doing and you don't corner them, uh, you should be all right. However, the interesting part was there was a dog that got attacked by a mountain lion in Sarah Canyon a couple about a week ago or two weeks ago, whatever it was, and it was being the walker was walking the dog on the road, and I mean it was a small dog, and I was just surprised that the mountain lion would go after a dog when the person sitting next to it. But I guess. You can never tell what's going to happen. Yeah, those are all good points, Steve. And it may seem silly to folks on the trail when you're hiking alone or with a group around a switchback. I, even as an avid hiker, I tend to clap if I'm going around a corner I can't see around, especially in bear habitat. Um, and yeah, in regards to the unfortunate incident with the dog that occurred recently in Malibu, I just want to say uh, to that um, individual that I'm, uh, we're, we're very sorry to hear that that occurred. Um, and, you know, we're here as a resource for them, um, but we should never undermine those uh, unfortunate uh, incidents that do occur. Um, they're likely, um, you know, um, uh, very stressful situations. And so um, if the reporting party would like any resources or would like to speak with us, we just want to say that, uh, you know, we're here for them. Okay, my last point is if you run into a mountain lion on the trail, you won't forget it. It's, it's, it's a pretty, <laughs> impressive, pretty impressive event. So thank you very much. It was a great presentation. Thank you, Steve. Mikey, you're next. Yeah, hi, hi, Karina. That was fantastic. Really appreciate you uh, giving us this presentation. I think that um, the education is really important. You know, we we have to, we need to and want to co-mingle with, with our mountain lions, with our cougars. Mm -hmm. And um, it's been, as a mountain biker, it's been very noticeable to me after Woolsey how much more wildlife we see now with 40 years of growth gone. Um, mm -hmm. I have not seen a mountain lion lately uh, since the fire, but I've seen a lot more foxes than I've ever seen, a lot more coyotes um, at all times of day. So um, I really just want to say I really appreciate all you're doing and appreciate the education and uh, sharing this with the community. So thank you. Of course. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mikey. Karen, you're next. Thank you. Uh, Corinna, I want to say thank you very much for an excellent presentation. Uh, I appreciate you moving quickly and covering so much. Um, it's really timely with the opening or the groundbreaking last week of the uh, yes. Liberty Canyon overpass. Um, and I'm sure you know, uh, tragically, a mountain lion was killed that morning uh, being hit by a car. I have a question for Steve McCleary, our interim city manager. Is it possible to add the Cougar Conservancy's link to the city website? I see no problem. Whoop. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's okay. We can still hear you. Sorry. Uh, and I see no problem with that. We'd be happy to make that information available to the public. It was a wonderful presentation, and I think it's a good resource for the public. So we'll be, okay. I will make sure that that gets done. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Bruce. Thanks, Paul. So, Karina, I join everybody else in thanking you for the presentation. It was informative and, and entertaining. Um, you're focusing on cougars and mountain lions. Um, I know we have bobcats. There were a family of them in my yard twice already in the last couple of years. And wow. obviously coyotes. Um, any, any, do, to your knowledge, any different inform instructions on what to do when encountering them? Or is it all pretty much the same? 
You know, non-lethal um, conflict mitigation tools are species specific, they're geographically specific, um, they need to be culturally sensitive. So it's 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 complex. However, what I'll say is that what's great about mountain mine safety and us doing these conflict visits and um, being able to go out to residents' houses and do training and look at their landscaping practices is we don't just talk about mountain lions. A lot of the safety measures for mountain lions um, are also relevant to bobcats and, of course, to coyotes. We may make some retrofit um, design different, like there may be design differences in, say, the enclosure. If coyotes are a cause of concern for a community member, especially if they have small fowl like chickens, um, we may uh, suggest to install a skirt on the on the enclosure. It could be a cougar-proof enclosure with a skirt so that to discourage canids or our, our wild um you know, um, foxes and coyotes from digging under the enclosure. And so, yes, um, a lot of the coexistence practices do overlap, but we can um, help uh, people navigate those species specific mitigation measures. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bruce. Karina, I want to thank you very much. And uh, just want to add that for everybody out here, uh, the rattlesnakes are out again. We had a resident uh, struck this last week. And uh, when you're gardening, always look before you put your hands anywhere. That's all I can say. And it's, uh, it is situational awareness, and that's the only thing that keeps us healthy. So thank you so much for coming, and thank you for uh, offering us the use of your uh, audiovisual stuff, and we'll put it on our website. Thank you, everyone. I look forward to connecting with you guys offline. Have a great night. Thank you, Karina. Okay, that brings us to written and oral communications from the public. Do we have any communication from the public concerning matters which are not on the agenda, but for which the city council has subject matter jurisdiction? Yes, you have 11 speakers for this item. The first few are Joe Drummond, Bill Sampson, Lloyd Ahern, and Peggy North. We'll hear from Joe Drummond first. Okay, Joe, are you available? Hi, yes. City Council, I'm here to ask about six subjects not on the agenda. First, what is the City or the Council of Governments doing about the Camp Kilpatrick problem? Brian Embry has sent you all the Santa Clarita lawsuit, plus all the different coastal restrictions that should make CEQA definitely required for Malibu. The residents deserve the city to stand up for them when another agency has broken the law. The only action necessary is to file an injunction against the county. As Ryan has eloquently stated, Malibu needs to protect its rights and citizens by becoming a plaintiff against LA County for its ill-conceived Camp Kilpatrick conversion to a high security detention center for up to 100 plus more 25-year-old men, which necessitates a CEQA impact study and is in an entirely different location. The city of Malibu also will take Camp Kilpatrick off the table for the intensification occupancy currently proposed by LA County to occur beginning this Sunday and will prevent the dumping of what was to occur in Santa Clarita from happening in the fire prone hills of Malibu. So I hope this can be added to the special meeting agenda on the 27th possibly. To also LACO will be deciding on state mandated district zoning for school board voting, which will allow Malibu two seats out of five and is much closer to a vote for separation with just one more vote. This is what Malibu should be putting its support behind and formally oppose the lawsuit put on by the city of Santa Monica and SMUSD. Three, also fire rebuild laws and CDP codes being thwarted for the benefit to developers should be coming to a head soon. We are awaiting a city council approved interpretation of LIP 13.4.1 on any type of increase in the square footage of an existing structure up to 49.9% of the existing square footage as an improvement within the meaning or definition. Data has been requested about the use of the two-step process for evading a CDP to obtain a new house that is up to 150% or more of the size of a burned structure. This needs to in Include any written record of the City Council's approval of the process or a written record of the Coastal Commission approving the use of LIP 13.4.1 for substantial additions to an unbuilt structure. Four, also what is happening with Picasso, the Palm Springs Council voted in late March to maintain the city's ban on timeshares in residential neighborhoods and has asked city attorney to rewrite city ordinances to make that ban apply more explicitly to fractional ownership real estate company Picasso. The Sonoma City Council also did something similar on January 19th placing a ban on timeshares and fractional interest homes uses in their city. Um, when will Malibu write an urgency ordinance? When will BBK be finished with the report on how to stop Picasso type timeshares? 
five also with regards to the Malibu Film Society and other events when will the city amend the code and attempt to get a series to UP going for the Malibu Film Society and summer concert series at Trancus and Malibu Lumberyard these are regular community events that benefits the residents and support local artists and patrons and a series to UP needs to be established for example there could be four to UPs one for each of spring summer fall and winter series of film showings also please ask city planning did LA County apply for a wireless transmission facility antenna tower in the Civic Center area? It does not conform to city codes and safety standards at over 75 feet, et cetera. This should be submitted to Public Works Thanks, Commission, sir. and I look forward to hearing the item. Thanks. Our next speaker is Bill Sampson, followed by Lloyd Ahern, Peggy North, and E. Barry Haldeman. Hi, Bill. Are you available? I am here. Thank you. Uh, Joe uh, and I, just for the record, do not converse at all about what's going to happen here. She took some stuff I was going to say. Uh, I do appreciate the early presentation, most of which I missed. Uh, I, I am hoping that at least 40% of you approve of my efforts to avoid looking like a deer while wandering around in the mountains here. But we'll see about that. More seriously, I, I do urge you to do something about Picasso. Uh, you may or may not have, I, I believe I sent written information, but on page seven of Sunday's LA Times, and yes, I'm an endangered species, I'm a dinosaur, I get a daily paper, paper, and full, co full color, full page ads used to call a, cost a hell of a lot in the LA Times, maybe not what they used to because I know readership is down, but they're spending serious bucks. I don't. I doubt it's from operations. It's probably from um, new investors, but I don't know. I don't get their quarterly statements. Uh, please do something about it. I would urge you, if you decide to do something about it, to be very careful about amending a code that's already been through Coastal, because a code that you, the council amended uh, regarding short-term rentals, we had a code that prevented them, plain and simple. They were not permitted. We created some amendments and now Coastal doesn't like them. So tread carefully. I don't know what BBK thinks about it. Maybe the thing is go after them. You know, I I would much rather be carried off on my shield uh, if, if we're gonna lose one of those. That I would just urge you to do that. Try to do something now. You wait too long, this won't work. Uh, they're already very well funded evidently other operations or investment, as I said, I don't know. Uh, I would do that. As for Camp Kilpatrick, I, I, I'm really disappointed in the county. I hope you can do something about it. Uh, trying to help the young kids that were there who were on their way to becoming very bad people. We thought we had a chance to stop them. I'm sure uh, probation did. Uh, some of the work I did with the kids up there. I don't really know if it was successful. I hope it was. Uh, the probation officers there say that it made the kids do something. If we can keep the young kids there, we've done something for them. It's a nice, it's a much nicer looking place, even though they know it's jail, uh, than some of the other places they could be put. At least they can look up there in the mountains and learn to avoid looking like a deer. They might see some of the things Bruce saw in his uh, front yard or backyard. I think that would be good for them if they're well protected from them. The bad guys that are coming, or I don't know what to do with them. I hope you can think something. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lloyd Ahern, followed by Peggy North, E. Barry Haldeman, and Kevon Tahiri. Are you available, Lloyd? Good evening, City Council. My name is Lloyd Ahern, and I want to talk about. Uh, Bruce being sued by the Manny brothers. Uh, I want to find out how much money this has cost so far. Uh, when Bruce first came to the council, he, he racked up a $300,000 bill to pay off Reba. Then we had the, the uh, Jefferson affidavit, and that was over 100000 And then he had all the investigations on his behavior, and that was another hundred grand. And now all of a sudden, which nobody knows about. I think the Malibu Times should pick up on these things and be nosy enough. Why, why, why are we allowing this Manny Brothers suit to be going on? Seems to me, from what I know, all you got to do is agendize it, have Bruce step off like Steve did that time, 
it was it was a four zero vote. You would know the way the vote's going to go, and the uh, thing will be solved. So that that lawsuit shouldn't be out there. The other thing I want to talk about is another Bruce fiasco. On Tuesday, in front of the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors, was which represents gross domestic product in this country of forty one states. Bruce got up and his opening line reading on a Zoom call as Mayor Pro Tem, Mayor Pro Tem. You notice we didn't make him mayor for his, the reason he's, I'm about to tell you. He, he started out with the term, what the F? Now, he didn't use the letter F. He used the word F. I'm going to repeat it. He starts out by saying, what the F? And then he's looking at these people. And they, they're looking at him and he says, now I've got your attention. So when we talk about why Bruce wasn't elected mayor and what embarrassment he will be in the long run as mayor pro tem, because he's under probation, he's been under probation since he was running as a candidate, because we all knew he was a, he was a, he was a, you know, he was a potential a mess. He, 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 every time he gets another chance to prove, well, maybe he isn't a mess, he compounds the fracture. So somebody questioned him on what was he thinking, uh, talking to the Board of Supervisors, who we desperately need in the long run. I don't know. I, you know, I feel frustrated with him, too. But I sure as heck know to not use profanity in front of those people. So I wish somebody would de delve into it. I, thanks. Thank you very much, Floyd. Who's next? Our next speaker is Peggy North, followed by E. Barry Haldeman, Kivan Tahiri, and Douglas Birch. Hey, Peggy, are you available? Peggy, you should see a pop-up asking you to unmute. Yes, sorry. Uh, can I, I'm available, but can I ask that Doug Birch uh, goes before me? You're speaking about something that's not on the agenda. No, I'm asking if Douglas Burge can go before me as, in terms of speaking before I speak. Is Doug in the uh, in the lineup, Kelsey? I'm sorry, we do have Doug on the list. Would you like to hear from him next? Yeah, let, yeah. Let's just let's let's put Peggy aside until we get to Doug. How's that? Thank you. Okay, and I'm not. Seeing E. Barry Haldeman at the moment or Kivan Tahiri. So Douglas Burge would be our next speaker and we'll circle back to these other people. Great. Are you available, Doug? Mr. Burge, are you available? We are asking Doug's iPhone to unmute. There we go. Yes. Can you hear me, council members? We can hear you now. All right, thank you for allowing me the time to speak. It was presented to you a few weeks ago, might have been a month ago, by Planning Director Richard Mullica. And um, we have many clients. We just yeah. lost your acoustics. Pardon me? I just heard, pardon me, so that's good. Oh. Yes, well, I'm just talking about the with Richard Mullica, and we still have a serious problem at the planning department. Um, we have overburdened staff, which strictly to communicate with project applicants, excessive response. Two years, the COVID factor is for sure take time to help shore up the planning department and give Richard whatever resources they need to get back to running on all cylinders. It's tough enough approval and permit process during regular non-pandemic times, taking anywhere from one to three years, even before an applicant can come before the planning commission. So giving these city planners further assistance to do better their job, I'm sure will go along with employee retention and morale. A project applicant would perhaps always get them quicker and better service as it's the shortening of the time that puts all players in a lesser project burnout position. Application fees, I'm sure, would even do something to revert law editing fire victim fees. 
city planners are trained to plan and organize, but it puts them in a very difficult position. Instruments and years of orchestrating the application come before only to have all their hard work torn to shreds, and in some cases, reputations publicly shamed. I ask who would want to work under such conditions. So we come before you tonight to continue to bring up a subject which you should call attention. We know that with every hard challenge typically comes a better solution. So we look forward to hearing from the council on how to help cure the current issues of the planning department. Thank you for your service to the Malibu community. Thank you, Mr. Burge. And now we can go back to Peggy North and then it looks like our next speaker will be Josh Siegel followed by Ryan. Very good. Peggy, are you available still? Yes, I'm here. Um, dear uh, City Council members, thank you very much for your time. So uh, we have a communication issue with the planning department. Um, you know, we need to send five to 10 emails to get a response. And then when we get a response, uh, there's no new information available to us. It just, they keep saying that they are completely understaffed and they don't have to, the time to get to our business. Um, we keep hearing that there's, a, there's an extreme turnaround inside the planning department as well. And the fact that we can't you know, work with the timeline, we feel at the complete mercy of a dysfunctional and disorganized system, and it's very frustrating. We can't secure any construction loan, construction contractors. We have no idea if this is going to take months or years. And you know that's challenging. Uh, for us to move with our life and our future, not knowing what's going to happen and when it's going to happen. So I wonder if you could provide solution um, to provide a better work environment for those people and to increase the staff labor and that COVID is somehow more control. And if um, the planning, you know, you can like think about solution to give the planning department the resources they need to help the resident um, get their permit and move on with their lives. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Josh Siegel, followed by Ryan, Georgia Goldfarb, and Howard Redsky. Hi, Josh, are you available? I am. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm not affiliated with, with Doug um, on what I'm about to speak on is kind of a coincidence. But um, I've also noticed that not just planning, a lot of the other departments are running really slow. And, you know, Mikey's touched on uh, the topic of bandwidth in the past. And I, I really want to encourage everyone to just understand that um, leadership starts from the top down. And I, I think that Steve McCleary has done a wonderful job as interim city manager. And I'd love to see you, uh, the council, give him a contract. Let's just get it done. So we can start hiring some more people and we can really focus on some projects in the future. So I, again, just, we need to get this done so we can get back up to our feet and start running again. Um, that's all I have. I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you very much. And I'll be speaking later. Thank you, Josh. Our next speaker is Ryan followed by Georgia Goldfarb, Howard Rudsky, and then we'll try to circle back to E. Barry Haldeman and Kivan Tahiri. Mr. Embry, are you available? Yes, I want to talk to you on a couple topics. I want to make sure they all go into the record. So the first one um, has to do with what looks to be an unpermitted development of a massive wireless communications tower adjacent to Santa Monica College construction on the Los Angeles County property in the Civic Center, um, 23555 Civic Center Way. I did not uh, receive notice, um, despite the uh, closest residential address to that um, parcel on Civic Center Way. Second, it should conform with the city's wireless telecommunications ordinance and the resolutions passed by the city. And it should go to the Public Works Commission, which has the duty to review those. That is a full on macro site, the prior tower was for LA County for two-way radios. And it happened to have one wireless uh, communications carrier antenna mounted on it about a third of the way up the tower, which would make it 25 to 35 feet off the ground. It was not a series of three independent uh, cell phone companies atop a pole, but it looks like the county is uh, proposing to generate 
uh, income revenue to the county from three wireless carriers co-located on a pole, which is a top-heavy pole. What was there before was a see-through lattice tower with a small point at the top and not as tall as what is there now. I believe it's unpermitted and I request that you uh, enact the code enforcement prosecution for this application. And second is have the planning director be assigned to write a synopsis report of how this happened. And I would like to hear tonight from a council person asking the public works director and the city's planning director, if permits were issued for this in the configuration that is there now, um, that thing is way too tall and it's way too ugly. And uh, so that's the, fir the first and most important one. The second has to do with this Camp Kilpatrick. And I implore the city to use its resources to stand up for citizens' rights and the negative consequences of this proposed conversion to a prison up Encinal Canyon in Malibu, in the hills. That that use was not historic. It's an intensification, requires an impact report or a CEQA study. And that is the subject of the litigation, which I sent you a copy of, that the city of Santa Clarita had the wherewithal to file against Los Angeles County. And the city of Malibu must also do so for the exact same reasons of no environmental impact study. Uh, the other is I hope you get on the short-term rental and the Picasso thing quickly. I'd like to hear you, um, an update. Our next speaker is Georgia Goldfarb, followed by Howard Rudsky, E. Barry Haldeman, and Kivan Tahiri. Hello, Georgia. Are you available? Georgia, you should see a pop-up asking you to unmute. Okay. Um, excuse me. Can you hear me? We can hear you. <clears throat> okay. So, oh, pardon me. Greetings, Mayor and Council members. I would like to address the concerns that I and others have had regarding my removal by Mikey Pearson from the Parks and Recreation Commission. One stated reason appeared to be a divergent opinion on mayoral succession. Since, to my knowledge, we agreed on all other matters we discussed both in that conversation and in the past. On this issue, I supported following precedent, tradition, and the policy that the highest vote getter in the election would become mayor, which in this case happened to be Bruce Silverstein from the second highest mayor pro tem, Steve Ewing. For me, that was true no matter which council member might have fit this criterion. Mikey did not agree, though, since the person who met the criteria for succession was Bruce Silverstein, and Mikey stated that he could not support Bruce for mayor. I do not think that personal animus should override established tradition and policy in city business. We do not elect council members to allow personal feelings to control outcomes and decision making over the many substantial issues before our city. Mikey also stated that he wanted to replace me with a younger man with children. He did not give a reason for that selection, but his first candidate was indeed a younger man with young children. Thus, apparently, I was too old, a female, and my child, grandchild, and my profession, a pediatrician, did not qualify me to represent Ike on Parks and Rec, although I had done so for three and a half years. <clears throat> it is troubling, and I believe illegal, to remove a commissioner based on gender, age, and recrimination. I find it egregious that this was apparently related to my support for a good government position. Malibu council members should not consider their position a fiefdom, and they should not engage in retribution. They are elected to assess, discuss, and determine the best course for the city in consultation with the residents. So, please do. <clears throat> I have chosen not to pursue charges of gender and age-based discrimination so that council members can avoid another time-consuming investigation and possible charges. I would like for this to be an awakening of how casually discrimination emerges in Malibu in 2022. It needs to stop. Let us move forward, understand and eliminate discrimination and address past and current wrongs. Let us call a hard stop to vitriolic expression of personal peak and respectfully execute the business of governing Malibu based on substance. We need council members who are able to execute their duties with dignity, respect and thoughtfulness and when relevant, based on science. 
Why is cooperation stuck on such a Sisyphean hill? Malibu, steeped in sunshine, let it shine through city government. Thank you. Thank you, Georgia. Our next speaker is Howard Rudsky, followed by E. Barry Haldeman and Kivan Tahiri. Hi, Howard, are you available? I am. We can hear you. Over the weekend, I was asked about a lawsuit with Manny Brothers. I was told a number of different versions by different people and asked what was going on. And I didn't know. Can the council please explain to all of us if Manny Brothers is suing, why they are suing, who's being sued, and what for and how much they're suing for? That way, all of us have the same version and the truth, because this is going to get out of control. I heard quite a few different versions, and I don't know if any of them are true. The second thing is, regarding all the items people are asking the city council to do, I agree with a lot of them. But there's a huge problem. We don't have enough staff and, st and council made a decision based on what they knew about staff and budget for fire victims, public safety, et cetera. You know, we have an acting city manager as well as others. And what you got, what a lot of people want done takes relationships with Washington, with Sacramento, with local legislators, and we just don't have them right now. And the last thing is what was just said about Mikey, it's complete bullshit. You know, Mikey is a good, decent person that made a decision based on what he thought. It had nothing to do with the person's age or sex. So, you know, we should keep that out of Malibu politics. You know, we should be more civil than that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Retsky. Our next speaker is E. Barry Haldeman, followed by Kivan Tahiri. Gary, are you available? Can you hear us, Barry? Sorry, it looks like we lost Barry again. So we'll hear from Kivan next and see if we can get Barry back. I believe we have Kivan here under uh, KT. Hey, Kivan, are you available? Yes, hi, thank you so much. And sorry about that. I didn't know how to change the profile. Um, I'm actually Mary M. Kavon's uh, life partner, and um, I wanted to just second everything that um, Peggy and Doug Burge said. We are neighbor locations, and we've been, you know, planning on building our dream home in that location and um, renting in the meantime until we get that process moving. And it's been really frustrating and con concerning and putting a lot of financial pressure on us, not knowing what's happening. It's been you know, I believe plans were submitted in 2021 and we're still waiting to hear anything back. We haven't heard any email responses, any updates, no requests for any additional information, kind of been in the dark. And the whole process for us next, once we do hear, is cumbersome and we have to plan, we have to get loans for construction. And so really wanted to um, reach out and ask for your help in any way to kind of help us kind of know what we can do to help expedite this process and um, help us. I'm sure that Peggy and us are, you know, two of many um, other families that are in this process of, you know, and stuck kind of in limbo waiting to hear um, about what to do next um, and not hearing anything is just really, really difficult and frustrating. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you. Our next speaker is E. Barry Haldeman. He just rejoined the meeting. Can you hear me? Barry, are you available? Uh, yes, can you hear me? That's you, Barry. Okay. Yeah, good. we hear you. I, I had a lot of trouble getting on. Anyway, um, I want to thank everybody who sent in objections to the Board of Supervisors on the camping initia at the last Board of Supervisors meeting. On short, short notice, we got over 220 opposing comments to the Board of Supervisors. And I want to thank the city for writing a letter in opposition. And I want to thank, thank the speakers from the city and everybody who spoke. Um, uh, Paul, I thank you for speaking, Rick Mullen, uh, Bruce Silverstein, and uh, of course, they voted it in. 
uh, there was no acknowledgement of any of our comments. And next, as I understand it, they'll they'll fix up the statute, send it back up to Coastal for permission, and we'll have another shot at it. And uh, I think that's when we have to make the big turnout because this is a terrible amendment. Um, and I ask that the city set up some way to watch this and let us all know when things are happening because we learned it very uh, at the very end and uh, we would appreciate that. And I have one more comment. I, I very much appreciated uh, Bruce's both writing his comments and speaking but I don't think saying and starting out his speech to the Board of Supervisors by saying, what the fuck are you thinking of? Barry, it's is not appropriate kind of, here either. Sorry, okay. I'm just quoting uh, what was done. And I don't think that's the way you speak to a body like the Board of Supervisors. It just plays right into their hands and they categorize us one more time. So I would suggest that that's not the kind of conduct we should have in front of the Board of Supervisors. But again, thank you everybody for, for pitching in. Please keep a, an eye on this because it's a very dangerous amendment allowing camping in ESHA areas of the Santa Monica Mountains. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. And Mayor, I don't have any other speaker signups or raised hands, so that concludes public comments. Terrific. Uh, that brings us to the commission committee or city manager updates. Do we have any commissions? Or no, committees? we have commission or committee updates this evening. Mr. McClary, I believe you're on. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. A few things to report on tonight. Um, one wanted to note that at City Hall, we will be holding a vote center for the June primary election. That's going to be at City Hall in the multi-purpose room from May 28th to June 7th. And that's for the June primary election. Also wanted to uh, report to you a couple of other events coming up at City Hall. Uh, there is a photo exception, <laughs> exhibition and reception. Uh, community members are invited to enjoy scenic images by local photographers at the Malibu Arts Commission's next public exhibition in City Hall titled, titled Malibu Perception starting May 2nd. Uh, there is an in-person opening reception with complimentary food and beverage at City Hall on Saturday, April 30th at 4 p.m. No RSVP is needed. The exhibition can be viewed at any time during open hours at City Hall. For more information on the exhibition, please visit MalibuArtsCommission.org. Also wanted to note um, and put out an invitation for the community to join Malibu's Poet Laureate and Buxy for an afternoon of live poetry, music, dance, and art. Uh, at an event titled Calling All Creatures as part of the city's annual poetry summit on Saturday, May 14th at 4 p.m. at City Hall. Uh, this is a free in-person event that is part of the Malibu Library Speaker Series. Uh, for more information on that event, please visit malibucity.org slash poetry. And as I... Uh, often do I'd like to give a report to the council on what we're seeing and what's being reported to us in terms of COVID-19 from LA County Health. Uh, they, this was reported to us as of Friday. Uh, there is an increase in the daily average case rate, the daily test positivity rate and uh, overall case numbers. However, the good news is that the decline continues in the number of hospitalizations uh, and the number of deaths, unfortunate as they are, uh, are remaining relatively steady. Uh, the CDC community spread level ratings remain in the low category uh, and the hospitals are uh, reflecting reduced stress on the system. Uh, most of the samples, these about 80% of the samples are uh, in LA County are showing the BA2 subvariant. Also want to note that um, while the decline is uh, in the number of hospitalizations continues, uh, ER visits related to COVID have increased over the past two weeks. Um, LA County has updated their quarantine guidelines and those went into effect last Friday. We do post those on the city's website. 
Uh, Cal OSHA will also be updating its guidelines expected at the end of next week. And also was noted as reported by LA County Health that the current case numbers are likely an undercount as a lot of people are taking the home tests and they are not necessarily um, getting those results processed through a doctor or through a lab. So it's a good indication that there's a higher rate of transmission uh, and case numbers out there than what is being reported. Moving on, wanted to uh, report that I attended a meeting of the Malibu West Homeowners Association. I was happy to speak at that event, uh, get to know the community a little bit better, and I would be happy to meet with uh, any HOAs or community groups to help me with my education of the Malibu community. Also just wanna note, we continue through the process of the, for um, school separation, we remain in the process of mediation. Uh, we should have an update probably in a couple of weeks on that. It continues to move forward. Uh, regarding the aforementioned communications tower that went up in the Civic Center a couple of weeks ago, uh, planning staff is thoroughly checking to see uh, if what is up there uh, meets the approved specifications. Uh, and planning staff uh, will be providing a full report uh, to the city council, which will be publicly available. We expect that to be out at the end of this week. I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, I see your hand there, sir. Yeah, I, I just wanted to ask if the county is once again issuing uh, community specific uh, testing numbers and transmission numbers, or is it, have they, are they still jumbling it all together or is there any Malibu specific numbers? I, I believe there are still Malibu specific numbers and I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, that I do not have those in front of me at the moment. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I think, I'm sorry, Mr. City Attorney Cotty. Yes, Mr. Mayor, if I could just have a moment. Sure. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council, good evening. I just wanted to jump in on a couple of points that were raised by the public speakers tonight. The first was the Santa Clarita lawsuit. We have a copy of that lawsuit and are analyzing it. We'll provide some direction to councils and the city manager shortly. Uh, with regard to Picasso, we have drafted an ordinance. That ordinance is with the planning department and they're um, taking steps to daylight that ordinance for the public's consumption and that, that should be happening shortly. And lastly, the Manny Brothers lawsuit. Um, that lawsuit is a writ of mandate. It challenges or seeks only to overturn the council's March 22nd decision to deny their appeal. At present, nothing more. Uh, in response, at the council's direction, we have filed a motion, what's called a demur, a, similar to a motion to dismiss, and an anti slap motion, which is a strategic lawsuit and anti strategic lawsuits against public participation. Um, those are scheduled to be heard, I believe, in early July, late June, early July. So I just wanted to make the public aware of that. At present, they are not seeking damages. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, John. Sure. And Mr. Mayor, I had one more thing for my report. I apologize if I may. I just wanted to announce that uh, we are kicking off the public portion of the budget process with the City Council Workshop this Wednesday, April 27th at 6 p.m. So bring your sharpened pencils. Uh, I also wanted to briefly respond to the comments regarding the planning department. Uh, it is no secret to, to the staff or the community that we have a number of issues there in terms of uh, both with current vacancies uh, and it's definitely causing issues in terms of the, uh, the timeliness and uh, the communication. I do apologize to the members of the public um, for that. Uh, I do wanna assure you that the planning staff is, is working very hard. Uh, and despite that, um, we are still not able to, to get to everybody in a timely manner. Um, we are doing what we can in the interim to try to fill those vacancies uh, and stay up to speed with the workload uh, by trying to bring in contract planning. Uh, and also, as you will hear in the budget workshop this Wednesday, we are proposing adding several positions to the planning department to also address that workload and to help us better achieve the city's mission and vision statements. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Thank you, Steve. And that brings us to City Council subcommittee reports. Uh, Steve, I see your hand. You're, you're muted, please. Thank now, you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, 
And John, thank you for your comments on Picasso, Nanny Brothers, because I had no idea how to answer any of those things. So thank you very much. That was very helpful. And thank you, thank you for all the speakers. A uh, couple things. And Camp Kilpatrick, I know there was a, a Los Angeles or Los Virginia's Council of Governments meeting, and Karen can probably comment on this a little bit later, but I thought they didn't agree to send a letter in to the Board of Supervisors. I don't know if that means anything or it, 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 when you get a chance, you could talk to us about that. Um, the planning department, uh, and I, I, you know, there's a number of issues going on in the planning department. Let me just tell you, back in uh, 2016, when I joined the planning commission, we had the same problem. Uh, I got called into a meeting by Reba Feldman that said, uh, you know, you can't talk to the planning staff anymore because they don't have enough people and they're overworked and the same, the same story. So this is, this is a recurring problem. Uh, we're going to do some things in the budget meeting that may help solve some of it, uh, but I think we're going to have to get smart in terms of what we're doing with this to make sure we can get a long-term solution that will uh, give us some consistency in terms of what the planning department can deliver to the residents. Um, okay, what I've been doing, we had is a racist meeting a week ago, two weeks ago, I can't remember, Mikey, uh, basically covering two issues. One was a pesticide ban, where I think Mikey uh, and I agreed on the policy in terms of how we can go about trying to get that implemented. The second issue in the item was the temporary use permit. Uh, and, you know, TUPs are basically allow short-term placement of activities that would be prohibited as a permanent solution in that location. And Mikey and I disagreed on this a little bit. He wants to loosen some of the rules up. I'm not really in favor of that. So I just encourage the residents pay attention to what's going on with that because depending on which way this go, it may have an impact on the quality of life of some of the residents. Uh, speaking of TUPs, uh, Paul, and I hate to bring this up, but the Chamber of Commerce got caught trying to run an event last week uh, at the Presbyterian Church without a temporary use permit. And I know you're on the council or the governmental affairs committee for the board. So maybe just, you know, take a moment, explain to those guys what the rules are, because, you know, you don't want an organization that big sort of ignoring the rules that the city has. So anything you could do would help us with that, I would appreciate it. Uh, I had a meeting last week with the Santa Monica Bay Restoration Commission. Uh, and Santa Monica Bay Restoration Commission basically is an organization that takes a look at the effects, uh, at anything that affects the beneficial uses, restoration, and enhancement of Santa Monica Bay and its watersheds. Uh, and first one, the meeting we had was a hybrid meeting, and it worked like a charm. I mean, it went, it went smooth as silk. That was the first one they ever ran. Uh, and we had, you know, public speakers, pe people uh, in person. Uh, so it can be done, it can be done well. And I think everybody who was at the meeting really appreciated how it was handled. Uh, the Santa Monica Bay Restoration Commission is basically dealing with a bunch of issues, Bologna wetlands, uh, abalone restoration over at Palos Verdes, uh, kelp bed restoration off the coast, and dune restoration both at LAX, Manhattan Beach, and here in, in, the, in Zuba Beach. Um, and it's amazing that the, the governing board of this thing has got all these subject matter experts. I mean, these guys are really smart. Uh, I'm not really sure what I'm doing up there, but uh, this is a an organization that has, has an impact on what's going on in terms of restoring Santa Monica Bay. So I want to go back to doom restoration, April 30th. Well, let me go back. A couple of weeks ago, uh, the Bay, Bay Company held a demonstration over Zuma Beach regarding what they're doing for the dune restoration. And it was amazing. The young ladies who conducted it were smart. They were great presenters. Uh, they did an excellent job explaining what was going on and they got the people who were there partic to participate in some of the work that's going on. They're gonna do that again on April 30th. Uh, and I encourage you, if, if you get some time that Saturday, go out and visit with these folks. I mean, if you're Pepperdine, get some Pepperdine kids out there to help them out, Malibu High School children. Uh, this is an education, it's part biology, they talk about native plants and what how the non-native plants are, uh, you know, taking uh, water away from them. It's a little bit of environmental sustainability, how the dunes are being restored. Uh, so kids, you know, or parents, get your children out there. I think it's an education. And they're the ones in the long run, they're going to have to deal with all this global warming. So the more they know about what's going on and what they can deal with it, 
I think that it'd be good for them. Uh, kids, bring your parents out, make them walk the dunes with you. I think probably the exercise will be good for them. So, I, you know, if you can get out there on the 30th, please do so. I think, I think we're very, very beneficial. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Library committee. Uh, you know, I don't, I've never, I've never seen a library committee meeting. Uh, and I was going to watch the one we had, I guess, a week ago, whenever it was. And as I started watching, I got a bunch of phone calls. So I never really had a chance to focus on what was going on. But my takeaway is the library, except the library committee's got a honeypot of about $16.6 .6 million. And my takeaway from whatever little piece I could see the meeting, everybody was in there trying to get a, a piece of that honey. So I think, I, I believe any money that's going to be allocated is going to have to come back to the city council for approval. Is that right, Steve? You know? Yes, that's correct. Okay, good. Because I got a lot of questions and, you know, it's just a lot of money. And anytime you're dealing with that much money, it's always good to pay attention. Uh, I thank you for your comments on the Santa Claus poll that's in the Civic Center. I know I talked to Richard last week. Uh, he had some other things on his plate, but I know he's going to take a look at us. I'm looking forward to that report. Um, car shows. Uh, and Steve, you and I talked about this a little while ago. You know, we were hoping to get the shopping center to put up some of these signs and say, you know, here's what you're allowed to do, or here's some of the rules. And we thought they were going to put those signs up, and they have not done that. I talked to Captain Fetter uh, a couple of days ago. So I don't know what we have to do, but I mean, these guys are just jerking us around, uh, and we ought to find some way to get their attention. And if I can help you do that, you let me know. Be more than happy to participate. Um, Okay, last thing, the supervisors. Uh, it was interesting after the, and I think it was the uh, same thing, Los Angeles Virgin East Council of Governments meeting. I got a little video that uh, Tess Chernovsky, I guess, spoke at the end of the meeting. And her basic comments were saying, look, it's not the, it's not the supervisors. It's the Coastal Commission's doing this to us. So, you know, they were wiping their hands, not my, my problem. Um, and then the second thing, I got a letter back. When I, I wrote in an email uh, opposed to the decision to do the camping in the mountains, and I got an email back from some, some guy named Blake, Blake Clayton, I think his name was. And it was one of these just condescending letters that said, look, you can't always get everything you want. This was a great decision. Everybody got a little bit, but nobody got everything. Uh, so, you know, look, supervisor's election is coming up. I don't think we're going to get a supervisor that's going to give Malibu everything at once. But I sure hope we can get a supervisor that doesn't come up with plans to try and burn us out. So pay attention to the supervisor election. Uh, listen to what's going on and vote wisely. Paul, back to you. Thank you, Steve. Karen, you're next. Thanks, Paul. Um, let's see, let's start with Cab Kilpatrick. Um, yes, I am the city's representative, <clears throat> excuse me, to the COG, and I'm currently COG president. So at the March meeting, we had just found out about this issue. We managed to get it on the agenda for both the city and the COG on very short notice. Uh, for those of you who don't remember, the city failed to pass a motion writing a letter to the Board of Supervisors opposing Camp Kilpatrick and the changes that were proposed. Um, sadly, that vote uh, was in the affirmative from Paul and myself. It was in the negative from Bruce and Steve and Mikey abstained. Uh, conversely, the next morning, the COG uh, had that item on their agenda. And after a brief discussion, there was a unanimous vote to oppose. So Steve, I don't know where you got your information that the COG did not oppose it. They absolutely did. At the exact same time the COG was meeting as is our misfortune is when the Board of Supervisors meets. So Executive Director Terry Dipple has to be logged into both meetings simultaneously and wait for his turn to speak, which he did speak that morning, expressing the COG's unanimous opposition to Camp Kilpatrick and to the transfer of what's called the most highly secure, uh, I don't know if they call them felons, victims, uh, excuse me, uh, convicts. Um, I will also point out for the public, although it's a juvenile facility uh, by law, 
uh, those convicted as juveniles can be held in the system up to the age of 25. And that is what will be happening at Camp Kilpatrick. Um, we've had our April COG meeting and this item was on the agenda again. We had an update from, I'd have to go back and count. There's a YouTube video for anybody who wants to watch it. We had six or seven members from the county, uh, from probation, from Supervisor Kuehl's office, uh, talking about, basically, I would call it a sales pitch about Camp Kilpatrick. My feelings haven't changed, and I let them know that. Um, it's the longest agenda item I've ever seen in a COG meeting. The one item went for an hour and 14 minutes. That, that entire meeting usually takes place within 90 minutes. If anybody wants the link to the meeting, contact me, email me, I'll send it to you. Um, it's on YouTube. Let's see, what else? Uh, as far as my activity, we've had uh, two school district separation ad hoc meetings. We meet every Friday. Uh, the COG regarding camping in the Santa Monica Mountains. Uh, it was not possible to get consensus from the other COG uh, Board of Governors members and that item is going to be revisited. So that's very frustrating for me and I think for anybody in Malibu. Uh, the COG also approved the draft of a letter uh, supporting the recommendations of the Blue Ribbon Commission on Homelessness and what in my opinion are much needed improvements to uh, the work that LASA has been doing, that's the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority. Um, yes, we had a library subcommittee meeting. I really wanna thank Elizabeth Shavelson and everybody that uh, puts a lot of work into our library subcommittee. And yes, we do have about $16 million in excess funds. Um, I want to make sure everybody understands that is not money that's in the city budget. Those are set aside funds. They are controlled by the library and um, we do have recommendations. We are gonna reconvene. Uh, sorry, I don't know the date. The library subcommittee is going to reconvene. Sorry, I'm looking for the date right now. Oh, I can't find it. It's, I think it's next week. Maybe the second, yeah, May 2nd at 3.30. Um, and I think that's it. That's my activity. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Mikey, I see your hand. Thank you, Paul. And um, I'll start off by Thanking Steve McClary, as he mentioned, for coming to the Malibu West HOA meeting. We had something we call a sunset on the deck with a taco cart for all the residents in the neighborhood. And um, Steve uh, came at my invitation. You know what? It, he did a great job. He uh, addressed, you know, quite a few residents there. They had a lot of questions after he talked. Um, and I must say, and I don't think I've shared this with you, Steve, the word behind your back after you left was really good. <laughs> people, people were impressed with the, the, how you handle the tough questions, the easy questions, the uninformed questions, the good questions. You did a great job. So thank you for that. Um, and uh, appreciate you making the time to come out. Yes, as I'll try and cut through stuff that we've already, I've already heard other people talk about, but we had as a racist meeting, uh, Steve and I, and as a racist subcommittee, where we agreed, uh, I think, on everything moving forward on the pesticide ban, which obviously we all want to see happen ASAP, immediately, 10 years ago, et cetera. Um, and we also addressed TUPs, which we mostly agreed on, but we did diverge in a couple spots there. But good stuff for the council to talk about either way. 
Um, and um, I think, uh, I, as Steve said, I encourage everyone when we address TUPs to come out and talk, because some of the stuff has a big impact on how certain things in the community run as far as art events, et cetera, and, and a bunch of different kinds of things. So um, I thank staff for getting this on the agenda so we can get that, that moving forward. Um, and Steve, I'm glad you're enjoying the Santa Monica Bay Restoration Committee. Um, and yes, there are some very bright people on there. I have to agree. The one thing I want to bring up, they should have given you a big packet at some point. If they haven't, they should, of all the things they're working on their yearly plan. I think near the beginning of it, it talks about something that's not funded. And uh, it's 90 acres that are up Carbon Mesa that the MRCA has that they want to open to the public at some point. So uh, it's not a funded item, but uh, I'd say maybe take a look. That one caught me off guard big time. And I commented on city council once before. Uh, it doesn't appear to be moving forward now, but that would be obviously something I think we're all be scary, um, potentially scary. Uh, thank you to all the public speakers. I know a lot of it's been dressed already. The giant Kong communications tower, um, uh, Picasso, we are working on that. I'll see if I can get um, Trevor to come on sometime and talk about where we're at there a little more because that is concerning. Um, to Doug Burge and everyone else there, Doug, I'd love to follow up if you're still listening with a phone call at some point or a cup of coffee or something. Uh, half of what you said we couldn't hear or I couldn't hear. You broke up and uh, I'd like to get a better understanding of where you were going with your comments and everyone that's waiting. I think Steve said it best. Um, we've been behind at the planning commission for uh, in the planning department for a very long time. And then Woolsey and the pandemic is the, the perfect storm and uh, it is a difficult situation. So to everyone caught in that, I apologize. Um, you got a, a great crew that cares, but it's it's a little it's overwhelming, as you would have heard if you if you listened to the last few meetings and some of those reports. Um, thanks for Barry to Barry for leading the charge of the board of supervisors. Um, really appreciate that um, you did a great job. Obviously, it was a pretty much of a done deal in advance. It was clear. We've experienced that before. Pretty frustrating. And um, and yes, uh, I'll follow through with Steve McClary, which I guess I'm doing right now, on how we can be noticed when that item, if and when that item comes up again, because it is a, it is a very scary item um, to many of us. So, oh. As Karen said, also attended two school separation, school district separation meetings. Lots going forward there. Look forward to updating everyone soon. And um, we had the library subcommittee meeting, and it, and it is a unique situation with, with these set aside funds. And um, they're not out of our general fund. They're completely different, as Karen said. So my question to, to people that were there is, you know, what can we do to help you that fits within the use of those funds? We have funds that can help the community, help families, help, ch help children. And, um, and that's what these funds do. And it'd be nice to see what other ways we could help, if there are any. So that's, that'll come back at our next meeting next week. And I feel like I've probably missed a couple of things, a ton of notes here, but uh, that's it for now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mikey. Bruce, you have the floor. Thanks, Paul. So I'll talk about the speakers after I first give my reports to, about what's been going on. It, it seems like the past few weeks have been fraught with disagreements with the county. Um, we have, first of all, and there were people, speakers spoke about this today, the monstrous communication structure at the community college site. As best I understand, it was not authorized by the, um, by what was authorized by the city. It's an unpermitted um, structure. Um, I've, I've had that confirmed to me by multiple people, whether I have not seen the um, source materials, but if that's accurate, it's a serious problem. It's an eyesore, obviously. It looks like we have an airport in the center of Malibu now. 
Um, and as Ryan said, my son had raised this with me earlier today too, when he saw it for the first time, um, looks like the county's planning on making big dollars by renting space to telecoms on that, um, that structure. Um, and if they are, and if we can't get rid of it, it ought to be a deduct from what it's going to cost us for the substation. Because if the county's making money from doing illegal operations in our city, um, they should at least not be charging us an arm and a leg for what we get them to come here and do. But in any event, it seems like it's an illegal structure. I'm hoping that we will take a look at that and seriously consider our options and what ability we have to correct it. Camp Kilpatrick. Uh, first of all, I want to clear up some some incomplete and, and arguably inaccurate coverage of this in the press, not, not intentionally, I don't believe, as well as by Karen tonight. Uh, multiple residents have asked me why Steve and I opposed and Mikey abstained with respect to Karen's proposal to send a letter to the Board of Supervisors. Anyone who watched the meeting at which the vote occurred would know that Karen proposed to send a letter that was not written and which we did not know what it would say. For one reason or another, Karen didn't take the time to prepare a proposal, or she lacked the ability to do so, or she just, I don't know what the reason was, but she just came to us and said, we should send a letter. We draft letters in advance. We, we had that discussion. Steve and I voted no to an amorphous concept of a letter. Mikey abstained. We proposed and said that a letter be prepared for us to approve, and we recommended the creation of a subcommittee to draft and approve the letter. Karen just wanted advance approval of whatever she later came up with. And she also said it was unlikely to get to the Board of Supervisors until after they voted anyway. The letter just couldn't get done in time. It was going to be an after-the-fact letter. So Steve and I voted no on the basis that it was too late to do anything by way of a letter, and we should later work on finding support to resist the decision after it was inevitably going to be made. And there was nothing in the letter that was going to stop it. If you watch the recording of the meeting, you'll see this. We simply voted against giving Karen a blank check to say whatever she wished to say. So we are where we are now. And as Ryan noted and others have noted, um, Santa Clarita brought a lawsuit asking at a minimum that there be CEQA. We have the same basis. And um, I actually am hoping that we will have a um, closed session meeting to discuss potential legal action against the county. That, that, that may not be the only action that could be taken CEQA, but that's one. And I think that is the right thing for us to be doing. Letters are interesting and nice and their words on a page, but the county doesn't care. Um, lawsuit regard, so there's the ESHA camping. And um, by the way, I, I spoke as a citizen at that uh, meeting, which I, and I have a right to do that. And I expressed my view very, very definitively. So I think we should be exploring our legal options there too. That also may be right for a CEQA requirement before it can be done. And there may be other legal flaws in that process as well. And we'll also have further opportunity down the line to challenge whatever specific camping permissions they grant. But in any event, I, I think the time is to take the, it's time to take the gloves off. I know they're huge. They've got the budget of more than uh, some countries, but that doesn't mean that they don't do things that are illegal from time to time. And it doesn't mean that a court, which, um, which doesn't really care about who's the big guy, sometimes actually thinks the big guy's wrong, um, can do anything about it. And related to that, homelessness. Sheila Kuehl made a public statement. I'm going to read it. Expelling people experiencing homelessness and adding insult to injury by trying to find someone else to pay for it is simply outrageous. It's unproductive, uncollaborative, inhumane, and irresponsible. She says it's hard to think of a more flagrant abnegation of the city's responsibility to all its residents or a policy that shows less commitment to our shared objective of ending homelessness. That was in regard to our decision to seek to find a um, alternative sleeping location or shelter outside of Malibu and if possible to get funding from the county, the state or the federal government. I call bull, okay? LA County keeps 93% of the property taxes paid by Malibu property owners. I think that's an neighborhood of $200 million. People living unhoused in Malibu came to Malibu in an unhoused condition. They didn't lose a home in Malibu. As best I can tell, very few people living unhoused in Malibu are coming down PCH from Ventura County. None of them are coming from sea or dropping out of the air. Rather, by rare, with rare exception, they're coming from other parts of LA County, which has all of our money and which is responsible for these people. It's an abnegation of LA County's responsibility to let that happen. 
Malibu already spends a few hundred thousand dollars per year to address the unhoused situation. A meaningful part of the more than $8 million we pay for law enforcement goes to addressing the situation. And by the way, that's $8 million. That's, that's two thirds or more of the tax dollars that LA County lets us keep. We pay them back that for law enforcement. Our residents also spend large amounts on property tax that goes, goes larger to the county, as already noted. Income tax to the state and federal governments, hundreds of millions of dollars. It's our responsibility to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the 99% of the people in Malibu who have a home here. It's the responsibility of the federal, state, and county governments to care for the unhoused population that's traveled here in an unhoused kept condition from other parts of the county, state, and country. And like I said, they have to come through LA County to get here. So who's abnegating their responsibility? Not us. The comments of the public tonight. Um, Joe Drummond, I don't know how you managed to get all of those batters in in three minutes. That was phenomenal. And I think they're pretty much what we were just talking about. Um, I agree with most of what was said. Lloyd Ahern, I, you know, to say, there are people in your, in, in, in most people in their life, and I hope some are fortunate not to experience this. You come across a person every now and then who the moment you meet them, you know that they're someone you don't like and they're someone who maybe isn't even a good person. Um, Lloyd is one of those very few people in my life where I had that experience. I met Lloyd m many years ago before I ever had any desire or interest in, in government here or public service. And I was having a conversation with another person. I don't even remember what we were talking about, but Lloyd decided he had something to say and he came he was listening over our shoulder, I guess, and came in and joined and berated us for the position we were talking about. But it's, he's, a, he's a political mouthpiece and he's an attack dog. We all know that. And, you know, it's, it's time to talk about Lloyd for a change because he just comes here and he's got his preset thing to say. So, unfortunately, that's the way it is. The Manny Brothers lawsuit, the MBI lawsuit, as I call it, um, Lloyd said the Malibu Times should be looking at it. I agree. I sent them copies of all the pleadings um, a week or two ago. I sent them the complaint. I sent them all the papers that the city filed. I've provided them to anyone in the city that wants to see them. Lloyd, if you send me an email, I'll even be glad to send them to you. Anyone else in the city that wants to see them, happy to provide them. I think the Malibu Times should cover it because I think what's happening is an abuse of the legal system by MBI. And um, you don't just cave in to bully tactics when somebody takes you to court, you stand up to them every now and then when they are that, just that, bully tactics. So happy to happy to share that information with anybody that wants it. Um, and Lloyd, I'm not on probation. You may not like the fact that I was elected. I know that a lot of people who lost the election like to come and complain about it too, but the fact is after you're elected, you're elected. Um, Doug Burge, I, I act, and, and the other speakers, I'm sorry I didn't write your names down. I, I would like to understand the particulars of the project that you're seeking to accomplish that you say you're running into roadblocks or people aren't responding. Um, if that's the case, you ought to be getting responses. I know I do know from, from lengthy talks with Richard, Malika, and others, a lot of times um, residents blame the city planning department for the deficiencies of their own um, employees, their consultants who are told exactly what they need to do. Don't let their clients know that. Don't do it, and the city gets blamed. So I'd like to understand what the details of that is, because if it's the city's fault, it ought to be rectified. If it's not the city's fault, the city shouldn't be blamed for it. Um, and obviously, the planning department does need more help. Um, I mean, I've been watching as um, city planners leave, and it's almost always because they've gotten a promotion of one or two grades to a, a higher position at another city with a substantial raise, and usually it's a lot closer to where they live than Malibu. So we absolutely need to do something about that. Money is usually the first way to um, start solving that kind of problem. Uh, remote, remote working might be a way to solve it. I don't know what the others are, but we absolutely do need to do something about that. I agree with that. So, oh, Howard, Howard, if you if you want the information, same thing. Email me. I'd be glad to share it with you. I'd be glad to meet you. <laughs> you know, we're, as you know, we're living a couple doors away from each other. Be glad to meet you um, out at the uh, picnic table like we did once before and talk about the lawsuit too, if you'd like to. Um, and Barry Haldeman, 
thank you for um, thanking me for speaking as well as thanking the others. And thank you for getting my name right. You're one of the few people in town that does that. Some of them, I think, do it intentionally wrong, but um, others, I think it's just an accident, but thank you, I appreciate that. Um, and, um, you know, if I dropped the F-bomb, I dropped the F-bomb. It was very deliberate, got a constitutional right to do it. It's not unlawful. And sometimes it just has to be said, the county just doesn't give enough about an F about us. And um, they need to be told that every now and then. So thanks, Paul. Thank you, Bruce. I'm going to start with a, a little report about what I've done since the last time. I did attend a chamber mixer that was held at Pepperdine on the 14th of the month. And I was, uh, Steve, I, I'm not aware of them trying to hold a mixer anywhere else. So I'm going to ask some questions and find out about it. I am on their uh, masthead as an honorary person at this point. I haven't attended a chamber board meeting since I became a member of the city council. Uh, on the 16th, I went to uh, the CERT team meeting at Pepperdine at uh, City of Malibu. And they're working on uh, the preparedness uh, event, which will happen, I believe, in June. Uh, and a training device, a training for that is going to happen. And also, the same day, we had Malibu Shreds, which was an electronics recycling uh, and trash uh, hazardous waste collection thing that happened at the city. It was very successful. I want to thank the city employees who made that happen. And on uh, Saturday, April the 23rd, I attended the Road to Carnegie Hall, which was a uh, fundraiser for the Malibu High School Orchestra. And it was uh, put on with the partnership with the Malibu Arts Society, our, our Arts Commission. And I want you all to thank your Arts Commissioners for voting to go ahead and do that. It was very successful. And they raised some money. They're trying to raise 100,000 money to send the entire orchestra to Carnegie Hall. And I hope that people will uh, go out of their way to make a contribution because the kids were really talented. And it's amazing the level of, of talent they, they exhibited and how well they were able to play. And they were playing behind City Hall in that narrow area. And I would love it if the next time that we have something to do with them that we are able to have them in the council chambers. It would have been a very nice, it would have been an even nicer event. And so that's where I am on that. Uh, I wanna thank uh, John Cotty and Steve McClary for answering most of the questions that were asked by people who were uh, commenting earlier. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, to the budget meeting later this week. And I hope that all of you will reflect on uh, what the people said about delays and problems with the planning department. It's time to fund the planning and environmental safety deposits adequately and I departments. And I, I would like to see us be generous in our funding. And uh, Mr. McClary, I see your hand. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I wondered if you could just for a moment call on Acting Captain Fender and uh, Lieutenant Chad Waters from the Sheriff's Department for a brief report. Thank you. I would be delighted to do that. Who would like to lead off? Joe, are you available? Yeah, I'll work, so I'm just trying to get my, uh, wait for them to prove my video. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I'm just waiting for the, uh, the video to start there. I can see Chad. I'm up. We're going to make you jealous now. Oh, there, there you are. are. There it is. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council. I will keep mine brief because I know you've had quite of a long meeting and I want Chad to get to the crime report. So let me just give you a, a brief overview of what we've been doing here at the station outside of the crime report. Um, this morning, I attended our department's crime management forum, which is a meeting between the five patrol stations that are assigned to North Patrol Division, Malibu Lost Hills being one of those. Um, I wanted to report that uh, happily, Malibu Lost Hill Sheriff Station was the only sheriff station within our five station patrol division that's down in crime, which was great. I mean, I, I wish the other stations were down as well, but I'll take the win anywhere I can get it. Uh, we're down right now about 13% in the COG. Um, only one of my five cities is slightly up. It is not Malibu. Malibu is down right now in crime, which I'm happy to report. 
I wanted to uh, briefly touch on, we had a civilian advisory committee last week on the 19th. It was represented by two uh, community members from Malibu. So if you're not familiar with the civilian advisory committee, it is a group of uh, community members from each of our five cities within the COG. They come to the sheriff station and they meet personally with me as well as the community relations deputies. And we have discussions based on uh, what their observations are in the communities that they hail from. And it's, an, it's a, an opportunity for them to push information up to me from the various communities and an uh, opportunity for me to push information down to them so they can get the word out to their communities on crime trends or, or things we're doing here at the station that their communities might be aware of. So good turnout. Um, we're going to be increasing that. I, in fact, I spoke to the two Malibu members about possibly doing a community advisory committee just for Malibu, only because Malibu is so spread out and, and lengthwise across the uh, Pacific Coast Highway there. And there's a lot of different communities in Malibu. I think it might be beneficial to do a separate CAC with them and then have a representative from that CAC come up to the station. That way, I don't have as many people driving up over the hill to meet with us. Um, we did a tobacco sting in Calabasas last week on the 20th, and I know that doesn't directly impact the city of Malibu, but indirectly it does. It shows that we're out there, and even the, the smaller crimes, or what would be a smaller crime on our radar, in terms of selling uh, either alcohol or tobacco to minors, we're addressing that, in addition to some of the things that plague Malibu, like the street racing and the car show and some of the, the issues with people experiencing homelessness. So even though they're not directly attributed to Malibu, it does have an indirect uh, effect on the citizens down there as we operate as a con. Um, additionally, on the 20th, I met with the Topanga Canyon uh, TSEP group in terms of, and spoke with them about wildlife fire preparedness. Um, Carrie Curry was there at the meeting. The meeting was, uh, was turned out uh, very well. I think we probably had 25 people in the little building there in Topanga Canyon. So we had a good discussion there and we'll be doing some, uh, some, thing, some big things with Drew Smith and, Meg, and Megan in terms of wildlife prepared or fire preparedness. We're gonna be doing some hands-on drills. I'm a big fan of getting out there and doing drills and engaging the public as much as we can to do those. I think it's better than, than watching Zoom meetings or getting training on the computer. It's one thing to do that, but it's another thing to get out there and physically do these drills and some of these evacuations on a, on a lower scale because it's more like, it's a lot like muscle memory with some people, you know, you gotta get out there and do it. So it kind of drives it into the brain. So we'll be doing that in the, uh, the near future. We had a catalytic converter etching event uh, this last week in Agora Hills on the 21st. Um, after I mentioned that at the COG, Mr. McCleary reached out and, and asked if we could do it in Malibu. I said, absolutely. My only, the only hitch in the giddy up with Malibu is usually we do those at a, uh, at a car, you know, like an oil change establishment or a car. There's not a lot of uh, car shops in Malibu and, and those are, they, they service some very high end cars. However, I reached out to our trap which is our um, bureau that deals with auto theft and the catalytic converters. And they have a mobile uh, etching uh, mobile etching device that they can roll out. And as long as I have a decent sized parking lot where I can funnel cars in and out, they can make that happen. So I know uh, I've, I've reached out to Lieutenant Waters. He's gonna be speaking with the city, probably with Mr. McCleary or maybe Susan and getting that set up maybe next month. I would like to see if I can get it next month. And then we'll put that information out to, to the residents of Malibu so they can come down there and have the serial numbers or the VIN numbers of their cars etched on their catalytic converters free of charge. They usually run by appointment only, only, excuse me, and they fill up fast. So the events that we've ran in Agora Hills and Westlake Village and Calabasas were limited to about 25 or 30 people and they fill up within an hour. But that's okay because we try to do one every month. So if, if the residents of Malibu can't get in that first one, we're going to try to continue to do them every month, rotate between the cities, and then that service will be available to them to try to combat or mitigate some of this catalytic converter theft that we're having. Um, on Friday, the 22nd last week, I attended the Wallace Annenberg um, Wildlife Crossing event in Agora Hills. And again, not directly affecting Malibu, but indirectly it does. There was a speaker I heard earlier talking about the mountain, the mountain lion um, population, and they gave that presentation at the beginning of the meeting. So huge event. Uh, I'm guessing two, 300 people at least showed up to it. Um, I spent some good time with uh, the mayor and the city staff from Agora Hills and Calabasas. They were there because it directly impacts them, at least with traffic. Um, but it's going to be a, a great uh, uh, addition to the city. It's get, we're going to be involved in it probably within the next two or for the next two or three years because of traffic stuff. Uh, it won't affect Malibu's deployment, but just something to be aware of. It's, it's great for the communities and it really does affect everybody in the Santa Monica Mountains with the wildlife crossing. And I believe that is it. Our next copy with the deputy is going to be in the city of Hidden Hills. Um, but I believe the one after that is Malibu. 
So look for that probably towards the end of May, beginning of June. We'll do our next copy with the deputy. Uh, location yet to be determined. But that is really what's going on with your uh, share station. Our deployment is good right now. I, I spoke to Calabasas earlier and they were asking questions about the deployment in Calabasas and, and if we had enough deputies deployed. And I will tell you the same thing I told them. The deployment in Malibu is we're fully staffed. Um, I am about 20 deputies short at the station, but it doesn't affect the deployment because every time a deputy is out or a deputy is sick or a deputy is injured in Malibu, they're filled with another deputy on an overtime basis. So the contract city minutes are, are being met. Um, Malibu is right at the 98% right now. I'd like to get it a little higher. It was low when I first arrived, but I'd like to get it a little bit higher before the end of the fiscal year, which is June 30th. Um, but you're right at the minimum threshold, which is 98%. So we're looking good. Um, only one person out long-term COVID, as I've reported before, but she's doing good. I just don't know when she might be back to work. And that is it from the sheriff's station, unless you have any questions for me. And I will turn it over to my, my right-hand lieutenant, uh, Chad Waters, for the crime report. Thank you, Captain. Uh, I see a, a hand from Bruce Silverstein. Yes, sir. Yeah, just a quick question. What, what, if anything, do you know about this tower that people are talking about? Are you referring to the tower at the new station? Yeah. So I was told that the tower was put up. Uh, I wasn't able to come see it. I was trying to make it down there last Friday. I had a meeting uh, with Mr. Uring over at Malibu High School. We, we met over there and, and talked to the principal over there on, on a different issue. And I wanted to get back to the other side of Malibu, but I didn't have a chance to get the other 23 miles down. I'm under the impression, and please, anyone on the panel, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm under the impression that the tower was up. Um, I don't know if how aesthetically it looks to the city of Malibu, um, but if there are some complaints or some concerns, I, I'd appreciate it if you'd let me know. Uh, I know that's always an important issue in Malibu to the residents is not only functionality, but aesthetics. So if people have a problem with that, I would really like to know. I mean, there's only so much we can do. I don't want that to sound like, a, like a, a, you know, I'm drawing a line in the sand. I mean, that I don't know how much we can aesthetically make the tower look. Uh, I'm guessing at the beach, it's a tower. Um, so I can't make it look like you know a 50-foot redwood tree, but I'm willing to work with the community if we can do so uh, and try to make them you know happy with the product that we're providing. I mean, functionality is going to be great for us, but we'll try to we'll try to work with them. You may be able to see it if you just step outside at Lost Hills and look. <laughs> yeah, it's that's it's a hard one, Mr. Silverstein. I, I appreciate the comments. It's it's difficult, right? They have to be big enough for us to get to get the the signal out. And as you know or may not know. In the area of the Ka, we have some, some areas that are very difficult to reach, no matter how big these towers are. Topanga Canyon and some of the outlying areas of the Santa Monica Mountains, they're hard to reach with even the equipment that we have now. So, but, but please, if you have any concerns, please let me know, and I'll try to, I'll try to work with our uh, Communications and Fleet Management Bureau and try to come up with some kind of solution. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Bruce. Chad. Yes, sir. How you doing, Mr. Mayor, Council? I just wanted to update you guys on a few of the things we're working on down there in Malibu. Uh, we have run two traffic operations down there since the uh, last time we spoke a couple weeks ago. One was in regards to the uh, car show that Steve spoke about earlier. Um, the day went really well. We targeted people leaving the car show and coming to the car show. 49 sites were ridden or speeding and racing and or racing. One vehicle was towed. Uh, nine of those vehicles had loud exhaust and were sent to the traffic referee. So those people are going to have to get their vehicles looked at by a traffic referee and then they'll decide whether or not they're going to uh, have them replace or remodify their vehicles. Um, that was a huge success. We're still working on the verbiage for the signs. That should be uh, given over to them within the next week and have some product uh, made up and hopefully displayed here in the next week or two. Uh, the second operation we did was a crosswalk operation. It was a grant uh, funded by the state and we had uh, 46 failed yield sites written that day, five cell phone, one in safe speed and one in unlicensed driver. So both of these uh, two operations were hugely successful. Um, when we look back at the car show, the last two weeks we've had a lot lower turnout than we've had in the past, uh, both on Easter Sunday and just yesterday. So uh, I think we're getting our point across out there, trying to keep people from coming. Um, as you know, Malibu is a destination, and a lot of the people that are coming to these we found are not from Malibu. So, and the ones that are from Malibu, 
they're not the ones getting cited because they're not the ones uh, driving erratically because they live in Malibu, I'm, I'm assuming. So uh, on top of that, uh, we also had written um, 914 sites during the last month. So 316 of those for unsafe speed. So anybody who's out there saying that we're, you don't see us, we're not out there giving tickets, that's a lot of tickets. So, so you know, slow down, make sure everybody slows down, pay attention. There's a lot of construction along PCH on both ends. We're working on it. Um, we're also working on continuing to uh, mitigate or at least try to get rid of all of these RVs and RV issue. We had ended up getting... I'm sure everybody knows of the one down in the uh, coastline area, the Silver Airstream. Uh, that's gone. So just one more uh, gone and in the tow yard, and hopefully we'll be able to do a few more. We have uh, our, our groups coming back out this week, and we're going to start targeting them again uh, with both of our two um, no-call cars that will be out there. So those are the big things to look forward to um, this next month. I thought uh, Captain Fender would mention it, but we're going to be working a lot on uh, the vehicle burglaries down in the, the, the beach area. So look to have a few operations down there in the coming month or two, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to mitigate that and stop that as well. So any questions, sir? I just want to thank you both and uh, and apologize for not putting you on right after Steve McClary the first time around. And I, I it's my fault. But well, Steve Uring has raised his hand. Yes, sir. If you want to get some recognition where recognition is due, I mentioned it to the captain when we met last week. You guys are doing a heck of a job with the cars. I mean, everybody I talk to acknowledges things have gotten much, much better. So thank you all very much. I'll pass that on our traffic unit. I really appreciate that, sir. Thank you, sir. I see Howard Rudsky has raised his hand. Even though it's not appropriate, I'm going to recognize him. So be appropriate, Howard. It will be appropriate, polite, and, polite and nice. <clears throat> I've gotten a number of messages since I spoke. I don't know if it's something legal, but I didn't understand what Mr. Cotty said. I appreciate Bruce meeting me in person. But I don't want to be the arbitrator. I think that you guys should just state, well, now we know there's a lawsuit by Manny Brothers. What's it about and who's being sued? And just get it out in the open so everyone knows. I think that might be better if there's no legal reason why not to. Because I don't want to be telling people. Bruce tells me, I tell them. You know how that story goes. By the time it gets to a sixth person, it's completely different. Thank you. Thank you for recognizing me. Thank you, Howard. Howard, like I said. All the documents are available to be read. That's the best way to find out exactly what's going on. Happy to provide them. All right. We are, uh, that brings us to the consent calendar, I believe. Have any items been pulled from the consent calendar by the public? Yes. Item 3B4 has been pulled by the public. 3B4. Okay. Uh, I'll make a motion to approve the rest of the calendar. Consent a calendar. second. Does anybody on the council want to approve to pull any of the other consent items? So we have a motion and a second to approve everything but to but three B four of the consent calendar. Kelsey, will you take the roll? Council Member Pearson? Yes. Council Member Fair? Yes. Council Member Yarin? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Versanti? Yes. Motion carries. That item brings us to item 3B4. Yes. And, and we have three speakers if you'd like to hear from them. I would love to. Who do we have? They are Bill Sampson, Howard Rudsky, and Lonnie Gordon. We'll hear from Bill Sampson first. Very good. Bill? Uh oh. I, am I on? You're on. Oh, thank you. Okay, uh, uh, this, this is about meeting in person. And I wholeheartedly believe, even though I am on a commission, that the commissions, the councils, and what have you ought to meet face to face. Um, I hate to make you guys do the driving and decide whether or not to wear a mask, but I think it would be beneficial, um, uh, at least when you make unkind remarks about each other you might have to look each other in the in the eye um, if you're capable of that. So 
that would be the other thing is I would have loved to have gotten the chance to talk to Captain Fender tonight um, because I just left my wife's Prius parked for 17 days near the airport and it still has its converter, but I really appreciate that. And sir, Mr. Waters, if you can figure out a way to make my 48 Mercury go faster, I'd appreciate it and I'd speak to you in person. It won't go fast enough to get a ticket. But seriously, I think for the, for the meetings, gasoline, I was just on an island out in the middle of nowhere and the gasoline there was cheaper than it is here. And I used a half a tank in two and a half weeks and it was painful to pay for that when I dropped it off at the rental agency. Um, I'm not I'm not made out of money, uh, it seems. So to have us drive down there, members of the public on this, I think it's a it would be good to come up with a hybrid meeting. I think the public in, um, input would be better. Uh, I believe this I, is agendized and another I, under another oh, item. I, 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 I thought it was, I couldn't figure out which one it was. I signed up for both of them. It looked like it was this one. And forgive me if I if I'm stepping into the wrong one. It it didn't make sense to me. It looked like I was talking on this one. And Paul, I swim at five in the morning. Okay, I'm probably going to be asleep before you get to item seven. So if you can, bear with me. If you can't, shut me off. But getting the public there. We won't waste the gas. We won't pollute the air with driving down there. Some of us have vehicles that get 10 miles a gallon. Some of us have vehicles that get 40 or 50 or they're electric. Um, all I'd have to do is rewire my house. But for three minutes burning in my case, if I took that beater truck that I drive around, it's probably, I don't know, 10 or 20 bucks to get down there and home for three minutes. And I'm not I'm not alone in that one. And I think it'd be helpful to the public if they want to come. Great. If they don't um, figure out a way to make it hybrid, um, you folks ought to meet in person if at all possible. I don't believe the pandemic's gone. We're going to be over a million deaths within a couple of weeks. Um, you know things are just not good anywhere. But at least please get that consideration. And if it should have been on the other agenda, pretend I said it then because I'll probably be asleep. My apologies. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Howard Redsky, followed by Lonnie Gordon. Howard? I, uh, hold on. Okay, I unmuted. Okay, uh, I'll make it quick. I believe we should all meet in person because if you want to say something and if you can't drive 10 minutes to say it, it probably shouldn't be said. Thank you. Thank you, Howard. And let me just take a moment to tell people that this is to continue to authorize the use of this uh, this resolution uh, pursuant to AB 361. And if we if we don't do it, we don't have any option about what we're going to do. So that's what this is about. Lonnie, are you ready to speak? I am. Can you hear me? We can hear you. I did not uh, sign up to speak about the agendized item. Actually, I had, again, a lot of trouble getting online tonight, which is unusual. In the last two months, I've had issues. But um, I do want to mention the tower down by the by SMUCC. Um, I know it's a county tower. It's on, I don't know if that's county property or city property, but I would like the city to look into that because it is to me a macro tower. And if they plan on putting two more installations on it, I think that we have a problem. And um, I plan on looking into it and I just wanted you to know that I, I hope that you will too. And um, I will not speak on the agendized item because you know how I feel about it. <laughs> I did send a letter. Thank you for putting it on the agenda. I really appreciate that. Thank you, Lonnie. And Mayor, that was our final speaker. So that concludes public comment on this item. Okay, do we have a motion with regard to item 3B4? I'll make a motion to approve it. I'll second. We have a motion and a second to approve item 3B4. Bruce has raised his hand. So we're open for discussion, Bruce. 
I'll be brief. Um, first of all, <laughs> Bill Sampson, you're right. It would be good for us to be able to look each other in the eye. Unfortunately, we actually look each other in the eye better on Zoom than we do when we're sitting next to each other <laughs> on the podium. I wish there was a way we actually could see each other when we're talking there. Uh, but in any event, this, this, as Paul alluded to, this resolution is simply to provide the ability to have remote meetings if we desire to and decide to do so. Um, and if anyone were to read through it, it really is simply a recitation of facts which are indisputably true, correct facts. So, I mean, basic, we're, we're saying the county is still saying that social distancing is, is helpful and it is appropriate if people want to have these meetings to have them this way. I would like to propose one small change in the text, which is item F says, the city council of the city of Malibu desires to continue to hold virtual meetings pursuant to AB 361 and government code section 54953E. Um, it may be that we're going to determine later tonight that we do continue, desire to continue to hold them, but I, I would suggest that it should say desires to have the ability to continue. That way we're not making a finding in here that we wish to continue to meet remotely, just that we want to make the findings necessary to permit that, and that's a separate item later we're going to decide. So the, the, the if, if you'll take a friendly amendment, it is that is to insert the words have the ability in item F after um, the word continue, continue to, I'm sorry, continue to. John, uh, Mr. Cotty, does that, I'm sorry, does that change our legal standing in any way on this issue by changing the language? No, it does not. Okay, I'll, I'll accept the amendment. Thank you. Karen, we yes. accept a second? Yes. Okay, any other questions? Kelsey, will you call the roll, please? Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Green? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, that takes us to item 4A. Everybody's okay to continue to 4A. Which is a schedule of fees for the fiscal year 2022-2023. And the recommended action is to conduct a public hearing and adopt a resolution. Do we have any, let's see, do we have a staff report? You do. Good evening, Mayor, Good evening. Council Members, and City Manager, and the members of the public. I am pleased to provide brief comments for you this evening regarding the schedule of fees for fiscal year 22-23. The matter was discussed at the Administrative and Finance Subcommittee meeting on April 11th. And as you may know, or and was included in the um, agenda materials, the last time the city conducted a comprehensive fee study was for fiscal year 2015. The proposed budget for the upcoming year as published last week does include resources sufficient to update the city's cost allocation plan and fee study. Since 20, uh, which is much needed, <laughs> since 2015-16, however, all fees have been adjusted annually for CPI, and this year, the CPI for the 12 months preceding February 28th, 2022 is 7.4%, and therefore, the fees are adjusted accordingly. Starting on page two of the staff report, there are three significant changes to the fee schedule from the previous year, other than those um, there really are no uh, major or changes of note. And um, if you have any questions, of course, we have uh, my colleagues from the departments here to discuss. And with that, I will hand it back over to you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Do we have any members of the public who have signed up to speak? No, you don't have any speaker sign up. So I don't see any raised hands. So that concludes public comment. Thank you. Karen, I see your hand raised. Would you like to open public comment? Yeah, I'd that like to make a motion to uh, adopt resolution 2213. I will, I'll second the motion. We have a motion and a second to adopt the uh, resolution. Any discussion? I, I just will say quickly that uh, when I was first on council, I spent hours trying to understand this thing and meeting with staff and and yeah, it was, I'm glad I did. Now I understand it. And now I don't have any more questions. That's it. That's it. Thank you, Mikey. Bruce. 
I did my best to understand this. It all seemed to make sense as best I could tell. But, you know, what, I'm comforted by the fact that Ryan hasn't spoken tonight and told us what's wrong with it. So we must be doing something right with this one. Having said that, would you like to call the question? <laughs> Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Green? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, that brings us to item 6A, and I think this would be an appropriate point to take a 10 minute break. And that's now 829, so I'd like to meet us back here at uh, 929. No, 839. You're right, 939. <laughs> Very good. Eight, Thank you, Bruce. 839. 839. <laughs> My attempt to get an hour off. It didn't work. Take a nap. <laughs> See you in 10 minutes. Bye.
Okay. Okay, it is 8.39. So I will suggest we reconvene and go to item 6A. Six A is uh, I'm sorry. Six A is a potential tax measure, so we are going to receive a, a report on potential tax measures previously identified by the City Council. And I see we have the slide up. Yes, thank you. Good evening, Mayor Crisanti and the honorable members of the Malibu City Council. The item before you now for consideration is the potential tax measures previously identified by the City Council. Over the last several years, the city has weathered many significant impacts to the budget that raise some concerns about the city's overall financial sustainability and the need to consider revenue generating measures. In fiscal year 2021, in response to the economic impacts of the pandemic and the Council's continued commitment to help homeowners rebuild after the Woolsey fire, the Council established a, a general fund designated reserve for fiscal year 21-22 in the amount of $6.5 million. In June 2021, at the time of budget adoption, the project projected fiscal year 21-22 general fund revenues were estimated to be less than the general fund expenditures and $3.8 million from the general fund designated reserve was utilized in order to balance the city's operating budget. The council was concerned that the projected revenue shortfall might continue in future fiscal years and directed staff to return to, to council with options to address this issue. Next slide, please. In fact, significant impacts to the city's reserve revenue, sorry, and expenditures are anticipated in the coming years. Since June 2021, many city revenue sources have recovered more than anticipated, and the mid-year budget amendment approved in January 2022 included $5.66 million increase in general fund revenue. With this significant increase, the drawdown from the designated reserve initially reflected in the adopted budget for fiscal year 21-22 was no longer required. However, next slide please. While the city's budget is currently balanced and the reserves remain strong, the city is anticipated to face significant revenue impacts and potential increases in expenditures in the near term. Most notably, there will likely be revenue and expenditure impacts associated with the proposed implementation of additional short-term rental regulations and the opening and staffing of the Malibu Sheriff substation. In addition, there are also economic factors that could indicate a potential economic downturn. Next slide, please. With this in mind, on November 8th of 2021, staff presented council with the recommendations from the Administrative Administration and Finance Subcommittee regarding potential revenue generating measures, and council directed staff to explore the following tax measures, district sales tax, documentary transfer tax, and parking occupancy tax related specifically to valet parking, all of which are subject to voter approval. Next slide, please. The city's current sales tax rate is 9.5%. In fiscal year 21-22, the city is anticipated to receive $4.5 million from this revenue source. In addition, with voter approval, the city may adopt a district sales tax, also known as a transaction and use tax. Currently, the allowable sales tax rate in LA County is capped at 10.25%. This leaves up to 0.75% that the city could charge for transaction and use tax also known as TUT. Revenues from TUT differ from sales tax in that TUT revenues are allocated to the place of first use, as opposed to where the sale is negotiated or the order is taken. That would be paid on normal sales tax generated businesses like retail so stores, service stations, and restaurants, which visitors and residents alike would pay, as well as any purchases shipped or delivered to a Malibu address outside the city, including vehicles, oh, sorry, yeah, from outside the city, <laughs> including vehicles, boats, and motorcycle purchases, which would likely be paid by residents only. A more detailed explain explanation of how this tax is applied was prepared by the city's sales tax consultant, HDL Companies, and was provided as part of the staff report. In addition, we are joined by Barry Foster, 
principal and managing director um, with HDL, who has extensive knowledge of TUT and is available to answer any questions tonight. Next slide, please. Barry and his team prepared an analysis of how TUT would impact residents and non-residents. The chart shown on this slide breaks down the estimated TUT revenue generated by non-residents per market sector and compares it to the existing Bradley Burns 1% um, tax that Malibu currently receives. As you can see, it is estimated that 73% of the proposed TUT revenue would be generated by non-residents and 27% would be generated by residents as compared to the estimated 80-20 um, split of the existing sales tax revenue. This percentage is higher than most city, cities HDL has examined. Next slide, please. If council is interested in pursuing a TUT ballot measure, it would need to determine what rate to propose to voters, up to 0.75%. HDL has updated its revenue estimates for the three rate scenarios previously provided to council on November, uh, November of 2021, as shown on the slide. Potential revenue is now estimated to range from 1.4 to $4.3 million, depending on the rate. It should be noted that the maximum sales tax rate increase available in Malibu could decline in future years, below the 0.75% currently available. Within the last six years, the sales tax rate has increased in Malibu due to the approval of two countywide sales tax increases, Measure M for countywide transportation and Measure H for countywide homeless services. If other measures are approved on a countywide basis, they could reduce the potential sales tax increase city voters could approve in Malibu. Because the maximum rate is set at 10.25% and does not necessarily increase as, one, as other new, um, new increases are approved by voters. Instead, the amount available may diminish. For example, if a 2.5% countywide increase were to be approved in the future, local Malibu voters could only approve a point 5% increase for local services. Council may want to consider this as a factor when deciding um, on a, or if considering a potential sales tax increase in the city. Next slide, please. Excuse me, Liz. Council had also wanted to consider an amendment to the current parking occupancy tax to include valet parking. The current prop, uh, parking tax rate approved by voters in 2000 is 10%. Since the agenda was published, HDL was was able to come up with a rough high level conservative estimate of the revenue this tax measure would generate. HDL estimates that these revenues would range from 50 to $150,000 annually. This estimate is based on certain assumptions about the number of parking spaces and the cost of the underlying parking spaces. Data on these key variables, as well as other data, such as the duration of occupancy and the hours of LA operations, would be, would needed, would be needed to be gathered in order for a more precise estimate um, for the, uh, the fiscal impact to be able to be calculated. Next slide, please. The last revenue generating option the council had wanted to consider was a ballot measure to increase the existing documentary transfer tax in a tiered structure, similar to what was recently approved in the city of Santa Monica and Culver City. Unfortunately, after further research, it was determined that this is, option is only available for charter cities. And since Malibu is a general law city, it is precluded from pursuing this. Next slide, please. A TUT or valet parking tax measure would require voter approval to be enacted. The requirements for voter approval depend on the purpose of the tax funds. A vote on a general tax to be used for general city purposes requires a simple majority and must be held as part of the consolidated general election. The next consolidated general election is scheduled for November 8th of 2022. A special tax, which funds are uh, dedicated for a specific purpose, requires a two-thirds supermajority. To pass and does not need to be considered as part of a consolidated election. If the council is interested in placing a tax measure on the November 2022 ballot for voter consideration, conventional wisdom suggests that the council select one tax measure to focus on. Limiting the focus to one tax measure is said to improve the chances of that measure gaining voter approval. Given the estimated revenue to be generated by a TUT, and that approximately 73% of that revenue is estimated to be paid by non-residents, it is recommended that council focus on a measure to introduce a TUT tax rate um, of, at either 0.25%, 0.5%, or 0.75%. 
Next slide, please. If the council wishes to initiate a ballot measure to impose a TOT or amend the existing parking tax for the November 8th, 2022 general municipal election, it must direct staff to bring back resolutions to submit the question to voters, setting priorities for arguments and rebuttals, and direct the city attorney to prepare an impartial analysis. And the council must call for the election ballot measures at a council meeting prior to August 2022, uh, preferably the first meeting in July. That concludes the presentation for this item. Staff and Barry Foster from HDL are available to any to answer any questions. Thank Does you. anyone have any technical question for the presenter before we speak to the public? And I see Bruce's hand. Yes, I, I do. Um, the chart that showed the estimated impact of TUT from which the conclusion was derived that 73% estimated to come from non-residents. Can you put that chart up for a moment? Liz, do you happen to have that slide number to help them get it up faster? I believe it's slide number seven. No, 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 it's slide six. That one. So I want to make sure I understand this correctly. Um, I, as I see it, it's telling us what percentage of the total of each one of these items that would be taxed will be paid by non-residents with the, the implicit part being the other percentage would be residents. Is that right? Um, yes, partially. Um, it has a, there's a note in the report that was provided as an attachment to the staff report that explains how each of these percentages are derived. Um, Barry Foster could speak to that a little more. Okay, well, when, if he does, this is my, this is my, the real question I need to understand. These, this doesn't show how much is estimated to come from each one of these categories. So if food and drugs, for example, were the vast majority of all of the TUT revenue, 86% of that coming from non-residents, would be substantial. In fact, it would, it would probably bump the, um, the, the average percentage upward. On the other hand, if the autos and transportation were the largest one in total, it, that would bump up what the residents are paying. These are apples and oranges, if I understand the chart correctly. That's what I'm trying to understand because it doesn't tell what the total estimated tax from each one of these is. This is just a blending of percentages of all different types of numbers. Am I, am I missing something on that? If, if I could maybe answer that question, um, council member. Um, if you look at page three of, of our actual report, it was part of your agenda packet. Um, it does show the, the breakdown for each one of those categories in terms of, of what the Bradley Burns does. So it's, it's pretty close to what the TUT would be. So like um, autos and transportation only makes up 3.1% of the total sales tax that's generated um, in Malibu. And then as you kind of go through the list, um, uh, building construction uh, makes up 3.2%, uh, business industry makes up 5%, food and drug, um, you mentioned that, um, also does uh, 10.7 and then you get up into some of the bigger categories so general consumer goods makes up 23.7 percent and then the, the largest category in terms of sales tax revenue that's produced in Malibu is the restaurant and hotel sector. So it is the takeaway from this that the 73 percent is of the total revenue from TUT 73 percent of it would come from non-residents or is Yes, that's correct. No, no, that's exactly right. And so okay. it's, it's, it's looking at the different components and the impact in terms of what they produce in over, overall sales. And so it, it's, it's part of the methodology is blending that and coming up with the overall category. So here you've got food and drugs, it's 86.1%. Um, but, but that's still, uh, I mean, that's only producing 10.7% of the total, total sales tax revenue. So that's taken into consideration. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, uh, Steve, you have a question? Elizabeth, I can't remember what slide it was, but you made a statement that said that if the county increases their sales tax, it limits what we can do in terms of this tax that we're talking about. Is that correct? 
That is my understanding. Yeah, I, I, I can answer that too. So, yeah. So, let me just, let me finish the, okay, the question. So, let's assume they pass a 0.25 increase in whatever the heck they're going to do. Can we then, yeah, can, can we come back and, and, and you said that if, we, that if they do a 0.25, we can only do a 5 0, 0.50 or 0 0.75. Why can't we also, as long as they stay below, we stay below the total, why can't we just put another 2.5 in? Does that make sense? Or I just... Yeah, you could do that. So, so the cap is 10.25%. Right. And so you have an availability to do 0.75% total in LA County um, in Malibu. So if, if the county were, were to do a, a countywide sales tax measure and say it's 0.25, then in, um, there, there would only be 0.5%. Um, available in Malibu, or if it's higher, it could, it could preclude you from doing something. So, but I can I can break that point five in half. I can do point two five if I want to. Correct, and so okay. and, and it, so the, so the cap is the cap. And a lot of cities, gotcha. the, va the vast majority of cities in California are already at that cap. Okay, I mean, there's only there's only really only a handful of cities in in LA County that that haven't hit the the ten point two five percent cap already. Elizabeth, just one last question. We'll go to part. If, if if we decide to do anything with the tax rate, when is the drop dead date to get to you to say this is what we want to do? And the reason I ask that, I mean, I got a whole there there are you know the sheriff substation, for example. I mean, we're projecting that could cost us four million dollars a year. Well, I, there have been conversations that, and that assumes that we bring the captain in with all his staff and everything else. There are other options out there that may reduce that. And, and I just don't know what the total numbers are going to be until I get to the end. So when is the drop dead date to, to go to you and say, we want to do this and we don't want to do it? What is that date? Well, there's a, a there's a date by which the council must um, adopt the resolutions that were um, detailed at the end of the presentation. And that would be um, in early August. So it's recommended that council um, do take action by, by July. So that now, we can make sure we get on the, the early August date, everything's got the, the 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 items have to be all detailed out, right? We've got all the arguments done. Yes. That's what that's yes. what the council's gonna have to approve. So what we've got to do is get to you in July. So you got a month to get all this stuff drafted up in theory for a vote in August. I would prefer that in June. Well, you just change the month now. You get no, it. no, no. July, you, I, I, <laughs> I think that it would be best if the um, resolutions were adopted in July so they could be transmitted to the county. Gotcha. By the okay. August that. deadline. That's cool. That's all I got, Paul. Go to the all right. Do we have any members of the public who've signed up to speak? We have three speaker sign ups. They are Bill Sampson, Joe Drummond, and Lloyd Ahern. I don't see Bill Sampson in the media anymore. He media told us anymore. he was going to bed. Yes, he did. We'll see if we can circle back anyway, but we'll hear from. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I was looking on my wrong screen. My apologies. For this item, you have Ryan and Howard Rudsky are your speakers. Okay. And we, we do have Ryan here. Hi, Ryan, are you available? Uh, can you hear me now? We can hear you. Okay, this actually nothing's really changed in 25 years except the tax rate. That people uh, go out to eat in Malibu and they buy gas in Malibu. That's about it. When we had the lumber yard where they actually sold stuff, um, then uh, we had revenue from that. Uh, we have to realize we'd be taxing Malibu people 365 days a year for a lot of things that they purchase at, you know, CVS Pharmacy and so forth. Uh, food is generally at the market. That's tax-free. So I don't know, so you were in a category, if you could put that back up, um, that was, that would only be prepared restaurant or hot food, uh, takeout food that qualifies for taxation in the first place. So I, I question a little bit of that number. But we've heard this argument about every three years forever that, hey, we ought to jack the taxes up as maximum as they can be because maybe someday the county will increase their tax and then we wouldn't get it. Uh, well, that's always going to be. Um, you think county is going to do that? That would be disastrous to their economy. It's one of the largest in the world that isn't a state or a country. So I think they're pretty much taxed out. Um, I'm not scared of losing this concept that we couldn't get uh, you know, uh, a sales tax passed if we wanted to or needed to. And the question is, are we gonna keep this in our back pocket? Because I don't think we need it right now. And if we do it now, 
we hire a bunch more staff, we you do a lot of things, and then when you do need it in the future, maybe, maybe we'll be maxed out. Um, so that's that's part of the issues there. Um, I don't think it's a good idea. Uh, we we I'm going to dovetail into the item you just uh, did that I didn't comment on, and that is you substantially increased um, your fees seven percent I think for the year, and then on the other issue of uh, the parking uh, revenue and fine schedule that was uh, just approved recently, that some of those fees came close to doubling, and if I recall. The projected revenue from parking tickets was over a million and close to 1.4 million. And if you're going to double a handful of those or half of them, we're going to see like 2 million. So you're already going to have more revenue uh, coming in. So I'm looking at this quarter and half percent on the screen, and you know I don't think we need it. Um, we're not going to be waiving uh, construction or, or permit uh, professional review fees in the future. I think the city can handle it. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, Ryan. Who do we have next? We have Howard Rudsky, followed by Joe Drummond. Hi, Howard. Are you available? I am. I say whatever you guys decide with the consultants that the citizens should vote on it. Thank you. Thank you, Howard. And our next speaker is Joe Drummond. Hi, Joe, are you ready? Yes, hi. So my questions are a few. I just have, just watching the presentation. I'm regarding the new Tesla showroom and other car dealerships in Malibu. How much have we made in the last three months from these? What percentage do we get from new motor vehicle sales tax? And then it does look like many of our taxes are doubling, such as the city's parking fine. So I agree with Ryan, we shouldn't raise the sales tax right now. That would affect Malibu residents mostly. And why are 40% of people not paying their parking tickets? What are we paying the billing agent for? That sounds like a poor collection rate. What is the rate of other cities like Calabasas getting paid? And then also regarding total occupancy tax collected, has that gone up from last year? If so, by how much? Thanks. Thank you, Joe. And Mayor, I don't see any other speaker signups or raised hands, so that concludes public comment. That brings it back to the council. And Karen Fair has raised her hand. Well, um, I don't know if it's uh, appropriate, but since we had the question, <clears throat> Elizabeth, maybe you or uh, Ruthie would like to uh, talk about the difference between fees, fines, and user taxes. Absolutely, I'm happy to do so. Um, so the, as I as I mentioned, the um, the schedule of fees is a cost recovery um, methodology, and that is uh, upon which um, those fees were originally calculated and are currently based. Of, of course, with that annual CPI from 2015-16. So every year we add um, a little bit, and again, it's time to just take a new look. But it is only for cost recovery. It is not for generating any revenue. Um, and the the difference with the um, the other the taxes like we're talking here or the transit occupancy tax that was just mentioned is that those are revenue generating um, items that then can go for general city services or um, the of course the purview of the of the council. Uh, I thought you were going to ask me um, how the transit occupancy tax um, is, is doing and if, if you'll uh, indulge me for just a moment. For hotels and motels, we are projected to, um, currently we are projected to receive what was budgeted, which is 2.75 million. So uh, it is slightly higher than the actuals from uh, fiscal year 2021. So the last fiscal year. Um, uh, and those were already discussed and recognized by the council at the mid-year budget discussion. For private rentals, that's the issue that really is um, one of the major items that's at hand and will be discussed in detail with our proposed budget, and that is the change to the ordinance for private rentals. And if that change were to go through, the uh, estimated reduction in the annual revenues um, is pretty significant. Between three and five million is a pretty wide range, but it's um, somewhere in that uh, neighborhood. 
And that is one of the two significant impacts that um, Liz and I have discussed that are included in the proposed budget and that she mentioned to you. So the loss of those uh, resources would certainly put us upside down and um, require uh, quite a change in our operational budget. Uh, and just to answer the question directly for private um, for private rentals, we are um, projected to receive about the same, actually a little less than we did for the past fiscal year, fiscal year 2021. So for the current year, just a little less, a few hundred thousand. Okay, thank you, Ruthie. Um, I would say for myself, I don't think there's any reason to consider the um, the parking, what is it called? Parking occupancy tax, valet parking. Uh, I think it's a waste to make that a ballot measure uh, for the return. So for me, that's not even worth considering. Um, I do think we ought to be concerned about the county uh, raising their taxes and precluding us from doing that because of the cap. And I, I agree with the staff report. Um, choose one thing, choose our best option uh, and make that a ballot measure. And I am in favor of the um, the TUT. I don't. I I think this is our chance now, and we do have additional expenses coming up. We do want that sheriff substation manned to the maximum ability uh, that the facility can have. I think the only question I'm happy to listen to my fellow council members on what the rate ought to be on this ballot measure. And that's it for me for the moment. Thank you, Karen. Mikey is next, followed by Bruce. Thank you, Paul. I gotta say this, this item caught me completely off guard. Um, I didn't, didn't see it coming this way after the meeting Steve and I had when we went over this, which was a great meeting, you know? The valet parking was low hanging fruit. It just seemed to make sense. Uh, your point is is valid, Karen. It's 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 not that much money. It just seemed like it was a loophole that got missed before. But uh, I believe Steve and I, not to speak for him, but I believe we're both really excited about the documentary transfer tax. It really made a lot of sense. You know, um, they're not maybe they own a home in Malibu, but you know maybe not. So they're not really even residents yet. And it was uh, we'd seen what other cities had done and generated out of this, and it would have cured all sorts of, you know, would have, would have been made a lot of sense. Our rate was lower than a lot of cities. And so to find out we couldn't do this really took, took my breath away reading this. Um, I, uh, as you know, I brought forward the TOT increase whenever it was a couple of years ago, a few years ago, and now I forget the last year. Um, and it was beautiful because it was all people that were, it was all tourists <laughs> that, and that just seemed fair, you know, that we take care of so many millions of people a year that there ought to be a mechanism to have help paying for those services, including the sheriff's, sheriff's station, which would make such a difference in our ability um, to police the city because, you know, first of all, they'd be actually located in the city, not driving back and forth. Um, so I'm going to, I understand the sales tax thing. I didn't expect to see it here. It wasn't something that we really um, focused on, Steve and I. So I'm, I'm going to listen to uh, other counselors take since I, you know, I come from a jaded position thinking I was going to see something else on this item and uh, I'll reserve my comments and the rest for later. Thank you. Thank you, Mikey. Bruce, you have the floor. Okay, so I was surprised when we first didn't hear that Ryan was going to speak, and then it's just the wrong list. But, um, I have a couple questions. One is, um, how much is it expected to cost to seek um, re approval to get a ballot measure passed? What's what's the likely cost of that? Do we know? We um... – as a jurisdiction are not allowed to spend our own resources for any uh, public 
promotion or any such activities. I uh, believe that the costs associated with um, producing the resolution, the legalities uh, leading up to that, and actually putting it on um, the, the ballot are, are minimal. Uh, we will double, we'll double check that, but it, it couldn't possibly be more than, I don't know, maybe $20,000 at the most. Great. So any advocacy or um, electioneering, that's done by someone else? Yes. Okay. Um, separate and apart from this issue, by the way, I'd like to um, ask Steve, um, the PowerPoint presentation was very helpful to me. In fact, they almost always are. Is there a way going forward we can get them right, you know, if, if at the latest, at, at the time the meeting's about to begin so that we can have them to follow on our own as well? That's that's just a general question. If, if it could be done, that would be great. Um, thank you, no, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, yeah, and I shared Mikey's disappointment that we can't do the documentary text, but I was ready to do that one as well. Um, I don't, I'm on, I'm very much on the fence with this TUT. It's great to have the money. Don't necessarily want to raise taxes on our residents, although I guess they're the ones that will vote to do it if they choose to. But I, I continue, I said this during our earlier meeting where we gave direction, I continue to believe that we've got more room under the cap, the legal cap of the TOT. And I know we just raised it a year, two years ago, whatever, but there's still another, there's still some percentage in which we have room. And as Mikey said, and as I said last time we talked about this, for the most part, our residents don't pay that. Um, and when Karen talks about the sheriff substation, um, one of the reasons we need support is because of people that come to Malibu from elsewhere, um, as more so than because of people in Malibu. Who are lawless. So um, I would just ask that we give some further thought to raising the TOT to whatever the legal maximum is. I know, I remember being told last time we are already one of the highest, if not the highest, but okay, someone's got to be the highest. We're also a high-end community. It's a destination and the law provides a cap for whatever reason. So if, as long as you don't go over the cap, you're within the law. So I, I, I'd like to give some consideration to that. Um, and I'll reserve judgment on what I think about the TU2 before I hear from others, but I'm not favorably inclined. Thank you, Bruce. Steve? Uh, yeah, like Mike, I'm heartbroken over this <laughs> documented transfer tax. That mansion tax, I mean, it's making these cities a lot of money. I'm just really sorry there's not some way we can do that. Here's, here's my concern. There's stuff going on that I don't know enough about yet. I'd like, you know, I, I, I spent some time trying to go through the budget this morning or yesterday, whatever day it was. And, you know, there is, I look at property taxes. You know, typically property, in our budget right now, typically property taxes raise about 5% a year, right? Someplace in there. And the budget, we've got it listed at 3%. And, I'm, you know, so I was trying to get an idea that says, boy, if the numbers come in, you know, over with some historical perspective, what is that going to look like for us? Uh, then I look at this property tax, and I was trying to figure out, you know, we're building all these new homes. The property tax we're collecting on the burnt out residences right now is primarily based upon the, the value of the property. Is that correct? Is that, is that, I, I think that's how it works, right? I mean, if your house goes away, your, your property is, is appraised at something and that's what that's what the property tax is being based on that I, would, I would love the city attorney to to weigh in um i i believe that there is um an exemption that is filed with the county or at least that's the way it was in central california where um i worked for the past couple of decades so if he could weigh in and, and uh, confirm that so uh, the resident or the owner would just let the county know that there was a, a significant change in the value of their property and then the taxes would be less. Yeah, and the other reason I'm asking that I'm saying is we're rebuilding these houses and they're, they're, bi they're bigger than they were before. They're being sold for a lot more money than they were before. You would think that somewhere down the line, the in increase in the property taxes we we're going to get is going to be a significant number. At least, I, I mean, I think, I, I have no, details on that. I have not tried to figure that out, but just gut says if there may be some revenue coming in from there. I don't know, yes. John, if you have any insight into that issue? I, I don't. I'd like to get you a memo on that topic and okay, discuss cool. valuation and how that, that number's arrived at. Yeah, because I me mean, looks, you know, we, we, we're building these big houses, bigger houses, okay, and 
they're going to be appraised for more than what the houses were before. So in addition to this typical 5% increase we get, if we get enough of these houses constructed, we should get another kicker in the property taxes. Uh, and again, like I mentioned, I, I, I met with uh, the, the chief from the sheriff's department, and we were talking about different options for the sheriff's station. And there's one option that could cost us like four, four and a half million dollars. That's where the, the chief comes in with all his staff and everything like that. And there's another option that may be a little bit cheaper, get us in like two and a half or three million. So what I would like to do is hold off, and I'm not a big fan of taxing the residents any more than there are to be in tax. But I would like to go through the budget meeting we're going to have on Wednesday and get, you know, understand some of the numbers that are in there. So I've got some perspective of what I think the future is going to look like or as best we can, and then come back and talk about whether we want to put a tax in. And I don't disagree with what Bruce and Mikey said. If there's something we can do to TOT tax, I jump on that in a heartbeat. So I, I'm just going to suggest I, I'd like to do our budget meeting first before we start figuring out what we're going to do with additional taxes. Thank you, Steve. I'm going to start by uh, answering your question about valuation. I'm sure that John Cotty is going to have a much more significant answer than the one I'm going to give you. But having been through the process a couple of times, uh, once your house burns down, the assessment goes down to whatever the value for the land was on your previous tax bill. And the arrangement with the tax assessor is that when you rebuild the square footage you had before, you don't lose your place. You get your back at the same tax as you were at before. Any additional square footage you build is assessed at its current actual value, not the, not the, the actual cost of construction, not the historical value that you were replacing. So it is blended and if you, and if you do sell it, we get, uh, we get the the uh, the tax that you were so interested in, which on some of these huge houses is very significant. And but and at that point, the whole house goes up to uh, to whatever the current and you're taxed on the current basis. And I saw Norm raise his hand as soon as we started discussing TOT, and I think he might have something he wishes to tell us about that. So. Norm, I, I would like for you to, to ask whatever your question is. Can you uh, unmute, Norm? I think that I, I did. You're, you're unmuted. So, okay. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, uh, council members, for listening to me. Yeah, less than two years ago, the TOT tax in the city of Malibu was raised 25% from 12 to 15. So I, I'm, I'm not having a great day in finding uh, someone to uh, uh, purchase or JV uh, the hotel with me. And some of the reasons are the 15%. You know, some people say that people renting those places do not those guest rooms do not really consider that, but they really do. So it's something to think about that it's been already raised 25% less than two years ago. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Norm. Uh, the other thing that I would That's like it. to say uh, about the need for the taxes, we are uh, we have a cost of living that's that's gone up 7.5% in the last year. And there are people on the news who are saying it's actually over 8%. It depends on who you are. But the uh, when I watch the economic channels, the expectation is that inflation will continue. If inflation continues, we are going to have to adjust our budget for employees in order to keep them working for us because everybody else is gonna be adjusting their budgets as well. And it is not that we've got plenty of money and we don't have to worry about the future here. We have a situation that is, is changing, it's fluid. And uh, when I first got into the real estate business, the interest rates were at 15%. I hope I never see that again. But the, uh, in the last three months, we've gone from being able to get interest rates for people in the 
low threes to now giving him quotes in the fives. So the, the economy is changing and we, uh, we'd be better be ready for it. And I think that the, uh, the TUT is probably something we should look at very seriously. And, and every time you read about somebody paying a lot of money for a house, say thank you to them because those, uh, we, on one of those, uh, on, on just one of those uh, documentary transfer taxes, it generated $75,000 for the city of Malibu for one. So those things are, are good. And I want, and uh, Karen, you have the floor. Thanks, Paul. <clears throat> okay, I would like to request, I believe the maximum TOT is 18%, is that right? Maximum allowed? And we're at 15 now. I think it's obvious TOT is the easiest thing to pass because residents don't pay it. And that's the case for every city. Um, could we please get a comparison if we were to put another TOT increase for the 18% maximum compared to uh, this TUT? At least we'll have an idea uh, what's possible there. But I've got to point out. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. Can we do that? Because we didn't agendize anything about the TOT. We can bring that Mr. back. Cotty? Yes, Mayor Grisanti, we can bring that back. And I think that's what Council Member, if I'm not mistaken, Council Member Ferrer is asking. Yes, I think it's, I think it's worth uh, considering. Um, also, please keep in mind uh, a large part of what the sheriff's department does here is traffic safety. We've got accidents all day, every day on Pacific Coast Highway. It's not just, and, and some of them I admit involve lawlessness. They involve speeding, they involve driving under the influence, but some of them are just accidents. So let's keep in mind uh, the entire scope of services that we get from our sheriff's department. Um, so I guess that's it from me. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Bruce? Two things. First of all, I, just down and dirty, I think increasing the TOT by another 3% gets us, an, it, from the hotels, from the hotel figure that Ruthie gave before, it gets us another half a million dollars. It's not a huge amount. Um, and I'm not sure what it would do if, it, who knows what we're going to have from the STRs. Uh, what does it cost to become a charter city? How complicated is it to become a charter city? Is that worth it to get the documentary tax? Because that's the big ticket, right? Just, just throwing it out there as a question. I mean, I know we've talked about it from time to time in the past. And or is there an advantage to going there? It's just, just something to think about. Um, surely I'll have to add. Councilmember Silverstein, I believe that requires a vote of the people as well. So. We can bring you back some information on that as well. I think it's worth learning about because if it's if it if it just makes us a better place somehow and gives us all the potential for a lot more money, why not think about it? Thank you, John. Steve, you have the floor. Yeah, um, everybody I've ever spoken to who, who's dealing with municipal government says you can never have enough money, uh, and they've they've been doing it longer than I have. Uh, but I, again, I I would like to go back and I it's, you know and get some of this more information coming back. But I need to go through the uh, budget meeting to get a better idea of where we are. I mean, I was looking at something today. You know, our our reserves, our reserves are sitting at like ninety some percent, Ruthie. Uh, oh, you know, and we're required to have sixty five percent. I mean, so there's like sixteen million bucks sitting there. Okay, that we could we're not going to use it, but I mean, you've got that flexibility there. Uh, to still stay within the 65%. So I just think we got to get a real solid look at where we are, where we think we're going. I don't disagree with Paul. You know, this inflation stuff is screwing everything up. Uh, but I just need more. I just would like to get more information and explore some of these other options we're talking about. And the Charter City may be something that, you know, means that there's a ton of money there from these houses. So uh, it depends how, how much we want the money. Paul, back to you. 
Yeah, I think that if you look at it, you're, you're going to find that charter cities typically have a population of a half a million dollars or more. And that's, uh, you know, that that half a million a half a million people, not dollars, people. And they all have more than a dollar, Bruce. And I thank you for laughing at that because I deserved it. Uh, <laughs> but the, uh, the so I, I think that there is a, a structural problem with thinking we're gonna become a charter city and it's gonna bail us out, but I, I welcome the information we're gonna get. Uh, so that having said that, I, uh, I'm in favor, and I, I'm not making a motion, but maybe I should. I'm in favor of having them come back to us with a report on that you've already requested, but also asking about increasing the TUT by a half a percent. And that will help get us closer to where we need to be. And Steve McClary, I recognize you. Just very briefly, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, if the council so desires, um, we could bring that report back uh, at the second meeting in May, the May 23rd meeting. Okay, Paul, do you need a second for your motion? I'll make, yeah, I'll, I will call it a motion then. I make a motion that we in, look into increasing the TUT to by a half a percent. But you also said answering some other questions. I just wanted to get clarity of yeah. what that was, to be honest. And answered some other questions. The other questions were about the charter, charter becoming a charter city. Do you want to make the motion to do that before we get all the other information back on the other options we have? It's just something to talk about so that when we get any information back, we've got something to bounce it off of. Okay, so this is not a motion to do it. This is a motion for discussion. It's a motion that that if if we send staff away and say we don't know, and we don't know what we like, and uh, try to give us something, I, I know what I would like. I know what I prefer. So I'm going to make a motion that we we do a half a percent of TUT. That's my motion. Bruce, I see your hand. Well, no, that's a different motion than the one that was seconded. The motion you made before was to get information, which I was about to talk about. Karen, are you still seconding a motion to actually do it? No, I, and now I'm not sure what the motion is. Okay, it's to get information about it. Okay, okay. so, so that okay. case. Have you, have you taken the motion about uh, raising TUT a half percent off? I, uh, help me clarify I'm, what's going on here. If you if you only seconded the motion to to have them look into it, investigate and have them look into it, then that's what we'll go with. Okay, so I'll remove the other on. motion. Okay. Uh, okay, so that's what I was going to comment on. It's like I'll, I'll always support getting information. So yeah. I'm going to support that. I I would like to have a friendly amendment to also get information on whether how much the the TOT increase to the limit would produce. Um, and the charter city investigation question. So I'm always favor, always favor getting more information to be able to make informed decisions. I'll accept that. Is that three things then? Yes. Half of the, explore the half a million dollar TUT, explore TOT to the limit, and explore the costs and ability to go to a charter city structure so that we can do the documentary tax. Among it was other, a half of a percent on the TUT. If I misstated that, that's yes, that's what I meant. Well, I did it earlier, so why shouldn't you? Okay, so Paul, is it your motion? I'm not sure whose motion it is anymore. Paul's motion. Okay, I will second. Okay. Any other questions? Will you take the roll, Kelsey? Just to confirm, Mayor, that's directing staff to bring back more information on three issues, information on becoming a charter city, information on another TOT measure, and information on a TUT measure to increase that by half a percent. Correct? Correct. Excellent. Can, can, can I ask one more thing before we take the roll? What are we going to learn about the TUT by half percent, actually, that we didn't already, that we weren't already told tonight? 
I like information, but what 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 are, what kind of information are we looking for? Because I thought that was already presented. Now that I think about it, and we're going to tie help. a big red bow around the amount of dollars and show it to you. Okay. Are okay. you ready for that roll call? I'm ready for the roll call. Mayor Gasanti. Yes. Councilmember Fair. Yes. Councilmember Pearson. Yes. Councilmember Urine. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein. Yes. Motion carries. Okay. That takes us to item 6B. Temporary day use impound yard. And we're going to review a recommendation by the Public Safety Commission. Who will be presenting? That is me, Susan. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, next slide, please. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with this particular issue. Um, the need for a temporary tow yard is based on a number of concerns. Uh, people who are parking illegally uh, are, they create public safety hazards um, on the roadway. They make it difficult for potentially emergency vehicles to get through if they're parked too far out in the road. They impact neighborhoods, particularly in the Point Doom area. Uh, blocking driveways. I've heard stories of cars parked on people's front lawns. Um, so it's become a real issue. And the ability of the Sheriff's Department to tow vehicles is limited by the fact that the two tow companies that they contract with, uh, are their impound yards are outside of the city. So the situation this creates is number one, if a deputy wants to have a vehicle towed, they have to wait for a tow truck to arrive. They can't just have it sighted and then a tow truck comes on its own. They have to be there when the tow truck arrives. So if a tow truck is coming from outside the city, and especially in the summertime, it could take as much as an hour or more, which means that deputy is basically out of service for an hour, which is not a desirable situation. And then the other situation is that when the tow truck is returning into the impound yard, which both of these companies, it's in Thousand Oaks, uh, they'll be out of the city and unable to tow vehicles for a couple of hours sometimes. So it decreases the amount of cars that can be towed. So if you have, you know, 20 cars that need to be towed, you may not be able to accomplish that in one day with going back and forth over the hill. So the thought is if we have a local uh, spot where for a temporary day use impound yard, you could increase public safety, you could protect the neighborhoods, reduce the amount of time deputies need to wait and increase the number of cars that can be towed. Next slide. So the Public Safety Commission has been working on this issue for over a year. There have been many discussions, um, a number of locations uh, talked about, discussed, explored. Um, in all of the discussions, the day use employment yard was meant to be a place where it would only be for the day. No cars would be left overnight. It would only stay there until the owners of the cars came to retrieve them and any cars left at the end of the day would then be taken to Thousand Oaks to the, the uh, regular impound yard. Uh, other uh, criteria that were considered when the commission was looking at various sites and they even created an ad hoc committee to dig into this a bit deeper, but some of the key criteria that they thought about was proximity to Zuma and Point Doom where a lot of the problems happen to be, and then availability of the site to be available from Memorial Day to Labor Day, since that seems to be our busiest time. And then also already, if a property already had the proper zoning was also something that was considered. So sites that have been considered before and not all of them meet this criteria, of course, um, one of them being the Malibu High School upper parking lot, the City Hall parking lot, the Malibu Equestrian Park, the Los Angeles uh, um, County owned circular area at the entrance to Zuma Beach at Bush Drive and PCH, and then the city owned property at PCH and Heather Cliff. Uh, Malibu High School is probably the first one identified since it's been used in the past. Um, and it seemed to meet most all the criteria except for the availability. Um, according to the school district, 
they do not want to have a temporary day use or, op, you know, operating on their school property during regular school uh, year activities. So the it would only their parking lot would only be available from June 11th through August 14th, which uh, pretty much eliminates this year 14 weekends and two of the primary busy weekends being Memorial Day and Labor Day. So the commission felt very strongly that they wanted to have whatever site they were considering to be available for the full uh, Labor Day to Memorial Day. So that's why they moved off from the Malibu High School parking lot and started looking at other locations. Um, they did consider City Hall parking lot, but there was a couple issues with that. One being it is quite a ways away from the problem area. But even more importantly than that, the city does rent out the parking lot almost every weekend as off-site parking for like the Adamson House and other uh, places for weddings or other special events. So the parking lot is not currently available on a regular basis. Another location also near the high school was the, the Malibu Christian Center, which when they discussed it last March, the Trankers Riders and Ropers came out and strongly objected to that idea and the commission backed down from that idea. Uh, then we seriously, you know, considered that the area, the circular area by Zuma, but ultimately it was found to be too close to a stream and there was no safe pedestrian access because that is also another consideration is how easily can people get to it. Um, and then the city owned property in PCH and Heathercliff had been talked about, but not super seriously because they didn't really like that. Um, but this year, when, in March, when the commission began talking about this again, uh, the city-owned property of PCH and Heathercliff was kind of put in front to kind of dig in and, and think about that site since most of the other sites had been pretty much been taken off the table. And at that meeting, they did decide to recommend using that site. So as, and the one problem with this too is that that site is not currently zoned for an impound yard. Therefore, if the council is interested in pursuing this option, uh, it can be done, but there are certain steps that would need to be taken. Next slide. And at this point, I'm gonna be handing off to uh, Planning Director Richard Mollifat to explain the next steps. Next slide. Oh wait, no, that's the right side. Never mind. That's the slide we're looking for. That's, that's the right side. And just, I just wanna mention that if, if at some point you wanna look at the proposed map of this site, we do have it available. I wasn't able to insert it in the PowerPoint, but we can pull it up if you wanna bring that up. Go ahead, Richard. Thank you, Susan. Currently in our zoning ordinance, the closest thing to a automobile storage is a tow yard. And that's allowed only in the commercial general and institutional zoning districts. This type of use is different than a automobile tow yard. A tow yard implies the storage of vehicles for periods of times. Uh, they would be bringing wrecked cars to it. My understanding from the Public Safety Commission and the tow operator and speaking with the Sheriff's Department is that these vehicles are only parked here for a couple hours. They're not wrecked vehicles. Uh, there's another major difference here that this is a sheriff uh, sanctioned or a sheriff approved operation. And if it's the council's will, uh, a way to achieve doing this would be one, to create a, a, a use that we could put in our use table for day use impound yards that are sheriff sponsored, making it specific so that it, it's not open to just any towing business, it would be one that serves this purpose, which is removing vehicles uh, that are illegally parked and pose a public safety hazard. And to achieve that, with the, what the council could do is provide direction on staff to prepare, as they mentioned in the staff, the agenda report you have, we could prepare an amendment to the our local zoning ordinances, as well as our coastal program, so that the use be consistent in both. And to address the immediate need of this, while we're processing these amendments to the zoning code, uh, because this goes to the Coastal Commission as well, there's going to be at least another year there. 
there could be an amendment to the temporary use permit ordinance that is specific to these kinds of uses. And also, if it is the council's will and our city attorney could speak a bit more to this, if they believe that there is, uh, if the council finds there is an urgency here, there is a uh, something uh, that poses a threat to public safety, another option for the commission or for the council so that something is in place for this summer what would be an urgency ordinance. I'd be glad to discuss any more of those should you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Do we have any members of the public wishing to comment on this? Has anyone signed up to speak? Yes, looking at the correct speaker list this time, you have 10 speakers for this item. The first few are Joe Drummond, Bill Sampson, Pat Healy, and Josh Siegel. We'll hear from Joe Drummond first. Hey, well, Joe, are you one, available? Can I, ask, can I ask one quick question before the public speakers? A technical question for technical Richard question. or Susan, yes. For Susan, Susan, on, on how many cars per day do you typically tow? I mean, if they, how many cars are going to be stored on this? lot any given day um what i've heard is that you know it varies day to day on a busy weekend you could have 20 or more cars uh <laughs> chris frost who's in the meeting he knows the answer to this better than i do unfortunately um, and if you want to let him speak, because he's very much in, in tune with the how many cars are towed right now. Chris, are you available to join us for a moment? I am, Paul. Thank you. Um, in my um, my experience, the last summer with Sierra and Tope above Trancas, we had days where we had five cars. We had days where we had 35 or 40 cars. And a lot of it depends on the, uh, the number of uh, community service officers uh, and VOPs that are out there that are writing the parking sites and waiting for the 180s to be written by the sheriff's deputies. That's the ticket is the 180. It's a California Highway Patrol code. That's the one you gotta wait for and have signed and signed off by the tow operator. So if the CSOs are out there in full force on a holiday weekend, in El Matador alone, they would tow 25. So, I'd say the max I ever saw in there at any one time was probably 25 to 30. And of course they're coming and going as people pick their cars up. So I use the number 25 to 40, something like that. Thank you, Chris. You're welcome. Can we go back to the public now? Joe, will you, will you rejoin us please? Hi. So we can I can hear you. Okay, great. So I think this decision made by the Public Safety Commission was hasty and not allowed the public comment that would normally have occurred if there was proper public notice filed. I personally posted about this on Nextdoor the same day I heard about this on the same day the Public Safety Commission was meeting and it received an overwhelming, overwhelming amount of opposition. A commission is a handful of volunteers not selected by the residents of Malibu. Their job is to represent us, not to dictate to us. It seems that two real estate professionals on the commission prefer a precedent to make a space designated for parkland, a garden, or a community center to be commercialized. Why has this not been dealt with in the last three years by our council members who were there back then when this need started by the pushing out of Malibu Tow by our former city manager? This is her mess and it needs to be cleaned up, not at the residents' expense. There are many reasons the Heathercliff lot, Heather lot is inappropriate. It is adjacent or on Esha, and it would be difficult to clean out the pan slated to be under the towed cars with this, without some spillage damaging the area. The traffic and safety issues were not even explored with this site. It will increase in backup traffic in an already busy summer schools and residential intersection. Any commercial transportation should not be added here. It will be an eyesore as well for those traveling by on the scenic highway. Some fast and more temporary options for a tow yard, not at Heathercliff and PCH, is the City Hall parking lot. As several have noted, the former tow yard was off Malibu Road for decades. If 10 tows per day is typical for a busy, busy beach day, with 25 being the record apparently, but not, I guess it's higher, this is not too far. City Hall is empty on weekends. It works for Eastern Malibu too, and all the lawbreakers during the car shows there. Large trash and recycling trucks go up to City Hall all the time, so a flatbed should be fine to handle. 
The combine, this combined with Malibu High or any other school property which is available for most of the summer and could be brokered through Craig Foster for the full summer easily should solve the Western Malibu, Malibu tow issues. Apparently better signage will reduce the majority of the towing infractions. State what the minimum fine is clearly on a sign where there has been known illegal parking. Not all cars found to violate an obscure parking regulation need to be towed. Only those that obstruct access to a fire hydrant or otherwise pose some tangible hazard. In LA, you have to go a long way to get your car back. This lot is for the convenience of the tow company, cost versus fees, yet it is proposed to be paid for by the city. The only problem they are solving is that a tow yard in Malibu is closer and more convenient. However, as residents, we don't care where the cars end up being towed. The violator pays the tow fees and the towing company just has to drive a little farther. The cars will continue to be towed either way. The tow yard at Heathercliff is also inconsistent with the LCP land use designation and can be sued. The city should not put itself into a serious liability issue. We should use City Hall and Malibu High School for as long as possibly available if there is a need for an emergency temporary lie. Again, re-residents decide what is best for our town, and we were not given the opportunity to on this project. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. Who do we have next? Our next speaker would, would be Bill, uh, Bill Sampson, but he's no longer in the meeting, so we'll hear from Pat Healy, followed by Josh Siegel, Wade Major, and Ryan. Pat, hey, are you available? I am. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Um, everyone seems to have gotten that PCH is a scenic highway, and like Trancosfield, the Heathercliff parcels open space contributes to the city's beauty and rural atmosphere. So why is the council thinking of destroying this marvelous public view enjoyed by visitors and residents alike by putting in industrial use on this property? Um, I, as, as the report was given, I thought, well, possibly the chili cook-off field, which I believe the farmer's market has some par parking on, uh, could be used. And for Labor Day weekend, when the chili cook-off is, the city could use city hall temporarily. So those are my, my two suggestions. And I'd hate to see this beautiful view shed destroyed. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, Pat. Our next speaker is Josh Siegel, followed by Wade Major, Ryan, and Georgia Goldfarb. Hey, Josh, are you available? I am. Thanks for uh, having me on this evening. I'll try and be brief so Karen can get to bed. Um, I spoke last month about, um, you know, the possibility that this was going to be coming up, and I was hoping that um, if this doesn't go through, then you guys would come up with better solutions, actual solutions instead of suggestions. But um, I just want to talk about what the tow yard would do real quickly. And that, you know, it's going to act as a force multiplier. If we have the summer tow operation in West Malibu, we're going to have more trucks. We're going to have more deputies. We're going to be able to respond faster to accidents. We're going to be able to respond faster to incidents. Um, it's just the fact of the matter is we can't have these trucks going an hour and a half or two hours round trip from Zuma to City Hall. It's just, it's inefficient. It just doesn't work for the tow operation. Um, everybody knows Zuma and Point Doom up to El Matador is the center of the tow universe. Um, we discussed, I guess Susan already covered most of the other sites um, that were discussed, but there were, there were many, many more, um, probably a half a dozen maybe a dozen more that, that Chris and I explored. I won't get into those. Um, we like Heathercliff. I mean, obviously it should be a park. Nobody's taken steps to go that route. I urge you to do that, um, but it's not being used. And that's the fact of the matter. And there's, there's no reasonable ecological concerns. We're a hundred yards from the nearest Esha. Um, if, you, if you look at it on Google Earth, um, there's great access. There's little prep. We're talking about using less than 5% of the property, which will be screened and fenced and guarded. Um, and heck, we might even clean it up a little bit. Um, you know, we've used this lot before. We've used it for Christmas tree lots. We've used it for uh, public works staging after the Woolsey fire. And um, heck, we even have some uh, raw sewage transfers going on there with some of the uh, pumping trucks. Um, again, I won't take up a whole lot of time, but, you know, if one of the things is that, hey, this should be a park, 
look, we should, it should be a park. And I urge you to agendize something that would um, take the first steps. And my belief, again, the first step is hiring a city manager. So you have Steve McCleary sitting there. I think he's done a great job. Let's just get it done, hire more staff, and you know, start running on this. Anyway, that's my time. Um, and Chris Frost will cover all the other things that I didn't cover. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thank you, Josh. Our next speaker is Wade Nature, followed by Ryan, Georgia Goldfarb, and Chris Frost. Hey, Wade, are you available? I am. Uh, so I, I just want to, you know, I'm not going to weigh in on the on the appropriateness or not of the location. Uh, public safety has worked really hard on this for a year. I, I defer to their expertise. I know there is no perfect solution here and nobody is happy with this, but we're on a short timetable right now. Memorial Day is around the corner. And I, I just want to emphasize this is going to be the most intense beach year that we have had in years. Um, it, you know, we it, 2018 was the last real beach year. 2019 was the aftermath of Woolsey, uh, 20 and 21 were pandemic uh, inhibited and people have been cooped up now for over two years and they're gonna just flood our beaches. And I think I don't think we are fully prepared for just how much traffic and how much parking we're gonna be dealing with this year. On top of that, the sheriff has had their budget cut. You know, the, their, the sheriff is at war with the, uh, the county supervisors he doesn't have enough resources. We would normally need for a city of our size that we would need 15 to 20 officers uh, off season. During the summer years, we need more than that. And we're not gonna get anything close to that, I'm afraid. So um, if they have to sit around and, and wait for tow trucks, that those are precious officers that we don't have during the summer months doing their job elsewhere in the city. So it, it, it creates even more of a public safety hazard. So just for this urgent temporary moment, something has got to be done. The one thing you can't do is, is have stuff towed out of town. We need an in-town solution. We need a permanent solution. And I don't think it should be Heathercliff. I agree with that. Um, you know, that needs to really be, be fleshed out over the, you know, for the, for the foreseeable future. It's a, it's a pity that we lost Malibu Tow Yard, but that's just part of the you know, the unfortunate, regrettable loss of local business that we've been dealing with for, for years now. And, and that's a separate problem. But uh, I, we really, really need to do something quickly and urgently for this summer, or it's going to be a problem like we have never, never seen before, at least not in many, many years. Um, so that's it. I, I, I just I would urge you to, to you know, work with if, if this is not the perfect solution, then we need one really, really quick. But either way, we've got to do something before the summer months are on top of us, and, and we regret not having a, a, any solution at all. Thank you, Wade. Our next speaker is Ryan, followed by Georgia Goldfarb, Chris Frost, and Howard Redsky. Mr. Embry, are you available? Yes, I remember when um, uh, Reva gave uh, a, a short list of locations that um, the Public Safety Commission could evaluate. And I don't think that that list was the complete list of properties owned and available or paved uh, for this. It was already politicized from the get-go. So we kind of backed ourselves into a corner here. And I'd like you to task the um, city's planning director to explain the zoning where this use was amended and allowed to occur in as a tow yard, which would be for a tow truck operation when you amended, or the council amended the code at the time, trying to retain a local tow operator, not, not a, a seasonal beach summer tow thing like you're talking here. But I believe it was the institutional zoning was the zone to which this can apply. And you need data, and you didn't get it tonight from Susan, I'm sorry. The data is how many cars, and is, are they all there all at the same time, or do some people come and get their cars out, and you have 20 per day, and they're really only eight there maximum at one time? And now here's the other part, is what's the average? And for a successful year in our city, what was it like in 2017 or 15? when we did not have these uh, odd constraints or construction, uh, you know, or change in tow truck operators and so forth. So um, you don't have that information. And 
and the city's really been trying to recruit um, or task commissioners to go out and do some of this groundwork that I think was inappropriate for um, commissioners to be negotiating with other public agencies to with private property owners, um, you know, sticking their necks out and getting clobbered by the community that the evaluation is supposed to be based on the code and permissible and zoning and so forth. And I guess every school was zoned institutional. And there must be four schools, I think, in Malibu for this. And then there's other other stuff zoned that way. You need a, a zoning map in front of you. I'd like to see it on screen of all the um, legally allowable areas. And then I guess this year you're going to have to pick a place that's going to be one of these urgency uh, approvals, uh, whether it's the city hall or the high school or the Heathercliff lot under a strict proviso that it's never to ever happen again there, like as in ever, never. And it's not on the corner, by the way. I'd like somebody to clarify. It's not at Heather Cliff and PCH, but thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Our next speaker is Georgia Goldfar, followed by Chris Frost, Howard Redsky, and Doug Stewart. Hi, Georgia, are you available? Georgia? Georgia, you should see a pop-up asking it. There you go. I did. Hang, hang on. Okay. Uh, yes, okay. <laughs> well, good evening again. A tow yard at Heathercliff will damage the soil and will affect its use as a part for both wildlife and humans. It will require significant funds to remove the contaminated soil. And I would suggest that if you think that drip pans will solve the problems. You should discuss this with an environmental scientist. I don't believe that it will. I think there will be significant contamination. To me, this proposal seems to be a solution in search of a problem. I don't see the urgency here. Um, you know, it, uh, in any case, a tow yard has been used in the Thousand Oaks area for some time. And before that, near City Hall on Malibu Road. I suggest continuing to use the Thousand Oaks facility. And if there is documented need at the use of the high school, which you can have for most of the summer, apparently, and the City Hall parking lot on weekends. If you compare the additional cost of a sheriff attending to the tow, which I believe has been mentioned, with the cost of environmental cleanup, and the aesthetic dysphoria of vehicles on a lovely parkland near Anesha, the balance seems clear to me. Further, this does not meet the requirements, as I understand it, for a temporary use permit, and thus would need to be rezoned for a conditional use permit. How long will this take, and how much effort and staff time will be required? This, too, is a cost. Therefore, this problem has not been clearly defined to Malibu residents, and proof that another site would not be viable has not been provided. I urge you to reject the use of Heather Cliff as a tow yard. Thank you. Thank you, Georgia. Our next speaker is Chris Frost, followed by Howard Redsky and Doug Stewart. Chris, are you available? I am. Good evening again. And you know, first off, I want to shout out Wade and say, Wade, you're spot on on that. We would all love to see a park up there at some point or a performing arts center. Josh did on most of the high points, but there's been a, a lot of information out there, misinformation out there regarding the subject. Um, there were many more sites looked at than Susan pulled up. And City Hall also had the problem, it was too small to run flatbeds, four flatbeds in and out of there. So just a couple of problems. Facts are that the Public Safety Commission spent two years working on this. They formed a task force. They looked at every property that has been discussed online in social media and in the commission meetings. They came close on the high school, but due to the various conditions, their various conditions, including limited usage and restrictions on many of the days that we would need it, it was scratched. We, have, we were gonna be able to use it like seven weekends, eight weekends. Other sites were not acceptable due to safety issues, including but not limited to the circle land at the tunnel under PCH to Zuma had safety issues. You cannot drop towed vehicles randomly on city streets. There are legal and liability issues. 
as well as contract clauses that require an operator at the drop site at all times. You cannot boot vehicles as the LA County Sheriff's Department does not boot vehicles. You cannot have multiple sites all over Malibu as each site has to have an operator there to watch over vehicles and handle release forms, et cetera. This would not be a functional program due to the complications it would ensure. It seems that some of those speaking out against this location have not taken the time to ask about where it would be laid out on the parcel and how visible it would be. It's tucked into the northwest corner and backs up against two parking lots already in use. It would be fenced and have covering to shield it from view. It has good access to PCH with stoplights on each side, which clearly allows brakes and traffic, making it safer access in and out of the drop site. The center of the road at this point also restricts any left-hand turns. There will have to be accommodations for two tow truck companies this summer. The primary vehicle uses a flatbed with a wheel lift. These are capable of carrying two cars at once, thus making the tow calls much more efficient. Those who speak out against don't appear to have much compassion for those neighbors who are affected by illegal parking. We have residents stopping the VOPs on their routes to thank them for their work and to voice their support for this drop site. It is central to the majority of the tows. This is a parcel of land that is at best four to five years away from any civic development, but in the meantime can be used to solve a safety problem that is a clear and present danger right now. And this is the same property that was used as a staging ground after Woolsey with much construction equipment to, to help reconstruct damage in our city. Portions of it are already hand hard packed. The drop site would use approximately 3.3% of the total size. The Public Safety Commission made a solid and well thought out recommendation to the council. Please vote accordingly. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Our next speaker is Howard Rudsky, followed by Doug Stewart. Hi, Howard. Are you still awake? You haven't put me to sleep yet. Amazing, huh? So um, I just want to let everybody know while we were watching this, I took a YouTube video class and I'm a brain surgeon. So anybody who wants free surgery, um, I'm available and I do it out of the back of a mobile van. So now that levity is over, we're going to have to make a decision. This is two years. People that know something have put in a lot of work. This has been going on for a lot longer. And unfortunately, you five get paid the big bucks and nobody's going to be happy with this situation. So I think we got to get on with it. And like one speaker said, this is going to be a horrible summer. People have been cooped up for so long and we need to do something. Thank you and good night. Thank you, Howard. And our next speaker is Doug Stewart. Hi, Doug. Are you available? Here I am. Very good. All right. Well, I guess I'm doing cleanup on this, and um, I, I just want to speak to some of the comments that have been made. I think Chris Frost uh, uh, and Josh and uh, Wade all made good comments. And, and look, here's what we're faced with. And let's, let's try and clean up what social media had said, too. There are not going to be red cars there. They're, these cars are the same cars that park in uh, the parking lots all over town. You don't see oil dripping out of them everywhere. And the ones that do have a problem, they immediately put a pan underneath it, which is the environmentally sanctioned way to do it. The lot's going to be emptied every night. It's not going to be used every day. It's only when we actually have like weekends and holidays. And the beach team is being staffed this summer to have extra people to write the tickets to bring these cars out of the uh, danger zones that they're in. And as we've said before, they're parked in front of fire hydrants. They're on people's sidewalks. They're blocking driveways. They're blocking cars that can't get out. And we've got residents all over the city that are at risk, either for not being able to get emergency equipment to and from their houses, as well as they can't get out of their house because of this. It's a safety issue. It's not about revenue. It's about safety, safety, safety. And I think it's time for me to reiterate something that many of you have heard me say before. One of the common practices for some people is a problem postponed is a problem solved. Look, we're out of time on this. This goes back to Jeff Wagner, and I had a discussion about this back in 2018 and 2019 when Malibu Tow lost its two locations, one at the Santa Monica uh, College site now in the school district. The school district doesn't want us in there for a whole bunch of reasons, and they have been very difficult to work with, as Chris mentioned. And in 2019, 
I actually had the list that Ryan is talking about, which you guys have attached to your uh, presentation tonight. I personally went to every one of those sites. Churches don't make good uh, impound lots. Schools don't necessarily make them either. And Chris Frost is absolutely right. We've actually tried to test parking those uh, flatbeds in City Hall. It doesn't work. This is the worst of the, this is the best of the worst solutions that we've got. So I want to mention too, to um, uh, Joe Drummond, this isn't without notice. We've had this on the City uh, Public Safety Commission agenda, I'm going to say eight times over the last three years. This has been going on for three years. We've had meetings in 2021 and 2022 about this and even 2020. We even did a test uh, prototype of doing this in 2020 over the Labor Day weekend to see how it would work with the Sheriff's Department. This is a plan that's been well thought out, well presented. And yes, we don't want to use this as a, a tow yard forever. This is a park and it needs to be a park long term. But help us out, get us through this summer and help us find a permanent solution inside the city that works. I urge you, get the option for the urgency ordinance passed tonight, get it started and get us in business on this and help make our city safer this summer. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Doug. And Mayor Bill Sampson hasn't rejoined the meeting and I don't see any other raised hands. So that concludes public comments. Thank you so much. So we're gonna to return to the dais and I see Karen's hand is raised. Excuse me. Thank you, Paul. Okay. Um, sorry, I can barely talk, but I will try. I want to thank all the public speakers. Um, I have to note a lot of the emails that I got, it seemed clear to me that people had not read this agenda item. I got a lot of uh, misstatements and misassumptions, and it, that, it's so easy to have an opinion. It doesn't take very long to read agenda items, and I would really ask that people do that um, before they start commenting. Um, I have some questions. So can Susan or Richard or Yolanda talk about the collection pans? I don't have any additional information. I just know there's, it's a standard practice. They have pans that are made exactly for that purpose, but I don't have any other information than that. Okay, but the city has used them or uses them now, right? Yeah, it's standard practice. Um, and usually they're usually needed when you tow a vehicle after an accident. That's where typically you may have oil leaking. Uh, from what I've heard, talking to the tow operator, very, very, rarely is a pan needed, but they do have them available. Like I think they're required to have them available. Okay. Um, and uh, again, I guess, Susan, since the, the cars towed uh, are there for the day uh, or until they're picked up, cars that are not picked up by whatever we'll call the end of the day, get taken to Thousand Oaks. What right. is considered the end of the day? I want to say five o'clock. It may vary, um, but my understanding is probably late afternoon, early evening, five o'clock. Okay. Morning. So after that time, all those cars get towed away. Yeah. Okay. Um, I do have to mention, um, Joanne Drummond mentioned, something parking at the high school could be brokered through Craig Foster. I spoke to him this afternoon. He said the exact opposite to me. So um, let's see. I know all of these sites have been looked at. Um, I will also say about Malibu High, about 25 years ago, uh, our school district changed its schedule. In the late 90s, we started going back to school before Labor Day weekend. Uh, up until that time, our local schools always went back after Labor Day. Um, now they go back mid-August. And graduation, I think, as Susan said, is I think this year it's June 11th. So we're missing several weeks at the beginning and end 
of the summer season. And unfortunately, that rules that location out. Uh, I agree entirely. This is a safety issue. We don't need fire hydrants blocked. We don't need driveways blocked. We don't need people not being able to get in and out of their homes. And we don't need streets blocked so that emergency equipment cannot get through. That makes everybody unsafe. Uh, I agree with Wade, we're gonna have a busy summer. People have been cooped up. Um, and Josh, thank you, force multiplier. I agree entirely. We don't need uh, a very highly qualified and paid sheriff's deputy waiting uh, for a tow truck to show up after a car's been sighted. Um, thank you, Chris Frost. I think you've probably spent more time on this than anybody is my guess. Um, yeah, if any meeting has not been adequately noticed, I'd like to know about that myself. I believe that's a legal issue. So I think the, the concern was it was legally noticed. I think what people objected to was the uh, media messaging through the, the media team went out later than we would have liked to. That was just kind of a workload issue, but uh, it was noticed in the, the proper, you know, legally, you know, that's the notification that was, you know, okay. was the legal time frame. Okay, thank you. Um, and yes, eventually everybody would like to see the process happen where uh, we do the uh, community outreach that's been promised to our residents and voters for a long time about all of the commercially zoned land that the city now owns. Um, yeah, we'd love to have that happen. As soon as the city uh, closed escrow on the three lots, uh, the triangle, the chili cook-off lot, and this lot at Heathercliff, the fire happened less than two months later. Then we went into a pandemic and here we are. Jesse and I have discussed this at length. Uh, Steve McClary and I have discussed it. We would of course all like to get going on uh, getting the community input that we all wanna see on uh, what to do with those properties. But in the meantime, summer is upon us and we need to do something. So uh, I would say for me, my first choice would be to move ahead with um, the PCH Heathercliff lot. And it seems to me the only other option um, would be uh, the equestrian lot. That, that looks like our two choices. Okay, so um, that's it for the moment for me. Thank, Thank you, you, Karen. Mikey. Thank you, Paul. Um, I've spent a ton of time on this two, three years ago. This issue is created when we lost our tow yard. We didn't have this issue before and it, it or it didn't come across the same way. And certainly with recent events, Western Mal has just become ground zero for parking nightmares. This is number one, a public safety issue. And to not, to have not been able to take action on this is just, we're not, we're not taking care of our residents to their quality of life. If, if you're involved in this issue, you know how bad it is. If you know the sheriffs and know the VOPs, and you're in this area, it's it's just unbelievable. Um, I mean, I think everyone's basically said it, but this issue has been discussed a huge amount for a long time, but it sounds like some people just weren't clued into that. Um, and that's understandable. That's understandable. Like was said, this lot's been used already. This is not groundbreaking information. It was used unscreened with large equipment for months after Woolsey. I, you know, it, yes, it needs to be a park and it needs to be one soon of some sort. 
It isn't now. Um, we got cars parked in the bike lane. That wasn't mentioned. And, and I just want to reiterate, I tried to get involved in negotiating a couple of years ago. I'm bad at time. It all blends together. With the school district, it was a nightmare. It was it just, they. somebody said it. They didn't want to negotiate. They didn't care. It's not on their agenda to work with Malibu on a parking issue. Clearly. And that was super frustrating. And then, and then when it came down to, I think we were actually close to some deal at one point. It was, the days were useless. It was, it was, it was a joke. Like it's been said, there just wasn't the days needed on this. Um, I, I think, you know, we've got to, we've got to deal with this issue. We can't abandon this issue. And I think we should bring forward an urgency ordinance on this and get it done. But we do need to solve it long term. It's been a vexing problem. I don't have all the answers. Um, it's certainly Heathercliff is not a long term solution at all, zero. Um, but we cannot abandon the community this summer, we cannot ab abandon helping our VOPs and our sheriffs do their job. We cannot abandon public safety. So I would be make a motion to bring this back under an urgency ordinance. And, I'll second that. And I know there's more comments coming, but we have a motion and a second. So thank you. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Bruce, you're the first comment. Okay. So um, I'm going to. I want to thank the public speakers, and we also have a great number of written comments, which for the most part, we're opposed to this. Um, I'm gonna talk about the comments from the speakers after I make some other preliminary comments. Uh, I ran on a platform of the need for a lawyer on city council, because I was watching what I thought was a city out of control, doing whatever the city manager and city council liked and not focusing on the law, legal constraints. And I think this proposal is a prime example of that, and I'm gonna explain that later. Um, by the way, I know there's a lot of people who view the law as a hindrance and a nuisance. Those people didn't vote for me. Um, as I see it, it's, uh, it's progress to follow the law, obtain reliable information and make informed and lawful decisions here. Um, Daphne Anit, my, appoint, my appointee to the Public Safety Commission, opposed this proposal. She was the only one that opposed it. Daphne's also a lawyer. She has a concentration in municipal law. She had numerous legal issues with this proposal. And she also appreciated the significant community opposition that would be here for non-legal reasons on top of that. Um, as I've read, the, as this proposal, proposal has evolved, at one point it was described, I think that's how it started, at least it was described to me, as the least worst alternative. That's never a great basis for a recommendation. Uh, I'm not satisfied it's the least worst alternative. I'm not even satisfied there are no good alternatives. Uh, the best alternative is more tow trucks. Um, perhaps we can even fund that somehow. Um, the second best alternative, which I know has been told, I've been told is a non-starter, but just it, it clearly would be a better alternative, would be the north end of the Zuma parking lot. It's always partially empty, and it would provide a sweet irony because the people who deliberately abjure paying to park there would end up being forced to be parked there and pay multiple times of what they save by refusing to park there. But in any event, I, I am not satisfied that all alternatives have been run to ground. I hear a lot of anecdotal information to that effect, but I don't see the details. But even if there were no other alternatives, I'm not persuaded the problem is sufficiently severe to warrant adoption of the least worst alternative, especially if this is that alternative. Uh, Pat Healy commented, and she's not the only one, about this being a scenic highway, uh, about the environment. Um, the property is a mess as it is. Um, as a number of people have said, construction vehicles were parked there for some time. It's far from what it was when we purchased it. And the fact that prior misuse is being used today as a reason to support this is all the more reason to stop destroying the property and take better care of it if we're gonna keep it. Aside from a terrible Woolsey Fire litigation settlement, which left millions of dollars on the table, 
One of the reasons that the city's having financial troubles is because we purchased three properties for $25 million we didn't have. Um, I know that was something that a lot of people were happy about, uh, but maybe there needs to be consideration if we're in such financial difficulties and we can't find solutions to a lot of these problems, maybe we need to consider selling one of these parcels. That's for another day to be talked about. Um, I, perhaps we can tackle the problem incrementally with signs, which I've been told is a possible solution or at least incremental solution. And tow as much as we can handle and make very public the fact that we're telling what we can handle and we're telling them to the, to the valley where someone's gonna be extremely inconvenienced and pay a lot of money to go retrieve their vehicle. We're not gonna give them a place to go pick it up when they feel they're ready during the day. Um, separate and apart from that, I do have multiple legal issues with this proposal. I think it's a misuse of the urgency ordinance. Whatever the problem is, however urgent it is today, it's an urgency of our own creation. If it has been an urgent problem, it's been an urgent problem for three years running. You don't adopt an urgency ordinance because you wake up and decide to take care of something that has existed for a prolonged period of time. So I don't think it's a proper use of the urgency ordinance. It's a misuse of the TUP ordinance. It's not properly zoned and I'm not inclined to adopt different zoning. And I don't believe it's proper to use the TUP to get around the zoning. It's a potential environmental hazard. There are potential safety issues from this in and of itself. And I don't believe there are any studies that refute that or show that it will, it will be safe. Um, I talked earlier about whether we should be considering suing the county for not conducting CEQA or other environmental studies for things it's doing that we're disturbed by. I think that that may apply here as well. And you know, I, I find it interesting, we, we, we've received predominantly objections from the residents. And, you know, so the residents predominantly objected to what the county was proposing to do. We all spoke, a lot of us spoke. And what did they do? They just disregarded all of the objections and they went ahead and did what we considered was a dangerous and foolish thing to do, which is not in our best interest. Well, you know, I hear comments like, well, the emails, they just don't, people just don't understand what's really happening. They didn't read the agenda report, so I can dismiss that. The fact is the residents for the residents who've spoken don't want this. Three of the people who spoke tonight who were most cogent about why it's necessary, well, they're three of the four public safety commissioners that are proposing this. Other than that, I think we might've heard from one or two people in support of this. Um, Andrew Ferguson, who submitted written comments and, and didn't speak tonight, he says the area is not zoned, um, nor should it ever be. Um, the area is intended to be a park that would serve residents and be a place of beauty. I, and I'm, I'm reading this because I think we don't give enough consideration publicly to the written comments we get. Uh, amending the TUP ordinance to allow the lot to be used as a tow yard is similar to how they changed the LCP to allow the parking project on Westward Beach, which he was one of the advocates against. And after there was sufficient residents to um, complaints about that, that was changed. He says, I'm not in favor of workarounds like those unless they have a strong community support. I agree with that. Um, it's claimed that it's only place available in Malibu, but also claiming it's temporary. If it's the only place available, how can it be temporary? What's gonna come next? If you go back to public safety commission meetings from early 2021, 16 months ago, they were looking for a tow yard location then, next year they will still be looking for one. Malibu has a long history of claiming something's temporary and the temporary is still there. I'm not gonna read all of them, but the, I, I think people can get the gist of it. Um, I heard someone say that the people that are opposed to this don't have much empathy for the neighbors. Actually, what I'm hearing from, what I'm seeing in the written comments and what I'm hearing from a lot of other people as well, that the neighbors, the people that live in Point Doom, which is where the major problem is, Point Doom residents don't want this. At least the vocal ones don't. I haven't heard Point Doom residents clamoring for this. Maybe they're there, but they haven't said so. Um, the issue of time that a deputy must wait, which is actually, I think that's been given as the primary reason why we need a yard here temporarily so that the cars can be temporarily shifted quickly. And then at the end of the day, somehow miraculously, what, an army of tow trucks are gonna show up and ship the 20 or 30 cars to the valley over the course of an hour or two. I don't see how that happens. 
But in any event, the deputies have to wait. Why must they wait? Uh, what happens while they're waiting? If the owner shows up to take their car, are they stopped from taking their car? I, I doubt it. So why can't the problem be called in? If necessary, volunteer residents can watch the vehicle to call whether the, it's left or not. And then when the tow truck shows up, the deputy can come back and oversee whatever needs to be done. I don't understand why the deputy is standing there or sitting in his car or her car for an hour waiting. Um, it's been said that it would be a two and a half hour round trip to take this to the center of town. I, I guess there's some time that it takes to put a car on the bed, the, the flatbed, but you know, I, I know traffic is a problem that I've routinely on the weekend when I've had, I, I've driven down and back from the center of the city where I've lived. It's a 45 minute to one hour round trip. It's not a two and a half hour round trip. That's so that's that's just anecdotal scare language. Um, so is this is urgent because we will see a problem like we have never seen before. Actually, from everything I've heard, and that's as anecdotal as anything anyone else has heard, the biggest problems were for the last two years when people were cooped up at home because of COVID and had nowhere to go but the beach or the parks. And we saw dramatic increase in people doing this illegal parking and visiting Malibu. I don't understand why it's supposed to get worse this summer than it's been in the past. Again, this is just, you know, I think it's scare tactics. Howard says, and I agree with him, nobody's gonna be happy with the decision. So, I mean, it, it's, we're gonna be making a decision that's gonna make someone unhappy, whether we make this into a tow yard or don't make it into a tow yard. Um, those were my comments. I mean, I, I have a hard time voting for something which I think is illegal for multiple reasons, especially the urgency aspect of it. And where, where if, if there were substantial public demand for this, maybe I'd feel differently. Well, I still couldn't get over the legal problems, but I, I feel differently about taking this property that is not supposed to be for this purpose, which has already been degraded by prior misuse of it, and allowing this, unless I had evidence that there's substantial public desire for this, but all I've seen, and I know it could just be a vocal minority, but all I've seen is public outcry and decrying this. So I, I can't find my way to supporting this. And I was hoping I'd hear something tonight different than I had thought before coming in, but I haven't. So those are my comments. Thank you, Bruce. Steve? You're, you're muted. Go ahead, Paul, why don't you go? Yeah, uh, I just wanna throw a historical note out there. We, we, have a, we have a problem that was created about 18, 28 years ago. 28 years ago, the lot on Malibu Road was rezoned from commercial to residential multifamily. Uh, the tow yard that was there persisted as an existing non-compliant use. And uh, as time went on, it became less and less desirable to the neighbors and the owner of the property. And the property went up for sale. And the new buyer of that property let the tow yard sit a for about another five years. And then they their plans were done, their permits were, were pulled, they were ready to go ahead and grade it into the uh, into the lot, the building lots that they that they produced. So at that point, you know, people started looking around for a temporary tow location. And for several years, we get along well with the Malibu High School. We use those lots up there, and uh, we were able to to function. And they functioned basically on the same. Uh, procedure that we're talking about now. They didn't, there was no long-term storage of vehicles there. Tow them during the day, people would come back, discover their car was, was gone. They would find out where their car is. They'd walk up to the high school, get it back. Everybody lived and we went on and on. Well, the remodel of the high school destroyed that as an option. And it's much, it's gonna be much better for the kids and it's already much better for the kids than it was. 
And I think that was a good thing. But in the meantime, it created this problem. And I've been talking about the need for a temporary tow yard since before I ran for city council uh, two years ago. And I think that this is the best of the options that are available to us. I think that uh, I, I'm surprised that John Mazza wasn't here because he's told me a hundred times that there's no Eshon Point Doom. So it would, this would have been my opportunity to learn if he's correct or not. But uh, I don't think that's mapped as Esha based on my conversations with John. Uh, I'm very much in favor of going ahead with this. I'm very much in favor of us going ahead with the uh, urgency ordinance. And I think we've got to give this a chance to, to succeed. And at the same time, we've really got to spend them uh, yet another reason for the tax, get the money so that we can we can go ahead and have the public outreach and decide what to do with the pieces of vacant land because I can't believe that we have vacant land and we're not doing anything with it. And Steve, you're up. Thanks, Paul. This is a tough one. Uh, I, you know, I, I've talked to Chris Frost now, God knows how many times about the need for a tow, a tow yard about what the impacts are in, in terms of the city, in terms of you know safety, parking in front of fire hydrants, how do you get a car out of there if there's a fire? And I think his points in terms of saying that you know something needs to be done are absolutely correct. Uh, Mike, you made a motion on this, right? Yes, he did. Okay. Can I make a friendly amendment to that motion? Uh, and w one of the concerns I've heard that has been expressed yet tonight is the fact people are afraid that if we do this, it is not going to become temporary, it's going to become permanent. Can we put something in your motion that says this is a one year deal? At the end of this year, all the bets are off, you got to start all over again. Yeah, I would agree to that because I think we got to we got to solve this issue and that puts a little more pressure on it. I don't have the long-term answer yet. It's been vexing. So, uh, Steve McClary? If I may just very quickly take the floor uh, just to respond to the council member's comments. Uh, the intent here is that this would be pilot. This would be temporary. It would be down for the summer season, maybe pass through Labor Day, uh, and then we would pull it up. Uh, we understand that, uh, you know, we have not done any public outreach on the use of this property. Uh, and we staff are very sensitive to uh, not trying to create something that's going to establish a precedent in terms of land use here. Um, so that would be the intent that it would be uh, a pilot uh, and that we would pull it up at the end of the season. Thanks, Steve. I just so, want to make sure that's in the motion. I mean, so I let's, think let's, how about we make the motion October 1st in case it's one of those really hot Septembers? Okay. I'm just making, looking for a date, Steve. I don't know. What do you, what do you think? I just want to make sure when some the, the people who have come to me and said, Steve, once you do it, it becomes permanent. I yeah, just I've heard that look. I've heard that a bunch, and I don't know what they're referring to. I've never heard what that is. I don't. I don't that's know. Another I subject. Know. Another subject. Yeah. But uh, sure, let's 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 put a date on it. Absolutely. I'll take whatever. If you want October first, I'll buy that. Let's do October first. Okay. Oh, if uh, Aaron, are you Aaron okay with that modification? Yeah, I'll agree to that. Okay. Okay. Uh, You know, I want to go back to some of the suggestions Bruce had. I think there were some good things in there that we ought to talk about. Do I need more tow trucks? Do I need some vehicle that, you know, the the sheriff identifies the park or the illegally parked car? Maybe the VOP goes over and waits for the uh, tow truck to show up, then calls the sheriff back, you know, and they take a little bit more administrative work to get it done. Uh, but there may be some ways we can deal with this um, that, you know, enable us to achieve our objective and not burn out the sheriffs or have them sitting around doing nothing when it was going on. And the other thing is, I mean, the vast majority, I've got an email, I'm sure everybody's got emails. They, they didn't only come to me. Uh, the vast majority of the people who sent emails objected to this. Uh, for the reasons it may not be temporary, it's, you know, on, on land that uh, we should be using for something else and 
I just want to acknowledge their emails. The points that they made in there were very good. Uh, and I hope we make the right decision as we go through this tonight. So all back to you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Bruce, I see your hand. Yeah, a few quick comments. Um, first of all, Paul, thank you for that history lesson. I think that was informative and helpful to understanding where the where the problem emanated. Um, at least, at least when at least the understanding the history is helpful. Um, uh, Steve, the one the one year limit or even a couple of few months limit it, that that doesn't help me get over the legal problems. And in fact, Steve, Steve McClary said we don't want to set any land use precedents. Well, we would. We'd be sending we'd be setting a boatload of land use precedents by misusing the urgency ordinance, misusing the TUP, allowing for a use that's not zoned. Um, there may be others as well, that which again is why Daphne was opposed to this when it was put to the Public Safety Commission in the first place and why I am opposed to it as well. We will be setting, we, we, we continue to set all kinds of precedents all the time, unfortunately, when we, let me back up. There's an expression in, in litigators use, which is bad facts make bad law. You got a problem and you look for ways to solve it and if they don't really fit into the existing law, you find ways to claim they do because the problem is there and you want to solve it. That's what's happening here. This is this this is this is an effort to solve a problem, which is a genuine problem, but to solve it in ways that are not really appropriate. Separate and apart from the separate and apart from the property. So, you know, I've explained before, um, I, I've explained this with respect to homelessness and a number of other issues. Uh, when I ran for this position and and I and and I make my decisions this way. If the city is required, legally required to do something, we need to do it. I vote to support it. If the, league, if the city is not legally permitted to do something, I vote against it because I'm not going to support doing something that we're not legally permitted to do. I'm not sure about whether we're legally permitted to do this one or not. I'm not going to hang my hat on that. But where we're not required to do something and we're not prohibited from doing something, I do what I understand the residents want. And I can see where the residents might want this tow, this temporary tow yard, but that's not what I've heard. I have not heard an outcry of support for this. And in fact, to the contrary, I've heard an outcry of deriding it. So that's my North Star. If it's not legal, don't do it. If it's mandatory, do it. And if it's not in one of those two camps, let the residents decide. Someone's like, ask the audience. The audience, so far as I can tell, doesn't want this. Um, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Karen? Um, thank you, Paul. I was just wondering if John Cotty would like to address any of the uh, legality of any of the issues that have been brought up during council comments. And then I have another thing to say after that. We have drafted, uh, we have uh, Council Member Fair taken a first crack at a temporary use uh, amendment under the urgency findings required under Government Code 36. This code's escaping me right now, but I, uh, you know, would it, are, would it, is it ideal to make findings in, the, in, in this situation? No. Ultimately, it'll be your call to see whether those findings can be made. Um, there are some issues with regard to CEQA, and I think we'll be pointing those out in a staff report. And again, this will be your call. So th there are certain s certain issues that an urgency ordinance presents in this context. We'll point all those out for you, and ultimately, it'll be your decision from a policy standpoint as to whether or not you want to adopt an urgency ordinance in this context. Okay, thank you. Um, and I will just say, <clears throat> I think it's human nature for people to respond in opposition to something. People don't usually go out of their way to say they support something. Um, and I, the words ring in my ear in a COG meeting a few years ago when a woman from Metro said to us, I can fill a room with people who are opposed to something. Nobody can fill a room with people who are in favor of something. It's just human nature. So I'd like to move ahead now. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Kelsey, will you take the roll? Councilmember Pearson? 
Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Urine? I think no, I think you got three votes for this. I'm gonna go with the residents who who are opposed to it and I'm gonna vote no. Steve, you need four votes for an urgency ordinance, just so you know that. Well, it's gotta come back to us, right? That's correct. An urgency ordinance requires a four fifths vote to pass. I'll come back. But this direction to staff would only require a three fifth vote to pass. Correct. Oh. That's correct. And so Council Member that was no. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein. So, so I understand. So, so three votes will get us to have another meeting to vote on an urgency ordinance. It's yes. not, we're not passing it now. Okay, That's so I, I vote no as well. Mayor Grisanti. I vote yes. Motion so passed. we get to have another meeting about it. Great. Uh, when that, will that occur? Got to happen pretty quickly. Especially if it's urgent. Yeah. <laughs> when do you think we'll have it, Steve? I'll have to get with uh, the city attorney and get an estimated date on that. Uh, John, do you know off the top of your head when we might be able to bring that back? I think it's your next meeting. Cool. Can I make a suggestion? I, I, I think that if three out of five of us want to have this accomplished, you ought to ask the staff to also prepare a backup non-urgency ordinance in, that, in the event you don't have four votes. I believe a non-urgency ordinance would mean we have no solution for this summer. Is that correct, Bruce? I don't know. It would likely not be in effect until after the summer months have passed. Yeah. Okay. So it's urgent or not? Is that, that where we are? It's where we are. Okay. All right. So I believe we now go to item 7A, council appointments. And Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein may make an appointment. Are there any public comments? Yes, you have two public speakers. They're Georgia Goldfarb and Joe Drummond. We'll hear from Georgia first. Uh, thank you. Oh. We can hear you. Uh, I realize that I'm having a little trouble with my screen. It kept flipping out. Um, okay, thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. <clears throat> I would just like to add a few comments because I didn't have quite enough time before on the matter of discrimination. Um, a, I will, I will submit a specific timeline of events regarding this matter um, for the public record soon. Um, and then on the matter of discrimination and absence of women representatives in the city of Malibu. Although matters of discrimination have been known for decades, apparently they are also deeply ingrained in more than a few in Malibu. Historically, there have been only one or two female commissioners of 40 or more on each of the planning and public works commissions. The council has also been disproportionately populated with men. Less than one third of mayors and city council members have been women. According to the information I was provided with 12 out of more than 40. A more equitable <laughs> balance is required in the future. Um, so I, I do think this is something we need to pay attention to. And again, <laughs> I, I really ask that, um, and this has been a very respectful meeting, which I really appreciate, but in the past, I would ask that personal animus not be expressed to council meetings and the public discourse by all be respectful and directed at solving Alex's problems. Thank you. Thank you, Georgia. And our next Go. speaker is Joe Drummond. Joe, are you available? Hi, yes, I am. So I'll be reading a statement submitted by Suzanne Gildeman, but first I'd like to address 
one of the hateful and dismissive public comments by Lloyd Ahern discounting Dr. Goldberg's statement of her truth regarding her dismissal by Mikey Pearson. This is another male commissioner put in to replace another woman of age as the I'm MRCC. Sorry, hold on a second. Yes. Are we, is this agendized? I'm I talking about, I'm talking about, at the moment. I'm talking about Georgia being appointed. And and what's been going on? I mean, this is definitely. Are you in favor of her being appointed? Yes. Good. Can I continue? I'm. Uh, I'm. If you want to speak to her, uh, to her positive attributes, that would be great. Well, I'm just. I'm talking about the problem is that the men of our city are part of the problem. This person who spoke against Georgia's public comment today, who she's being appointed, I hope the city can learn from what has happened and stop discounting and discriminating against women residents of the city and value our contributions and stop trying to stifle our important comments like what you just did to me. I just had this happen to me today by another male commissioner and now you, and it really needs to stop. It really does. So can I, I'm going to read Suzanne Gildeman's comment that she sent to you today. We are now losing the Parks and Recreation Commissioner, most knowledgeable commission's most knowledgeable commissioner, thanks to a council member who insisted on playing politics. Judy Villablanca is doing the right thing because he didn't and wouldn't. She is stepping down to enable Georgia Goldfarb to continue to serve. In doing so, she is sparing the city another investigation into discriminatory behavior, but that doesn't mean that behavior isn't still problematic. I hope the city can implement human resources training for its council members, like Paul Grisanti, to avoid another incident. The next person who gets fired because they are told they are too old or because they do or do not have children will sue and most certainly will win. I'm glad Georgia will have her opportunity to continue to serve thanks to Judy and Bruce Silverstein. She's an important voice for environmental issues and this commission needs that. We oversee the city earth friendly management policy in lieu of the still not created environmental commission. I will miss Judy. The city will miss her too. Whether you realize it or not, she was a powerful voice for good. We would not have her skate park without her work and vision. Making that a reality was a major accomplishment. Your commissioners work hard to help meet the need of this community and its government. We should never be treated like tools or toys of, or pawns. Things were broken during this episode and that needs to be fixed. No commissioner should ever again be dismissed for a discriminatory reason or for political retribution. Not only is it illegal, it is morally and ethically wrong. The city council, all of you need to take this seriously and make sure it doesn't happen again. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. And Mayor, that concludes public comment. Thank you very much. Bruce? Are there any other council members who would like to comment before I make my I see point? Bruce, I see Steve has his hand up. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm live here. Uh, yes, you are. In, in Georgia, I, you know, look, I hear what you're saying. I think you're right. The world is changing. Uh, I think we do need more women as part of our administrative bodies inside the city. Uh, so I'm glad to see you're coming back to help us out. So, Bruce, if you want to make the motion, I won't do that. And that's what I was going to do, but go ahead. Mikey's hands up as well. Oh, I'm sorry. Mikey? You're muted. I said, go ahead. You wanted to speak. Me? Yeah. No, no, no. I was waiting to make my appointment until after other people on council, if they, if any wants to make a comment. Georgia, Joe, your comments about me are not true and they're hurtful. Georgia, I could not get a hold of you for over six months. I talked to most of my commissioners once a week, if not more. I had to call you and try and get a hold of you multiple times. I, the fact was, you just weren't a part of my team and it's nothing personal. When we did talk once again, we had a really good conversation. It was almost 45 minutes long. We talked about doing environmental things together. I talked to one about making the change. You said, hey, that's your right to do so. I told you who I had in mind to appoint 
it was nothing to do with ageism or your sex. And if you took it that way, I, I have nothing, I have nothing bad to say about you at all, Georgia. And I have a huge record in particular of hiring women in an industry that didn't have women in it to high levels. So it's just not true. And the other thing is that you don't know, I knew this wasn't working for many months and I had told a number of people. So your HR complaint was not going to go anywhere. I didn't want to go into the weeds on this, but it just, it just doesn't end. I agree with you. Women need to be promoted. People of color need to be promoted. I completely agree. This just wasn't working on my team. That's all it was. And I had discussed it with a number of people for many months. And probably the bad part of me is I didn't get around to having to talk with you. And it wasn't made easier by I just never heard from you and couldn't get a hold of you. So I wish you no ill. I have no bias against you. I thank you for everything. And Bruce, it's all yours. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, so first of all, I want to thank Judy for more than five years of service on the uh, Parks and Recreation Commission, four years as Rick Mullins appointee, and more than a year as mine. Um, and I know that Judy has an interest if we ever create an Environmental Sustainability Commission, which there's been discussion of uh, being on that commission, and I, I told her that um, I'd be happy to appoint her to that if that occurs. Um, I want to thank Georgia also for her more than three years of service as Mikey's appointee. Um, I know that all of her co-commissioners have appreciated her service, her contributions to the commission, and it was a shame to see her service cut short by her removal. So it's and it, and I have to say it it did seem particularly wrong to me that Mikey removed Georgia with just a few months left in a four-year term, um, especially when it occurred just days after she did speak at a city council meeting on a touchy subject. And, you know, if there was a problem for six months, five months, four months, three months, two months, the timing is serendipitous at best. Um, but Mikey's removal of Georgia created other problems, including that it left a vacuum in representation of East Malibu on the commission. And I know we consider ourselves one small city, but we are 20 some odd miles long. And um, people in East Malibu do have different interests when it comes to recreation facilities than people in West Malibu. And this created um, an entire commission of Western and West Malibu members. Um, it also created the, the potential for a distracting investigation that Mikey's confident would have gone nowhere and George's confident would have gone somewhere. And that's why there are investigations from time to time. Um, but I asked Georgia if she would um, defer on that if she were reappointed, and she um, honorably said yes. So by appointing Georgia, all of that is corrected. It's not it's not corrected, but it's it's ameliorated. Um, she won't have her term cut short as a result of whatever the reason was. East Malibu will continue to have representation on the commission. There won't be an investigation. I will say, you know, listening to Joe and others. We, we do have, we have a religious disparity on council and in commissions. We have a racial disparity and we have other nationality disparities. I mean, I, I guess one could argue about nationality and race that it's, it's a result of our, geog our, our actual um, city's composition, although I'm not sure of that, but religious actually isn't. So we, 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 we do have disparities and we certainly have gender disparities. So, I think it's something that's it's important, as, as Barack Obama used to say, it's a teachable moment, perhaps, and maybe we should be more focused on these issues. I'm not saying that anyone's consciously doing anything wrong when it comes to gender, race, religion, or any other um, classification, but maybe we need to look more hard inside and, and think about whether we're unconsciously making decisions or not consciously being more equitable as opposed to just doing things the way they've always been done. So with, with that said, I'm very pleased to appoint Georgia to the back to the Parks and Recreation Commission. Judy, again, we thank you for your years of service and hopefully we'll find a way to bring you back into the city commissions 
um, in not too long a period of time. I'll second that. It uh, does not require a second. Does it? Okay, good. No, he's he has appointed her. She is appointed. That takes us to item 7B, which is uh, in-person meetings and Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein Stein is going to talk about it. Sure. Um, so many residents have called and written to city council and to me advocating we not cut off their ability to participate in city council meetings remotely, um, both out of concern for ongoing danger of COVID-19 and also just as a matter of modern technological convenience and reducing our carbon footprint. Um, and, and I should mention some, some residents have said they're Separate apart from COVID-19, there are other health reasons why they're unable to get to meetings. Um, and the technology has opened up a world to them. Oh, I see, I'm sorry, oh, I'm giving the uh, staff report, so I don't have to, we don't have to get public um, comment yet. Um, and, you know, and, and given the price of fuel these days, that's, that's also a factor. It's not that, well, some people live 15 miles away. Um, I, I share the public's concern about the ongoing danger of the virus. Um, and I appreciate the other issues that have been raised. So I, I ask that we be able to re reconsider our decision to go to live meetings and exclusively live meetings. So there are, uh, I'll speak separate and apart from giving this report as to what I believe we ought to do. I'm not gonna present a recommendation right now. I'm just gonna lay out what is available to us. We can stick with the decision we made which is to beginning at our next meeting, um, have meetings at City Hall at which the only public participation would be at City Hall. We can stick with the decision to have council go back to City Hall, but reverse our prior decision to cut off the virtual aspect of the meeting and have what people loosely call a hybrid meeting where um, members of the public would have the choice of either coming to City Hall to attend live or attend by Zoom or whatever other technology we might use. Um, and we have the option of reversing our decision to go back live for, for some indefinite period, not forever, but for some period until we get greater information on the, um, the virus situation. As Steve McClary reported earlier, um, there are, there's an uptick again in um, infections, although he's, he was glad to report and I'm, I'm glad to hear there's a downtick in hospitalizations and, and, and perhaps in deaths. So we have those three options to consider. Um, before I say what I think we ought to do, maybe we ought to hear from the public and we all have an opportunity to speak our mind. Any technical questions for the presenter? Okay, let's go to the, who do we have public speakers? Yes, you have six speakers for this item. The first two are Bill Sampson, Joe Drummond, Lloyd Ahern, and Pat Healy. Bill Sampson is no longer in the meeting, so we'll hear from Joe Drummond. Hi, Joe. Hello again. All right, I hope the council will reconsider a hybrid Zoom model for all city meetings. With COVID-19 cases increasing these last few weeks, it is prudent to not put the public at risk, especially our senior citizen residents and immunocompromised, such as my husband. Also with climate change and fossil fuels being from automobiles being the most largest cause of increase in greenhouse gases, causing global warming, reducing the number of cars going to and from city hall can only help our planet. I do believe the council members should meet in person as safely as possible for them, as hopefully they will be more civil to one another in person rather than online. As a newly appointed commissioner, selfishly, I'd love to be remote as I'll be going away to Canada and Europe most of July and August and would love to still participate in city matters through my duty as a commissioner, but also as a concerned resident. I noticed one planning commissioner tuning in from Italy a few weeks ago, which was heartening. It is common practice now to use the hybrid Zoom model and it's not complicated and shouldn't require more staff to accommodate this more inclusive and safer option. And Mikey, I'm also glad you did change your original appointment to the Parks and Rec to a female. So I do appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lloyd Ahern, followed by Pat Healy, Georgia Goldfarb, and Howard Revsky. Hi, Lloyd. Are you? Hi. Uh, Good evening. We hear you. Good evening, City Council. My name is Lloyd Ahern, and I just want to say that I am 
a first-class hypochondriac that has been very cautious and prudent during this whole COVID thing and would never consider anything other than ultimate safety. And I believe that the whole equilibrium of our town and everything has been completely turned upside down by going to the to the Zoom meetings as long as we have. But there was nothing we could do. We had to do it. I now have had my four shots. I've had my two shots, and I had my booster, and now I've had my other booster. I started going to council meetings when it was over at Howard Hughes. I mean, not Howard. Yeah, Hughes over at... Uh, Thing. Then we went across the street, and then we went to where we going. And all the regular people that we have coming to meetings these days that I've been going to were going then. So all this stuff about gas or any bologna sandwich excuse is just I don't know what 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 you're afraid of, Bruce, but it ain't gonna work. The, we're going back to the way it should be, and I hope you vote the right way. Thank you. Thank you, Lloyd. Our next speaker is Pat Healy, followed by Georgia Goldfarb and Howard Rudsky. Hi, Pat. Are you available? Yes, I am. Um, I'm not going to repeat everything that Bruce said, because what, what he said was in my written comments to you. And I think that hybrid hybrid meetings are the answer. Um, and so again, I would like the city to investigate what other cities are doing and what private businesses are doing because it's not that complicated. They have meetings that are hybrid all, all the time. So, um, you know, I do, I am concerned about COVID. And um, I think it is a real problem. And here it is 11 o'clock at night. And I arrived at this meeting at seven. So I would be sitting, you know, in the meeting four or five hours before it was heard, my item would be heard. So um, I think hybrid meetings are the way to go. So thank you. Thank you, Pat. Our next speaker is Georgia Goldfarb, followed by Howard Rudsky. Hi, Georgia, you have the floor. Okay, just trying to unmute there. Um, one moment. You're on mute. Um, what? You I just are unmuted. I am unmuted. Oh, okay, great. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, no, excuse me. Okay. Um, so, good evening again. Given that the next COVID variant has in a short period of time become the dominant COVID virus, that Philadelphia has recently reinstated its mask mandate, and that we should take all reasonable measures to support and facilitate participation in local government. I recommend that we either institute hybrid meetings in person and remote, uh, that is, or continue remote meetings via Zoom for the council and commission meetings for the near future. Now that we have remote technology and know that it can work well, there is no reason not to use it. Really, everyone is using it. It is now the norm. In fact, many beneficial changes wrought from the advent of the ever morphing coronavirus will become permanent. Remote work, telehealth, reduced time commuting, and reduced greenhouse gas emissions. Government, the hybrid model allows people with disabilities family care responsibilities, immune compromise, people uncomfortable driving at night, and people displaced by the Woolsey fire, for example, to participate without risking their health or making it difficult or impossible to tend a, attend a meeting or even to serve on a commission. As has been noted, remote meetings contribute to decreasing greenhouse gas emissions, which is an added measure to the city's responsibilities in reducing global warming. Remote meetings are also a good educational tool, as has been illustrated um, on our uh, very own Parks and Recreation Commission to help kids learn about government and feel comfortable participating in it, which they can do from the comfort and security of their home. We need to be able to talk to each other. 
even on matters we disagree upon. Perhaps more opportunities to do so via hybrid meetings will help. At the very least, we can know our city government is proposing what our city government is proposing and doing. So I urge you to permanently adopt the hybrid model for council and commission meetings and business, city business in general. And I will say that I will have another public comment at the next meeting regarding council member Pearson's statements. Thank you. Thank you, Georgia. Our next speaker is Howard Rudsky, followed by Ryan. Hi, Howard. Thank you for staying up. Uh, you're welcome. I uh, would be in favor of in-person meetings only. I think we've become way too uncivil online. And when you know somebody and you see them face to face and you can actually talk to them as a person, it's too easy to do what we're doing online and it's just way too uncivil. So I would vote for in-person meetings. Thank you. Thank you, Howard. Uh, thank you. I wanted to say that um, it was probably like 2015 or 16 that uh, Riva, as a finance um, department, um, said that we were going to have this new technology where people could uh, just kind of pop in uh, visually to a council meeting and that we needed the $250,000 to upgrade the high definition cameras so everybody could see everyone's wrinkles and that this new technology would make it uh, transparent and we'd have more public participation and the, the parents with kids wouldn't have to you know, schlep them all down to city hall, you know, and so forth that it's uh, imposition to the younger uh, members of our community, which we need. Those are our next generation. And it's hard on the old people who've been around and know a lot. And that institutional knowledge is invaluable. And I, I thank Paul for his anecdotal stuff tonight. Um, but the exclusion of residents is what I thought I just heard. Um, let's make it hard for people to, for public participation you know we have meetings that go on till midnight sometimes we had a one in the morning meeting once um you know a couple times uh, not just of the council but it's been planning commission so i'm gonna uh, end with the big one is you are trying to get the most work done with the fewest number of staff members and that's an efficiency model and that's just a, a basic fact that we, we've lost some city planners at this point. But the ability for the staff to work remotely and for the city to retain staff at this point after two years of Zoom meetings, to, you think you're gonna haul all the planners in until 10, 11 o'clock at night, or even you know, like Susan Duenas, uh, who'll need to stay until 10 o'clock at night and drive all the way home. And that's quite a big turnoff to a workforce that knows that it's no longer necessary. And if the city of Malibu is not with it on the ability to take advantage of the efficiencies involved, they might just pass or they might just leave. And I don't think that Malibu is in a position to be able to allow anybody else to leave at this point. And so, there's no downside. Uh, Howard Rutsky can come sit next to Lloyd Ahern and they can heckle the whole meeting if they want in live city hall. But don't try to exclude everybody else from participating because we've been promised this, we paid for it with technology and then we've actually been doing it for over two years actually with simpler technology. And I see it as um, a way to ensure public participation and transparency. So thank you. Thank you so much, Ryan. And Mayor Bill Sampson has not rejoined the meeting and I don't see any other raised hands. So that concludes public comment. Thank you very much. Okay. I see Mikey's hand followed by Steve's hand. I, I feel like the conversation, either I'm just forgotten something or it's gone off in a new direction. As I remember, we made this decision 
because it would take extra staff time, which we we're trying to get people back in their houses and we we're trying not to take extra staff time for a brief period to get through this. Um, that's, that's my memory, unless I'm totally out to lunch, which is also possible. Um, Bruce likes that. Um, I don't think anyone's trying to make a life or death decision here. We're just trying to move city business forward as far as I know. Um, can I ask Mr. McClary, am I wrong? Wasn't that the message is that at this point, it's extra bodies to run a meeting in person and on Zoom. Isn't that correct? Um, well, I, I think that have I missed it somewhere? Well, the, the, again, the staff, we've been doing the remote meetings for some time now. So I think we've got that down, uh, Pat, certainly not perfect, but but good. And, and it works. You know, we've got enough staff we can we can make this model work um i think the concern if i was if i understood your question correctly or maybe i didn't is um if we if we did go to a, an actual hybrid model we had persons both in chambers and um participating remotely um we would need to you know take a couple of we would probably need to bring on uh, an additional person uh, to be able to do that. And, uh, we would need a little time to, to staff up for that and get that going, but it's certainly something that we could pull off. Um, we would just need a little bit of time to, to, to do that. Um, I'm not sure if I answered your question. No, I think that's my memory. We, we weren't making this forever decision. We were just trying to go forward. Um, I don't remember saying this, we were only picking one way for the rest of the, you know, for forever. We were trying to not engage more staff if we could, so we could hopefully, once again, put staff where it's needed, such as planning, et cetera. Um, that, that was my memory that this, and, and, and I gather from reading this, if we change now that we aren't noticed correctly. So we have that issue sitting here too. So it sounds to me like we got a couple of issues and, and to the speakers that, you know, want to see it a different way. I get it. Yeah, this is a new world. We're just trying to make our way there. By the way, I talked to still Sue Himmelrich, the, at the city of Santa Monica today, they're all just in person. Um, and they're going to consider potentially hybrid in the future when they get their staffing levels figured out to do both. So that by chance we were talking today. So um, I don't think we're much different than other cities just trying to figure this out right now. And uh, that, that's my only comment. Thank you. Thank you, Mikey. Steve Uring. Uh Yes, am I unmuted? Yes, I am. You're unmuted. Uh, I believe the pandemic let the Zoom genie out of the bottle and I don't think you can put it back in. Uh, it has become, I mean, I use it all the time for meetings here, for meetings with my friends, for discussions I have with people that are calling up for something. And I think the comments you heard from the residents who said, you know, it, it, it eliminates people having to drive. Uh, it, it will significantly increase attendance, right? And just, if we're gonna put it, I mean, what do we think is gonna happen if we do it live? Uh, how many people you think are gonna participate? And I think part of our job is to, is to get the residents to participate and listen to them because that helps us make the right decisions. Uh, and look, this whether it's Zoom or go to meeting, this is the future, guys. This is where this whole process is going. Uh, it's not going to go back. I mean, you know, there, there's this stuff is going to get improved. Uh, this technology, these people that are doing this are making a lot of money on it, so they will continually make it better. I think as a city, a city of Malibu, we should participate and make sure we understand what this technology is. We understand how to use it. We use it to the benefit of our residents, making their lives better, making them better able to communicate with us in terms of decisions that have to be made. And I, like I said earlier in the beginning, I attended a hybrid meeting for the Santa Monica Bay Restoration Commission. It was a piece of cake. I mean, it ran smooth as anything you ever saw. I don't know what kind of additional staff we've got to have. I don't think you need, you know, a nuclear scientist to help us do this stuff. Uh, so I, I am 
big fan of going back to hybrid, or going to hybrid meetings uh, and letting, is getting as many Malibu residents participating in these meetings as we can and allowing them to make the decision whether they're happy with, you know, the, the COVID situation. Uh, you know, I go to Ralph's, okay? We don't need masks, but go through Ralph's. You got a whole bunch of people in there that are still wearing masks. So there are concerns about health that have not gone away. And I think the hybrid meetings help us let the citizens make their own decisions and allow them to do the right thing. So I'm in favor of hybrid meetings as soon as we can get them in. All back to you. Thank you, Steve. Karen, your hand is raised. Thank you, Paul. Um, well, one thing that didn't happen tonight is we didn't have any trolls call in. And um, I wonder if they were asked to stand down since this item was on the agenda. They've called in for months. Bruce, you're you're shaking your head. Yes, I'm laughing at the fact of the of the um, paranoia. I, I don't. Okay, I, I, have I don't think floor. anyone. To, I don't Thank think you. anyone talked to this. I guy. have the floor. Thank you. I have the floor. Thank you. So, it seems to me that the trolls were asked to stand down tonight. Uh, they've been calling in for months, uh, disrupting our meetings stating that they think the city should burn down, wasting a lot of time. They're not here tonight. I don't think that's a coincidence. What I find unusual is that we had a unanimous vote two weeks ago. How did everything change so drastically in two weeks time? Um, we have a commissioner who stated she wants to have hybrid meetings so she can go on vacation. I'd like that too. Let's all go on vacation. Just call in from wherever we happen to feel like being. Um, I believe we get better work done when we're there in person. Yeah, the whole world has gotten complacent. It's much easier to call in from home. Before COVID, we had a lot of participation in our meetings. Nobody was complaining about having to drive there. Nobody was complaining about having to sit through the meetings. That is part of the price of participation. Efficiency model, what we've been told more than once, and it was in a staff report, is that it's more work to have hybrid meetings, not less. So I have a question for city attorney, Cotty. Uh, is the city obligated to provide hybrid meetings? I'm aware of no law, uh, Councilman Ferrer, that requires the city to provide hybrid meetings. Okay. My vote hasn't changed since two weeks ago. My first choice is that we meet in person with no hybrid option. If there's not support for that, then I say we stay on Zoom indefinitely. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Bruce, your hand is raised. Yes. So, you know, I talked before about unilateral um, thinking where you, you just assume other people would do the kind of thing you do. Um, Karen, I told you there's, you're just paranoid. I've there, never the, I, Now I'm speaking. You told well, me not to speak. Fair is now, fair, isn't it? There you go. So go ahead, continue your, your comment, and then I'll speak. You done? I have not recruited any trolls. No, I know you haven't. Um, so... I have actually been in conversations with our city attorney and with our city manager about finding a way in which we could be hybrid and only our residents would have the ability to utilize the hybrid option. And anyone who's not a resident would not be able to, they would have to come physically to the meeting. I'm gonna talk about this, but they, they would have to come physically to the meeting and that's not gonna happen for people that are in Dallas. So again, like I said, it's it, it's unilateral. It, I forget the word for it, but it's when people think other people are doing things and are after them and are scheming and setting up people to talk, which I don't do, but obviously others do. So, um, and by the way, Joe Drummond, um, whether or not we have live meetings, um, there's protocol for people who are out of the state or out of the city to phone in occasionally. It can't become a, um, a, a regular way to attend meetings, but when people are away, they can do that. I think Mikey talked about that before. I've seen it done. I remember Lou Lamott did it a couple times. 
others have done it. It's, it, it, it's, it's something that's permissible. That has nothing to do with whether you have live meetings or not live meetings. In any event, um, you know, I agree with Steve that the desire to cut off the resident's ability to phone in or, um, or use Zoom is non-transparent. I, I, I had gone along with this last time because I actually was in the thinking that Karen, like Karen has expressed, that it would help us to cut off strangers who have nothing better to do than to call in and disrupt our meetings. Um, and like I said, I, 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 I'm exploring with the um, city attorney and the city manager whether there's a way to actually accomplish, actually eat our cake and have it too, whether we can have the ability to have our residents utilize that opportunity and not offer that privilege to non-residents because it is a privilege, not a something we're required to do. As long as we have a open meeting and anyone in the universe is allowed to come to the meeting, we've satisfied our obligations under the Brown Act. We've satisfied any obligations we may have under the US Constitution. I'm not sure we even have any to, to make, make these meetings available to comment because like Congress doesn't do that. Um, but I think there's possibly a road or a route to having the privilege of being able to call in extended only to our residents who are the ones who we really do need to hear from. Um, and this is not a bologna sandwich as our, uh, our unfriendly caller, our unfriendly caller likes to um, dim diminish people. Um, so the staff is inconvenienced by live meetings. First of all, if, 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 we're, if we're worried about the staff's convenience or inconvenience, right now, the staff that have to participate in this meeting are able to do it from the convenience of their home. Um, I'm not sure if anyone is at City Hall or has to be at City Hall, but if, if there is anyone there, it's less people the way we're doing this meeting now than there would be if we continued by Zoom. And I'm not advocating that we do that indefinitely. Um, residents are certainly less inconvenienced by doing it by Zoom, by having the opportunity to participate by Zoom. And like I said, I believe now that I've thought it through that by cutting off that option, we actually are being less transparent, less democratic. Um, I believe we should reverse the decision to continue to, to, and continue to meet remotely until we have greater assurance from public health experts that the danger truly has passed. Maybe not passed, but, but substantially diminished. And I, I favor also retaining the option for remote participation even after we resume, subject to a caveat, which is that we find out whether it is lawful to permit only our residents to zoom in or call in. And if it is lawful to do that, that we offer that opportunity to our residents, but otherwise have a requirement of live participation. Now, Mikey alluded to the fact, and, and, and I, I actually meant to mention this earlier, there is an issue about some things that are um, noticed for a hearing on May 9. And I, I understand that that situation only applies to May 9, that there, there's some things that have been noticed for May 9 that if we changed to continuing to meet by Zoom, um, they'd have to be re-noticed. So what I would say is, whatever we decide to do, let's still have the May 9th meeting where the city council shows up at city hall and offer the, but, but still change it to hybrid. I don't believe that it would be, it would require re-noticing to offer people the additional alternative of participating remotely. We just have to not cut off the live ability because that's the way it was noticed. So we could inform everyone that they're not required to come to the meeting to attempt to participate in the hearing, but we, but we would have to offer that opportunity if that's where they were to choose to go. So I, I think that can be accommodated one time with a one shot. After May 9, I, I would wanna see us continue Zoom and it's not for nefarious reasons or wanting to avoid people. I think we will have better meetings when we're able to come back live. But I, I think we're just fooling ourselves saying that the pandemic is over. It's not. Um, once we return to face-to-face -face meetings, whether it's May 9th or some later time though, I think we, we, we should continue the option for the public to participate that way. I, so long as we can make a decision that we can limit that 
to members of our public. Uh, so it, it's a complicated legal issue. John and I are still going back and forth. I understand so far what the arguments are in the direction that it is not permissible, but I don't think we've run it to ground by any means. And that's where I come out. Let me just see if there's any other people I wanted to address by comment. Oh, and I just, I, I find it ironic that we just spent a long period of time discussing public safety and doing something that, that a lot of people, and, and ultimately voting to move forward with something that a lot of people don't like because it is safe or safer. And yet here we are hearing opposition to doing what actually is clearly safer, whether it's necessary or not, it's another question, but it's clearly safer, no matter how safe anyone might feel, not being in other people's presence is still safer right now. And there's a large body of evidence saying it's not yet safe to be together, especially for six or seven hours. Um, we heard from one MD, not the mad dog, but an actual medical doctor. So um, that's where I come out. I, I, I favor returning, to, continuing to meet the way we're meeting now until we're comfortable that it is in fact safe. Maybe three people will think it is in fact safe. I don't. Um, and in any event after that though, not curtailing our residents ability to zoom in, which I think is a valuable opportunity for them. And there are some members of our community who never had the opportunity to participate before for health reasons or other reasons. And um, they have been able to to participate and now we'd be cutting them off. And I'll, the last thing I'll say is, hey, I'm one of the first people that would be thrilled to have less of the people that come here and scream at me, do it by Zoom and have to show up at City Hall because I think there'd be less of them, but that's just the price we pay for democracy and transparency. Thank you, Bruce. Steve? Just a very quick comment back to what Karen said. You know, I think, uh, I think Alex has said probably everything Daddy's going to say about Paul. I mean, I, have, I just think he ran out of stuff. Uh, and, if, and if you looked at the, at the end of the last presentation he did, he was actually complimenting Paul. I mean, he was saying, you know, look, Paul, you're you're a tougher man than I thought you were. I've really become to respect you. So nobody was calling on trolls or promoting trolls or doing any of that. This guy was trying to make a living doing that stuff. Uh, he was trying to build his YouTube channel. He got as far as he could go. I just think he ran out of gas. So back to you, Paul. Well, thanks for saying that. I'm going to call him and he and I will have a kumbaya moment on the phone there. Uh, I, I don't think that's going to happen right away, but, you know, it's a nice thought. Uh, I'm a, you know, tonight we had, I don't think we ever had more than two screens of people. Two screens of people is 50 people. I've been in the many, many city council meetings and, and 50 people in that room would have been a pitiful turnout, absolutely pitiful. And I don't know if we've ever gotten to four screens since we've been doing this. Uh, Kelsey, would you know? I don't know that off the top of my head. Okay. But it's it's uh, I think that you will find that when we go to in person, we will have more people show up there than tune in. And the other thing you, you will discover is that people in general will treat each other better. I've known Mr. Sampson for 30 years. He never said a word to me negative until I got elected and he could insult me without being in the same room. So I, I don't think that, I think that they really will have more productive meetings. And I, I am not in favor of, I'm in favor of going ahead with what we voted on two meetings ago. And if, if the ability to do a hybrid uh, meeting, there, there's some kind of breakthrough. I happen to know somebody who's a high executive at Zoom and I'll ask what they've got coming. But this is, you know, if, if it's, if we have, we need to have our budget chat next meeting 
and perhaps we will give the staff enough confidence that there is going to be significant staff that will have plenty of extra people that we can throw them at doing hybrids as well. But I'm uh, I'm in favor of going doing what we originally voted on four weeks ago. Mikey, it's your turn. I think we have a noticing issue on that too. But um, yeah, I mean, going in person doesn't help me next month. I'm in Montreal, Canada on May 9th. Uh, figure that one out in person. That's going to be tricky. Um, Steve McClary, can, and, and I almost went, Kelsey's live. I almost want to ask Kelsey too, put you on the hot spot. What ultimately is best for the staff? Well, you have got a staff that's been through I, the ringer, and it's it, and what what is what? I mean, just really honestly, what and and so, what's the path there? If there's a path getting there, because I know it might not be all or nothing. So, Councilmember Pearson, I'll answer your question as directly and honestly as I can, and uh, and I mean this sincerely. That the staff is here to serve the council. I know, uh, but that is the truth that at the end of the day, if you want us to do something, we're going to find uh, our way to do it in the best of our ability. Uh, the issue for us, obviously, as you know, we, you know, we, it's, it's just one more thing to take on, but that doesn't mean we can't figure it out. Um, it would just, we would need some time to, you know, to work out some of the logistical things. Um, and, uh, and Ms. Petty John could speak to this much better than I. Uh, we do think that we would need to have to add one more technical person. Uh, but again, uh, and, and, you know, Councilmember Erring stated it very, very well earlier. Uh, and I've seen many jurisdictions that where they have done the hybrid meetings and they, they have, they have been very functional uh, and they definitely can be done and they can be done well. Uh, it would take us a little bit of time to, to tune up to that. So, I mean, obviously, if you would ask me, you know, what's easiest for the staff, well, status quo is always going to be easiest for the staff. Uh, but, you know, I'm not going to give you that answer. So perhaps Ms. Petty John could, could add a little bit more uh, on to the, the technical aspects and what we would need uh, and the timing that we would need to go that route. And then I just, since I have the floor, just wanted to note that um, should the council decide to change uh, to not do the in-person meeting on May 9th. Uh, that would also, we have two appeals that were scheduled for that night. So we would need to re-notice those. And then we also have, um, I believe three items coming up for planning commission and the May meeting uh, that would, uh, the, for the subsequent week that would also need re-noticing as that meeting had also been noticed to be an in-person. And I will turn it over to uh, Kelsey for, some further comments, thank you. Yes, I, I'm kind of hearing two issues from the council. There's the short term direction, what are we gonna do on May 9th? And then it seems like you're also looking for a much longer term solution or direction or time to revisit this. Short term factors, we would have to re-notice some items. That happens, um, actually it's happened since your staff report was published. We were thought we have four items for the planning commission meeting on the 16th to be re-noticed. One of them's already been rescheduled. So we just have three. It's not out of the realm of possibility for us to re-notice items and reschedule them. I am concerned about um, spreading the word about how to participate in the May 9th meeting. If you wanted to go hybrid that quickly, we're gonna need to develop new language for the agenda, for our instruction websites, and to make sure that the public's aware of it. That tends to have a delayed reaction. I can put out as much information as I want to, but a lot of people, get involved through their neighbors and friends and word of mouth takes longer to spread. So it would be a while for them to get on board with what's happening now. And if we changed again to get everyone to reorient to the new plan as well. Um, if you want to talk more about your long-term plans, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. I, I think my, my short, okay, May 9th, I think it'd be ridiculous to change now and fall further behind. That makes no sense. Um, except for the sitting around for six hours in a mask part. But um, long-term, my, my question really, I, my concern is that we're pull resources away from planning where we, you know, I, I don't want to, 
I don't want to constantly be changing things and pulling away from the mission of helping people and where we need to be helping them. So that's, and that's a short term thing. I hope, I guess we've been saying that for years now, it turns out Paul sort of pointed that out. I hadn't really thought of it that way, but uh, I mean, uh, you know, obviously for me, if I was hybrid on the ninth, it'd be way easier for me. Um, and I guess that would be my last question on the ninth. If we're in person, uh, can I call in? the old fashioned way yeah. with notice it in the hotel on that you can notice the uh, public location that you'll be in. I'll need to get that information from you in the next day or two, but that would be an option for you. Okay. And considering, I don't know what hotel I'm in yet, that's a problem, but, um, and the fact it's the East coast time is another problem, but you know, all that's dealable. So, um, all right, that's it. I'll, I see other people want to speak. I'll let them speak. Karen, you're up. Thank you. <clears throat> Again, I'm, I guess I'll say surprised. This motion passed unanimously. I'm not sure why all of this need for change from certain people. Um, John, Cotty, I have a question. Um, we were told a few minutes ago, this is a complicated legal issue. Is it? Are you referring to the question about whether residents, the, the, the notion that you can give, allow residents to teleconference and non-residents to not teleconference? Yeah, how do you verify that? Like if somebody lives in unincorporated LA County outside the city of Malibu, I think the 90265 address, as Bruce are they I, allowed? As Bruce and I have discussed, I think it's difficult because I think the Brown Act prohibits you from even asking for a person's address. So if you can't ask for their address, how can you verify whether they're in or outside the jurisdiction? And so I think yeah, Bruce, and I are gonna, to me. Bruce and I are going to have to ferret out some of those legal issues and how do you do it? Yeah, like if we had a school district related item on our agenda, you know, uh, unincorporated LA County, uh, a lot of our school district uh, families live outside the city, but they're in the school district. So I'm not sure how that would work. It sounds to me like it wouldn't. Hey, I think that the, the Brown Act has a, um, a provision that makes it, um, that prohibits requiring as a condition of speaking, providing even your name, your address or some other requirement to fill out a form as a condition of speaking at, at a public meeting. We often ask for that just because it's helpful and it, it, it informs the council's decision on appeals if someone's closer to the project versus someone who's a little farther away. But that being said, the Brown Act does um, have provisions in there that prohibit that kind of distinction. Um, again, Bruce and I are going to discuss it and, and have that conversation. Okay, so it sounds like it's not complicated. It sounds like it's not possible. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Karen. Bruce? So the word I was looking for before was asymmetrical thinking. Um, the question was just asked, I, I just, I find this a humorous. Why the need for change by quote, certain people? That's really clever. As I started, the very first thing I said was many residents have called and written to me and the city council advocating we not cut off their ability to participate remotely it's clear that a number of residents have done that. Some have spoken tonight, many more have written to us. I've heard from many more. This is not some game that's being played or some power play. Um, in any event, I, you know, I think the concern about May 9 is the tail wagging the dog. That, that's, that's one meeting. That's not what we're talking about as to what we should be doing going forward. The question that, that Steve and Kelsey didn't answer, and I, I, I don't mean that pejoratively because you weren't asked the specific question that you should have been, is remember there is also the option of continuing the way we are right now. I find it hard to believe that anybody would say that it's not more convenient for staff to not have to go to City Hall and be there till 12 or one o'clock in the morning, um, that the way they've been doing things now is much more convenient. In fact, I've been, I've been hearing that as one of the reasons for the loss of employees, that they want to work remotely um, or closer to home and are unable to do so. So, I mean, let me, let me pause for a moment and ask that specific question is, 
is it not the case that it would, I know you'll do whatever you're asked to do, that's admirable, but is it not the case that it's more convenient to the staff to be having Zoom meetings full stop than it is to be going to City Hall? Absolutely. Okay, I'd, I'd be shocked if I heard anything different. I would say for the staff that um, help facilitate your meeting though, for us, it, it's pretty much the same either way. There are pros and cons. And actually right now we do have Alex and Parker in the council chambers as they are for every one of your meetings. But for the many other staff members that you have um, for your other reports, it is easier. Right, and especially I, I, you know if we have a, um, a planning appeal that, a, that doesn't start till 10 o'clock at night, the people that, that, that are responsible for that wouldn't have to be there from six to 10 and they wouldn't have to be at City Hall at 10 o'clock. But in any event, um, the, the comment that Paul made about the number of screens, I'm sorry, Paul, that's just a, it's a, it's a non sequitur. There are plenty of people watching on the City Hall channel. It's not a question of how many people are watching a meeting. It's a question of how many people are participating in a meeting. And I'm not, I, I doubt that we actually are having less participants in the Zoom meetings than we were having live. But you, 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 the, the, the comparison is not how many people are sitting in the audience. The comparison is how many people are able to participate. Maybe less are participating. I'm, I don't believe so. But it has nothing to do with how many screens of people are watching here. Because there's, it, people can watch throughout the world right now. Um, I'm sure there are a lot more people watching than are at City Hall typically. Um, and you know, it's, it, I think it's funny to say Bill Sampson never had an unkind word to say before you were elected. There's lots of people that never had an unkind word to say about me before I was elected. I, <laughs> I don't think it's the Zoomness. I think it's the elected that's the key there. Um, also, I forgot to say before that if we were to go stay this way, I, I think we definitely also need to think about letting people share their minutes and appearing on screen. Um, I forgot to mention before, I've heard from at least two commissioners who have young children that they're concerned about going back to live meetings, which I understand they're required to do if we're required to do it because their children are not vaccinated and cannot be vaccinated and they have serious concerns about spreading illness to their children. And that covers all the notes I made from other people speaking. Thank you, Bruce. I'm going back to me for a second. Uh, I've got a great idea of what we could do to make it, it easier on the staff and easier on us. We could start our meetings two hours earlier. We could limit the amount of time we speak and, uh, you know, force ourselves to make shorter comments during the times we have to make comments. Uh, I don't think anybody's changing anybody's mind right now, but it's, you know, it's dragging on. Uh, the other thing that I would really like to do is, is not screw up the notices for the, the things we've done. And if we were approached later with a way to run, a better way to run a, hybrid Zoom meeting, I'm prepared to revisit it at that time. And that's it for me. So I'm gonna go back to Mikey. Yeah, I, I'm probably getting tired, so I apologize. I'm, I'm not probably, I am tired. Um, if we were, if we were to do hybrid meetings, Kelsey, Steve, how many, how long do you think it would take to set that up and be ready and feel properly. Cause I don't think we've asked that question or addressed that. We've talked about it before in the context of noticing a little bit. I I'd probably want about a month's notice for me to prepare so we can, you know, test our protocols so we can have consistent language for the public and let the word get out there before it starts. Um, so about a month would work for that. More time would also be fine. Less would become problematic. Okay, so, and I, if I'm maybe misunderstood, Bruce, but were you thinking that if we go to hybrid, that people can decide whether the, the commissioners and can decide whether they come in or not? Is that, does it work that way? Oh, okay. So I misunderstood that. Because you're saying commissioners with young kids and all that. That, that was, that was the rationale for for still staying home for a little bit longer. That had nothing to do with the hybridness for the public. So you're also suggesting we remain 
we remain on Zoom for some amount of time. That's okay. Okay. I'm just, like I said, I'm getting tired. Yeah. I, I have a feeling that it's a non starter from what I'm hearing, but that's what I was proposing. Well, yeah, it sounds like it. I don't, I don't think we should mess up next meeting, even though it doesn't help me at all. That's for sure. But, um, okay. I just want to make sure I understood. Other than that, I'm good. Thank you, Mikey. Karen? Yeah, I'd like to make a motion that we remain on Zoom, continue to uh, revisit this as we've been doing for the last several months uh, and remain and uh, keep the May 9th meeting as it's been, uh, as it's been noticed, um, do the May 9th meeting and then go back to Zoom. I'll second that. And just to be completely clear, that would be to have your May 9th meeting in person returning to Zoom on May 23rd. And at this point, are you trying to address the commission? You mean for the month of May? So the last direction was for commissions to return to in-person meetings starting after May 9th. And so the planning commission hearings for May 16th were noticed as in-person meetings. Um, you could deal with that in a separate motion if you would like. Okay, it, it sounds like um, to be consistent, we would have a May 9th meeting in person. The commissions would each have their one meeting subsequent to our May 9th meeting in person and then resume to Zoom only. What if they're that amended motion? But what if their meeting after ours is actually the following month? Because it came earlier in the month than ours. Does that matter? Well, like I said, this, the one subsequent meeting. Doesn't matter what month it falls in. I don't. I don't think it should. One or less, if they're if they're not required, if there's already no noticing issue, then they wouldn't have to meet by Zoom, live at all. That's what I was thinking. Why not? Is that right, Karen? Um, sorry. Can you repeat that? Yeah, I, I think what you're saying is that we would meet live on May nine. Any commission that would have to screw up some noticing would also have their next meeting, but any commission that didn't have that problem could just continue to meet by Zoom. Yes. Right. And I, I second could, that motion. If that's to the motion. clarify that, the planning commission is the only commission that would have noticed public hearings. So that, okay, so just that. And then all other commissions would continue with virtual meetings until there's new direction from the council? Yes. I second that motion. Oh, roll call, Paul. Please. I'm not the person that calls the roll. It's Kelsey. Kelsey, will you call the roll? There you go. Council Member Fair? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Council Member Pearson? Yes. Council Member Uring? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Okay, so that motion carries. The City Council will meet in person on May 9th. The planning commission will meet in person on May 16th. After that, you will all return to virtual meetings and all other commissions will continue with virtual meetings for the time being. You did that perfectly. Thank Kelsey. you. Thank you. And we will put on for future discussion for the city council um, at some point to discuss whether, what you want to do going forward. Okay. Thank Motion you. Motion to adjourn. We have a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Yes, I'll please. second. Kelsey, call the roll, please. Mayor President Silverstein? Yes. Council Member Pearson? Yes. Council Member Fair? Yes. Council Member Earing? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. You are adjourned. Adios, guys. Thank you all. Thank you, staff. See you live next meeting. Now, next meeting is on the 27th. Uh, no. Oh, yes, you're right. <laughs> See you at the special meeting on Zoom. Take care. Bye.